He, being acquitted, retorted by accusing five of the richest of their number of cutting stakes in the ground sacred to Zeus and Alcinous, the legal penalty being a stater for each stake. Upon their conviction, the amount of the penalty being very large, they seated themselves as suppliants in the temples to be allowed to pay it by installments, but Pythias, who was one of the senate, prevailed upon that body to enforce the law, upon which the accused, rendered desperate by the law, and also learning that Pythias had the intention, while still a member of the senate, to persuade the people to conclude a defensive and offensive alliance with Athens, banded together armed with daggers, and suddenly bursting into the senate killed Pythias and sixty others, senators and private persons, some few only, of the party of Pythias taking refuge in the Athenian galley, which had not yet departed. After this outrage, the conspirators summoned the Corsi Raines to an assembly, and said that this would turn out for the best, and would save them from being enslaved by Athens, for the future, they moved to receive neither party unless they came peacefully in a single ship, treating any larger number as enemies. This motion made, they compelled it to be adopted, and instantly sent off envoys to Athens to justify what had been done and to dissuade the refugees fit from any hostile proceedings which might lead to a reaction. Upon the arrival of the embassy, the Athenians arrested the envoys and all who listened to them as revolutionists, and lodged them in Aegina. Meanwhile a Corinthian galley arriving in the island with Lacedaemonian envoys, the dominant Corsi Ra-Ian party attacked the commons and defeated them in battle. Night coming on, the commons took refuge in the Acropolis and the higher parts of the city, and concentrated themselves there, having also possession of the Helic harbour, their adversaries occupying the marketplace where most of them lived, and the harbour adjoining, looking towards the mainland. The next day passed in skirmishes of little importance, each party sending into the country to offer freedom to the slaves and to invite them to join them. The mass of the slaves answered the appeal of the commons, their antagonists being reinforced by 800 mercenaries from the continent. After a day's interval hostilities recommenced victory remaining with the commons, who had the advantage in numbers and position, the women also valiantly assisting them, pelting with tiles from the houses, and supporting the melee with a fortitude beyond their sex. Towards dusk, the oligarchs in full rout, fearing that the victorious commons might assault and carry the arsenal and put them to the sword, fired the houses round the marketplace and the lodging houses in order to bar their advance, sparing neither their own, nor those of their neighbours, by which much stuff of the merchants was consumed and the city risked total destruction, if the wind had come to help the flame by blowing on it. Hostilities now ceasing, both sides kept quiet, passing the night on guard, while the Corinthian ship stole out to sea upon the victory of the commons and most of the mercenaries passed over secretly to the continent. The next day the Athenian general, Nicostratus, son of Ditrophes, came up from Norpactus with twelve ships and five hundred messen in heavy infantry. He at once endeavoured to bring about a settlement, and persuaded the two parties to agree together to bring to trial ten of the ringleaders, who presently fled, while the rest were to live in peace making terms with each other, and entering into a defensive and offensive alliance with the Athenians. This arranged, he was about to sail away, when the leaders of the commons induced him to leave them five of his ships to make their adversaries less disposed to move, while they manned and sent with him an equal number of their own. He had no sooner consented, than they began to enroll their enemies for the ships, and these, fearing that they might be sent off to Athens, seated themselves as suppliants in the temple of the Dioscuri. An attempt on the part of Nicostratus to reassure them and to persuade them to rise proving unsuccessful, the commons armed upon this pretext, alleging the refusal of their adversaries to sail with them as a proof of the hollowness of their intentions, and took their arms out of their houses, 
and would have dispatched some whom they fell in with, if Nicostratus had not prevented it. The rest of the party, seeing what was going on, seated themselves as suppliants in the temple of Hera, being not less than four hundred in number, until the commons, fearing that they might adopt some desperate resolution, induced them to rise, and conveyed them over to the island in front of the temple, where provisions were sent across to them. At this stage in the revolution, on the fourth or fifth day after the removal of the men to the island, the Peloponnesian ships arrived from Selene where they had been stationed since their return from Ionia, fifty-three in number, still under the command of Alcides, but with Brasidas also on board as his adviser, and dropping anchor at Sibota, a harbour on the mainland, at daybreak made sail for Corsera. The Corsera eans in great confusion and alarm at the state of things in the city and at the approach of the invader at once proceeded to equip sixty vessels, which they sent out, as fast as they were manned, against the enemy, in spite of the Athenians recommending them to let them sail out first, and to follow themselves afterwards with all their ships together. Upon their vessels coming up to the enemy in this straggling fashion, two immediately deserted, in others the crews were fighting among themselves, and there was no order in anything that was done so that the Peloponnesians, seeing their confusion, placed twenty ships to oppose the Corsiraeans, and ranged the rest against the twelve Athenian ships, amongst which were the two vessels Salaminia and Paralus. While the Corsiraeans, attacking without judgment and in small detachments, were already crippled by their own misconduct, the Athenians, afraid of the numbers of the enemy and of being surrounded, did not venture to attack the main body or even the centre of the division opposed to them, but fell upon its wing and sank one vessel, after which the Peloponnesians formed in a circle, and the Athenians rowed round them and tried to throw them into disorder. Perceiving this, the division opposed to the Corsiraeans, fearing a repetition of the disaster of Norpactus, came to support their friends, and the whole fleet now bore down, united, upon the Athenians, who retired before it, backing water, retiring as leisurely as possible in order to give the Corsiraeans time to escape, while the enemy was thus kept occupied. Such was the character of the sea fight, which lasted until sunset. The Corsiraeans now feared that the enemy would follow up their victory and sail against the town and rescue the men in the island, or strike some of the blow equally decisive, and accordingly carried the men over again to the temple of Hera, and kept guard over the city. The Peloponnesians, however, although victorious in the sea fight, did not venture to attack the town, but took the thirteen Corsiraean vessels which they had captured and with them sailed back to the continent from whence they had put out. The next day equally they refrained from attacking the city, although the disorder and panic were at their height, and though Brasidas, it is said, urged Alcides, his superior officer, to do so, but they landed upon the promontory of Lucim and laid waste the country. Meanwhile the commons in Corsera, being still in great fear of the fleet attacking them, came to a parley with the suppliants and their friends, in order to save the town, and prevailed upon some of them to go on board the ships, of which they still manned thirty, against the expected attack. But the Peloponnesians after ravaging the country until midday sailed away, and towards nightfall were informed by beacon signals of the approach of sixty Athenian vessels from Lucas, under the command of Eurymedon, son of Thacles which had been sent off by the Athenians upon the news of the revolution and of the fleet with Alcides being about to sail for Corsera. The Peloponnesians accordingly at once set off in haste by night for home, coasting along shore, and hauling their ships across the isthmus of Lucas, in order not to be seen doubling it, so departed. The Corsiraeans made aware of the approach of the Athenian fleet and of the departure of the enemy, brought the Messenians from outside the walls into the town, 
and ordered the fleet which they had manned to sail round into the Heilwick harbour, and while it was so doing, slew such of their enemies as they laid hands on, dispatching afterwards, as they landed them, those whom they had persuaded to go on board the ships. Next they went to the sanctuary of Hera and persuaded about fifty men to take their trial, and condemned them all to death. The mass of the suppliants who had refused to do so, on seeing what was taking place, slew each other the in the consecrated ground, while some hanged themselves upon the trees, and others destroyed themselves as they were severally able. During seven days that Eurymedon stayed with his sixty ships, the Corsiraeans were engaged in butchering those of their fellow citizens whom they regarded as their enemies and although the crime imputed was that of attempting to put down the democracy, some were slain also for private hatred, others by their debtors because of the monies owed to them. Death thus raged in every shape, and, as usually happens at such times, there was no length to which violence did not go, sons were killed by their fathers, and suppliants dragged from the altar or slain upon it, while some were even walled up in the temple of Dionysus and died there. So bloody was the march of the revolution, and the impression which it made was the greater as it was one of the first to occur. Later on, one may say, the whole Hellenic world was convulsed, struggles being every, were made by the popular chiefs to bring in the Athenians, and by the oligarchs to introduce the Lacedaemonians. In peace there would have been neither the pretext nor the wish to make such an invitation, but in war, with an alliance always at the command of either faction for the hurt of their adversaries and their own corresponding advantage, opportunities for bringing in the foreigner were never wanting to the revolutionary parties. The sufferings which revolution entailed upon the cities were many and terrible, such as have occurred and always will occur as long as the nature of mankind remains the same, though in a severer or milder form, and varying in their symptoms, according to the variety of the particular cases. In peace and prosperity, states and individuals have better sentiments, because they do not find themselves suddenly confronted with imperious necessities, but war takes away the easy supply of daily wants, and so proves a rough master that brings most men's characters to a level with their fortunes. Revelation thus ran its course from city to city, and the places which it arrived at last, from having heard what had been done before, carried to a still greater excess the refinement of their inventions, as manifested in the cunning of their enterprises and the atrocity of their reprisals. Words had to change their ordinary meaning and to take that which was now given them. Reckless audacity came to be considered the courage of a loyal ally, prudent hesitation, specious cowardice, moderation was held to be a cloak for unmanliness, ability to see all sides of a question, inaptness to act on any. Frantic violence became the attribute of manliness, cautious blotting, a justifiable means of self-defense. The advocate of extreme measures was always trustworthy his opponent a man to be suspected. To succeed in a plot was to have a shrewd head, to divine a plot a still shrewder, but to try to provide against having to do either was to break up your party and to be afraid of your adversaries. In fine, to forestall an intending criminal, or to suggest the idea of a crime where it was wanting, was equally commended until even blood became a weaker tie than party from the superior readiness of those united by the latter to dare everything without reserve, for such associations had not in view the blessings derivable from established institutions but were formed by ambition for their overthrow, and the confidence of their members in each other rested less on any religious sanction than upon complicity in crime. The fair proposals of an adversary were met with jealous precautions by the stronger of the two and not with a generous confidence. Revenge also was held of more account than self-preservation. Oaths of reconciliation, being only proffered on either side to meet an immediate difficulty, only held good so long as no other weapon was at hand, but when opportunity offered, 
he who first ventured to seize it and to take his enemy off his guard, thought this perfidious vengeance sweeter than an open one, since, considerations of safety apart, success by treachery won him the palm of superior intelligence. Indeed it is generally the case that men are ready to call rogues clever than simpletons honest, and are as ashamed of being the second as they are proud of being the first. The cause of all these evils was the lust for power arising from greed and ambition, and from these passions proceeded the violence of parties once engaged in contention. The leaders in the cities, each provided with the fairest professions, on the one side with the cry of political equality of the people, on the other of a moderate aristocracy, sought prizes for themselves in those public interests which they pretended to cherish, and, recoiling from no means in their struggles for ascendancy engaged in the direst excesses, in their acts of vengeance they went to even greater lengths, not stopping at what justice or the good of the state demanded but making the party caprice of the moment their only standard, and invoking with equal readiness the condemnation of an unjust verdict or the authority of the strong arm to glut the animosities of the hour. Thus religion was in honour with neither party, but the use of fair phrases to arrive at guilty ends was in high reputation. Meanwhile the moderate part of the citizens perished between the two, either for not joining in the quarrel or because envy would not suffer them to escape. Thus every form of iniquity took root in the Hellenic countries by reason of the troubles. The ancient simplicity into which honour so largely entered was laughed down and disappeared, and society became divided into camps in which no man trusted his fellow. To put an end to this, there was neither promise to be depended upon, nor oath that could command respect but all parties dwelling rather in their calculation upon the hopelessness of a permanent state of things, were more intent upon self-defence than capable of confidence. In this contest the blunter wits were most successful. Apprehensive of their own deficiencies and of the cleverness of their antagonists, they feared to be worsted in debate and to be surprised by the combinations of their more versatile opponents and so at once boldly had recourse to action, while their adversaries, arrogantly thinking that they should know in time, and that it was unnecessary to secure by action what policy afforded, often fell victims to their want of precaution. Meanwhile Corsera gave the first example of most of the crimes alluded to, of the reprisals exacted by the governed who had never experienced equitable treatment or indeed aught but insolence from the rulers, when their hour came, of the iniquitous resolves of those who desired to get rid of their accustomed poverty, and ardently coveted their neighbours' goods, and lastly, of the savage and pitiless excesses into which men who had begun to struggle, not in a class but in a party spirit were hurried by their ungovernable passions. In the confusion into which life was now thrown in the cities, human nature, always rebelling against the law and now its master, gladly showed itself ungoverned in passion, above respect for justice, and the enemy of all superiority, since revenge would not have been set above religion, and gain above justice, had it not been from the fatal power of envy. Indeed men too often take upon themselves in the prosecution of their revenge to set the example of doing away with those general laws to which all alike can look for salvation in adversity, instead of allowing them to subsist against the day of danger when their aid may be required. While the revolutionary passions thus for the first time displayed themselves in the factions of Corsera, Eurymedon and the Athenian fleet sailed away after which some five hundred Corsiraean exiles who had succeeded in escaping, took some forts on the mainland, and becoming masters of the Corsiraean territory over the water, made this their base to plunder their countrymen in the island, and did so much damage as to cause a severe famine in the town. They also sent envoys to Lacedemon and Corinth to negotiate their restoration, but meeting with no success afterwards got together boats and mercenaries and crossed over to the island, being about six hundred in all, 
and burning their boats so as to have no hope except in becoming masters of the country, went up to Mountestone, and fortifying themselves there, began to annoy those in the city and obtained command of the country. At the close of the same summer the Athenians sent twenty ships under the command of Lachis, son of Melanippus, and Charoeds, son of Eupiltus, to Sicily, where the Syracusans and Leontines were at war. The Syracusans had for allies all the Dorian cities except Camarina. These had been included in the Lacedaemonian Confederacy from the commencement of the war, though they had not taken any active part in it. The Leontines had Camarina and the Chalcidian cities. In Italy the Locrians were for the Syracusans, the regions for their Leontine kinsmen. The allies of the Leontines now sent to Athens and appealed to their ancient alliance and to their Ionian origin, to persuade the Athenians to send them a fleet, as the Syracusans were blockading them by land and sea. The Athenians sent it upon the plea of their common descent but in reality to prevent the exportation of Sicilian corn to Peloponnese and to test the possibility of bringing Sicily into subjection. Accordingly they established themselves at Regium in Italy, and from thence carried on the war in concert with their allies. Chapter 11 Year of the War Campaigns of Demosthenes in Western Greece Ruin of Embracer Summer was now over. The winter following the plague a second time attacked the Athenians, for although it had never entirely left them, still there had been a notable abatement in its ravages. The second visit lasted no less than a year, the first having lasted two, and nothing distressed the Athenians and reduced their power more than this. No less than 4,400 heavy infantry in the ranks died of it and 300 cavalry besides a number of the multitude that was never ascertained. At the same time took place the numerous earthquakes in Athens, Ubia, and Boeotia, particularly at Orchomenus in the last-named country. The same went to the Athenians in Sicily and the regions, with thirty ships, made an expedition against the islands of Aeolus, it being impossible to invade them in summer, owing to the want of water. These islands are occupied by the Liparaeans, a Canadian colony, who live in one of them of no great size called Lipara, and from this as their headquarters cultivate the rest, Didym, Strong Isle, and Hyera. In Hyera the people in those parts believe that Hephaestus has his forge, from the quantity of flame which they see it send out by night, and of smoke by day. These islands lie off the coast of the Sicils and Messenese, and were allies of the Syracusans. The Athenians laid waste their land, and as the inhabitants did not submit, sailed back to Regium. Thus the winter ended, and with it ended the fifth year of this war, of which Thucydides was the historian. The next summer the Peloponnesians and their allies set out to invade Attica under the command of Agas son of Archidamus, and went as far as the Isthmus, but numerous earthquakes occurring, turned back again without the invasion taking place. About the same time that these earthquakes were so common, the sea at Tobia, in Nubia, retiring from the then line of coast, returned in a huge wave and invaded a great part of the town, and retreated leaving some of it still under water, so that what is once land is now sea such of the inhabitants perishing as could not run up to the higher ground in time. A similar inundation also occurred at Atalanta, the island off the Opension Locrian coast, carrying away part of the Athenian fort and wrecking one of two ships which were drawn up on the beach. At Papathus also the sea retreated a little, without however any inundation following, and an earthquake threw down part of the wall, the town hall and a few other buildings. The cause, in my opinion, of this phenomenon must be sought in the earthquake. At the point where its shock has been the most violent, the sea is driven back and, suddenly recoiling with redoubled force, causes the inundation. Without an earthquake I do not see how such an accident could happen. During the same summer different operations were carried on by the different belligerents in Sicily, 
by the Sicelyists themselves against each other, and by the Athenians and their allies. I shall however confine myself to the actions in which the Athenians took part, choosing the most important. The death of the Athenian general Charoeds, killed by the Syracusans in battle, left Lachis in the sole command of the fleet, which he now directed in concert with the allies against Miley, a place belonging to the Messenese. Two Messenese battalions in garrison at Miley laid an ambush for the party landing from the ships, but were routed with great slaughter by the Athenians and their allies, who thereupon assaulted the fortification and compelled them to surrender the Acropolis and to march with them upon Messina. This town afterwards also submitted upon the approach of the Athenians and their allies, and gave hostages and all other securities required. The same summer the Athenians sent thirty ships round Peloponnese under Demosthenes, son of Alcisthenes, and Procles, son of Theodorus, and sixty others, with two thousand heavy infantry, against Melos, and Anishas, son of Niceratus, wishing to reduce the millions, who, although islanders, refused to be subjects of Athens or even to join her confederacy. The devastation of their land not procuring their submission, the fleet, weighing for Melos, sailed to Opus in the territory of Graia, and landing at nightfall, the heavy infantry started at once from the ships by land for Danigra in Boeosia, where they were met by the whole levy from Athens, agreeably to a concerted signal, under the command of Hipponicus, son of Cleus, and Eurymedon, son of Thacles. They encamped and passing the day in ravaging the Tanagraian territory, remained there for the night, and next day, after defeating those of the Tanagraeans who sailed out against them and some Thebans who had come up to help the Tanagraeans, shook some arms, set up a trophy, and retired, the troops to the city and the others to the ships. Nishas with his sixty ships coasted along shore and ravaged the Locrian seaboard and so returned home. About this time the Lacedaemonians founded their colony of Heracli in Traches, their object being the following, the Millions form in all three tribes, the Parallians, the Hyrians, and the Drachinians. The last of these having suffered severely in a war with their neighbours the Athenians, at first intended to give themselves up to Athens, but afterwards fearing not to find in her the security that they sought sent to Lacedaemon, having chosen Tisamenus for their ambassador. In this embassy joined also the Dorians from the mother country of the Lacedaemonians, with the same request, as they themselves also suffered from the same enemy. After hearing them, the Lacedaemonians determined to send out the colony, wishing to assist the Trachinians and Dorians, and also because they thought that the proposed town would lie conveniently for the purposes of the war against the Athenians. A fleet might be got ready there against Tubia, with the advantage of a short passage to the island, and the town would also be useful as a station on the road to Thrace. In short, everything made the Lacedaemonians eager to found the place. After first consulting the god at Delphi and receiving a favourable answer, they sent off the colonists, Spartans, and Pyrrhusi, inviting also any of the rest of the Huns who might wish to accompany them, except Ionians, Achines, and certain other nationalities, three Lacedaemonians leading as founders of the colony, Leon, Alcides, and Damagon. The settlement effected, they fortified and knew the city, now called Heracli, distant about four miles and a half from Thermopylae and two miles and a quarter from the sea, and commence building docks, closing the side towards Thermopylae just by the pass itself, in order that they might be easily defended. The foundation of this town, evidently meant to Anobia, the passage across to Senium in that highland being a short one, at first caused some alarm at Athens, which the event however did nothing to justify, the town never giving them any trouble. The reason of this was as follows. The Thessalians, who were sovereign in those parts, and whose territory was menaced by its foundation, were afraid that it might prove a very powerful neighbour, 
and accordingly continually harassed and made war upon the new settlers, until they at last wore them out. In spite of their originally considerable numbers, people flocking from all quarters to a place founded by the Lacedaemonians, and thus thought secure of prosperity. On the other hand the Lacedaemonians themselves, in the persons of their governors, did their full share towards ruining its prosperity and reducing its population, as they frightened away the greater part of the inhabitants by governing harshly and in some cases not fairly, and thus made it easier for their neighbours to prevail against them. The same summer, about the same time that the Athenians were detained at Melos, their fellow citizens in the thirty ships cruising round Peloponnes, after cutting off some guards in an ambush at Elemenus in Leucadia, subsequently went against Lucas itself with a large armament, having been reinforced by the whole levy of the Acarnanians except Teneidae, and by the Zacynthians and Cephalonians and fifteen ships from Corsera. While the Leucadians witnessed the devastation of their land, without and within the isthmus upon which the town of Lucas and the temple of Apollo stand, without making any movement on account of the overwhelming numbers of the enemy, the Acarnanians urged Demosthenes, the Athenian general, to build a wall so as to cut off the town from the continent, a measure which they were convinced would secure its capture and rid them once and for all of a most troublesome enemy. Demosthenes, however, had in the meanwhile been persuaded by the Messenians that it was a fine opportunity for him, having so large an army assembled, to attack the Aetolians, who were not only the enemies of Norpactus, but whose reduction would further make it easy to gain the rest of that part of the continent for the Athenians. The Aetolian nation, although numerous and warlike, yet dwelt in unwalled villages scattered far apart and had nothing but light armour, and might, according to the Messenians, be subdued without much difficulty before succours could arrive. The plan which they recommended was to attack first the Abud Oceans, next the Othanians, and after these the Eurytanians, who are the largest tribe in Aetolia, and speak, as is said, the language exceedingly difficult to understand, and eat their flesh raw. These once subdued the rest would easily come in. To this plan Demosthenes consented, not only to please the Messenians, but also in the belief that by adding the Aetolians to his other continental allies he would be able, without aid from home, to march against the Bowie Oceans by way of Ozolian Locris to Chitinum in Doris, keeping Parnassus on his right until he descended to the Phocians, whom he could force to join him if their ancient friendship for Athens did not, as he anticipated, at once decide them to do so. Arrived in Phasis he was already upon the frontier of Boeotia. He accordingly weighed from Lucas, against the wish of the Acarnanians, and with his whole armament sailed along the coast to Solium, where he communicated to them his intention, and upon their refusing to agree to it on account of the non-investment of Lucas, himself with the rest of the forces the Cephalonians, the Messenians, and Zacynthians, and three hundred Athenian marines from his own ships, the fifteen Corsiraean vessels having departed, started on his expedition against the Aetolians. His base he established at Enion in Locris, as the Ozolian Locrians were allies of Athens and were to meet him with all their forces in the interior. Being neighbours of the Aetolians and armed in the same way, it was thought that they would be of great service upon the expedition, from their acquaintance with the localities and the warfare of the inhabitants. After bivouacking with the army in the precinct of Nemi and Zeus, in which the poet Hesiod is said to have been killed by the people of the country, according to an oracle which had foretold that he should die in Nemea, Demosthenes set out at daybreak to invade Aetolia. The first day he took Potidania the next Crocile, and the third Tychium, where he halted and sent back the booty to Euplium in Locris, having determined to pursue his conquests as far as the Ophanians, and, in the event of their refusing to submit, to return to Norpactus and make them the objects of a second expedition. 
Meanwhile, the Aetolians had been aware of his design from the moment of its formation, and as soon as the army invaded their country came up in great force with all their tribes, even the most remote Ophanians, the Bomianzians, and Gleansians, who extend towards the Million Gulf, being among the number. The Messenians, however, adhered to their original advice. Assuring Demosthenes that the Aetolians were an easy conquest, they urged him to push on as rapidly as possible, and to try to take the villages as fast as he came up to them, without waiting until the whole nation should be in arms against him. Led on by his advisers and trusting in his fortune, as he had met with no opposition, without waiting for his Locrian reinforcements, who were to have supplied him with the light-armed darters in which he was most deficient, he advanced and stormed Egetium, the inhabitants flying before him and posting themselves upon the hills above the town, which stood on high ground about nine miles from the sea. Meanwhile the Aetolians had gathered to the rescue, and now attacked the Athenians and their allies, running down from the hills on every side and darting their javelins falling back when the Athenian army advanced, and coming on as it retired, and for a long while the battle was of this character, alternate advance and retreat, in both which operations the Athenians had the worst. Still, as long as their archers had arrows left and were able to use them, they held out, the light-armed Aetolians retiring before the arrows, but after the captain of the archers had been killed and his men scattered, the soldiers, wearied out with a constant repetition of the same exertions and hard-pressed by the Aetolians with their javelins, at last turned and fled, and falling into pathless scullies and places that they were unacquainted with, thus perished, the Messenian Croman, their guide, having also unfortunately been killed. A great many were overtaken in the pursuit by the swift-footed and light-armed Aetolians and fell beneath their javelins, the greater number however missed their road and rushed into the wood, which had no ways out, and which was soon fired and burnt round them by the enemy. Indeed the Athenian army fell victims to death in every form, and suffered all the vicissitudes of flight, the survivors escaped with difficulty to the sea and Enion in Logres, whence they had set out. Many of the allies were killed and about 120 Athenian heavy infantry, not a man less, and all in the prime of life. These were by far the best man in the city of Athens that fell during this war. Among the slain was also Procles, the colleague of Demosthenes. Meanwhile the Athenians took up their dead under truce from the Aetolians, and retired to Norpactus, and from thence went in their ships to Athens. Demosthenes staying behind in Norpactus and in the neighborhood, being afraid to face the Athenians after the disaster. About the same time the Athenians on the coast of Sicily sailed to Logres, and in a descent which they made from the ships defeated the Locrians who came against them, and took a fort upon the river Halex. The same summer the Aetolians who before the Athenian expedition had sent an embassy to Corinth and Lacedaemon, composed of Tolyphus, an Ophian, Boreades, a Neuritanian, and Tisander, an Ipid Ocean, obtained that an army should be sent them against Norpactus, which had invited the Athenian invasion. The Lacedaemonians accordingly sent off towards autumn 3,000 heavy infantry of the Allies, 500 of whom were from Heracli, the newly founded city in Traches, under the command of Eurylicius, a Spartan, accompanied by Macarius and Menedaeus, also Spartans. The army having assembled at Delphi, Eurylicius sent a herald to the Ozolian Locrians, the road to Norpactus lying through their territory, and he having besides conceived the idea of detaching them from Athens. His chief forbetters in Locris were the Amphysians, were alarmed at the hostility of the Phocians. These first gave hostages themselves, and induced the rest to do the same for fear of the invading Red Army. First, their neighbors the Myonians, who held the most difficult of the passes, and after them the Ipnians, Mesapians, Tritines, Chalines, 
Tolifonians, Hessians, and Enthians, all of whom joined in the expedition, the Ulpians contenting themselves with giving hostages, without accompanying the invasion, and the Hyaenes refusing to do either, until the capture of Polis, one of their villages. His preparations completed, Eurylicius lodged the hostages in Chitinium, in Doris, and advanced upon Norpactus through the country of the Locrians, taking upon his way Enion and Upilium, two of their towns that refused to join him. Arrived in the Norpaction territory, and having been now joined by the Aetolians, the army laid waste the land and took the suburb of the town, which was unfortified, and after this Molycrium also, a Corinthian colony subject to Athens. Meanwhile the Athenian Demosthenes, who since the affair in Aetolia had remained near Norpactus, having had notice of the army and fearing for the town, went and persuaded the Acarnanians, although not without difficulty because of his departure from Lucas, to go to the relief of Norpactus. They accordingly sent with him on board his ships a thousand heavy infantry, who threw themselves into the place and saved it the extent of its wall and the small number of its defenders otherwise placing it in the greatest danger. Meanwhile Eurylicius and his companions, finding that this force had entered and that it was impossible to storm the town, withdrew, not to Peloponnes, but to the country whence called Diolis, and now Calydon and Pleuron, and to the places in that neighborhood, Amprostium in Aetolia. The Ambraciates having come and urged them to combine with them in attacking Amphilochia and Argos and the rest of Amphilochia and Acarnania, affirming that the conquest of these countries would bring all the continent into alliance with Lacedaemon. To this Eurylicious consented, and dismissing the Aetolians, now remained quiet with his army in those parts, until the time should come for the Ambraciates to take the field and for him to join them before Argos. Summer was now over. The winter ensuing, the Athenians in Sicily with their Hellenic allies, and such of the Sicel subjects or allies of Syracuse as had revolted from her and joined their army, marched against the Sicel town in Essa, the Acropolis of which was held by the Syracusans, and after attacking it without being able to take it, retired. In the retreat, the allies retreating after the Athenians were attacked by the Syracusans from the fort, and a large part of their army routed with great slaughter. After this, Lachis and the Athenians from the ships made some descents in Locris, and defeating the Locrians, who came against them with Proxenus, son of Gapeton, upon the river Caesinus, shook some arms and departed. The same winter the Athenians purified Delos in compliance, it appears, with a certain oracle. It had been purified before by Pisistratus the tyrant, not indeed the whole island, but as much of it as could be seen from the temple. All of it was, however, now purified in the following way. All the sepulchres of those that had died in Delos were taken up, and for the future it was commanded that no one should be allowed either to die or to give birth to a child in the island, but that they should be carried over the Tyrrhenia, which is so near to Delos that Polycrates, tyrant of Samos, having added Tyrrhenia to his other island conquests during his period of naval ascendancy, dedicated it to the Delian Apollo by binding it to Delos with a chain. The Athenians, after the purification, celebrated for the first time, the quinquennial festival of the Delian Games. Once upon a time, indeed, there was a great assemblage of the Ionians and the neighboring islanders at Delos, who used to come to the festival, as the Ionians now do to the of Ephesus, and athletic and poetical contests took place there, and the cities brought choirs of dancers. Nothing can be clearer on this point than the following verses of Homer taken from a hymn to Apollo. Phoebus, wherever thou strayest, far or near, Delos was still of all thy haunts most dear. Thither the robed Ionians take their way, with wife and child to keep thy holiday. Invoke thy favour on each manly game, and dance and sing in honour of thy name. 
that there was also a poetical contest in which the Ionians went to contend, again is shown by the following, taken from the same hymn. After celebrating the Delian dance of the women, he ends his song of praise with these verses, in which he also alludes to himself. Well, may Apollo keep you all. And so. Sweethearts, goodbye, yet tell me not I go. Out from your hearts, and if in after hours. Some other wanderer in this world of ours. Touch at your shores, and ask your maidens here. Who sings the songs the sweetest to your ear. Think of me then, and answer with a smile. A blind old man of Sio's rocky isle. Homer thus attests that there was anciently a great assembly and festival at Delos. In later times, although the islanders and the Athenians continued to send the choirs of dancers with sacrifices, the contests and most of the ceremonies were abolished, probably through adversity, until the Athenians celebrated the games upon this occasion with the novelty of horse races. The same went to the Embraciates as they had promised Eurylochus when they retained his army, marched out against Amphilochian Argos with 3,000 heavy infantry, and invading the Argive territory occupied Dolpe, a stronghold on a hill near the sea, which had been formerly fortified by the Acarnanians and used as the place of assizes for their nation, and which is about two miles and three quarters from the city of Argos upon the sea coast. Meanwhile the Acarnanians went with a part of their forces to the relief of Argos, and with the rest encamped in Amphilochia at the place called Crony, or the Wells, to watch for and his Peloponnesians, and to prevent their passing through and effecting their junction with the Embraciates, while they also sent for Demosthenes, the commander of the Aetolian expedition, to be their leader and for the twenty Athenian ships that were cruising off Peloponnes under the command of Aristotle, son of Timocrates, and Hierophon, son of Antimnistus. On their part, the Ambraciates at Olpi sent a messenger to their own city, to beg them to come with the whole levy to their assistance, fearing that the army of Eurylochus might not be able to pass through the Acarnanians, and that they might themselves be obliged to fight single-handed or be unable to retreat, if they wished it, without danger. Meanwhile Eurylochus and his Peloponnesians, learning that the Ambraciates at Olpi had arrived, set out from Prischium with all haste to join them, and crossing the Achilles advanced through Acarnania, which they found deserted by its population, who had gone to the relief of Argos, keeping on their right the city of the Stratians and its garrison and on their left the rest of Acarnania. Traversing the territory of the Stratians, they advanced through Phaesia, next, skirting Median, through Limia, after which they left Acarnania behind them and entered a friendly country, that of the Agraeans. From thence they reached and crossed Mount Timaus, which belongs to the Agraeans, and descended into the Argive territory after nightfall and passing between the city of Argos and the Acarnanian posts at Crony, joined the Embraciates at Olpi. Uniting here at daybreak, they sat down at the place called Metropolis, and encamped. Not long afterwards the Athenians in the twenty ships came into the Embracian Gulf to support the Argives, with Demosthenes and two hundred Messenian heavy infantry, and sixty Athenian archers. While the fleet of Falpi blockaded the hill from the sea, the Acarnanians and a few of the Amphilochians, most of whom were kept back by force by the Embraciates, had already arrived at Argos, and were preparing to give battle to the enemy, having chosen Demosthenes to command the whole of the Allied army in concert with their own generals. Demosthenes led them near to Olpi and encamped, a great ravine separating the two armies. During five days they remained inactive, on the sixth both sides formed in order of battle. The army of the Peloponnesians was the largest and outflanked their opponents, and Demosthenes fearing that his right might be surrounded, placed in ambush in a hollow way overgrown with bushes some four hundred heavy infantry and light troops, 
who were to rise up at the moment of the onset behind the projecting left wing of the enemy, and to take them in the rear. When both sides were ready they joined battle, Demosthenes being on the right wing with the Messenians and a few Athenians, while the rest of the line was made up of the different divisions of the Acarnanians and of the Amphilochian carters. The Peloponnesians and Ambraciates were drawn up bell together, with the exception of the Mantinians, who were must on the left, without however reaching to the extremity of the wing, where Eurylochus and his men confronted the Messenians and Demosthenes. The Peloponnesians were now well engaged and with their outflanking wing were upon the point of turning their enemies right, when the Acarnanians from the ambuscade set upon them from behind, and broke them at the first attack, without their staying to resist, while the panic into which they felt caused the flight of most of their army, terrified beyond measure at seeing the division of the Eurylicious and their best troops cut to pieces. Most of the work was done by Demosthenes and his Messenians, who were posted in this part of the field. Meanwhile the Embraciates, who are the best soldiers in those countries, and the troops upon the right wing, defeated the division opposed to them and pursued it to Argos. Returning from the pursuit, they found their main body defeated, and hard pressed by the Acarnanians, with difficulty made good their passage to Olpi suffering heavy loss on the way, as they dashed on without discipline or order, the Mantinians accepted, who kept their ranks best of any in the army during the retreat. The battle did not end until the evening. The next day Menedaeus, who on the death of Eurylicius and Macarius had succeeded to the sole command, being at a loss after so signal a defeat how to stay and sustain a siege cut off as he was by land and by the Athenian fleet by sea, and equally so how to retreat in safety, opened a parley with Demosthenes and the Acarnanian generals for a truce and permission to retreat, and at the same time for the recovery of the dead. The dead they gave back to him, and setting up a trophy took up their own also to the number of about three hundred. The retreat demanded they refused publicly to the army but permission to depart without delay was secretly granted to the Mantinians and to Menedaeus and the other commanders and principal men of the Peloponnesians by Demosthenes and his Acarnanian colleagues, who desired to strip the Embraciates and the mercenary host of foreigners of their supporters, and, above all, to discredit the Lacedaemonians and Peloponnesians with the hands in those parts, as traitors and self-seekers. While the enemy was taking up his dead and hastily burying them as he could, and those who obtained permission were secretly planning their retreat, word was brought to Demosthenes and the Acarnanians that the Embraciates from the city, in compliance with the first message from Olpi, were on the march with their whole levy through Amphilochia to join their countrymen at Olpi, knowing nothing of what had occurred. Demosthenes prepared to march with his army against them and meanwhile sent on at once a strong division to beset the roads and occupy the strong positions. In the meantime the Mantinians and others included in the agreement went out under the pretense of gathering herbs and firewood, and stole off by twos and threes, picking on the way the things which they professed to have come out for, until they had gone some distance from Olpi, when they quickened their pace. The Embraciates and such of the rest as had accompanied them in larger parties, seeing them going on, pushed on in their turn, and began running in order to catch them up. The Acarnanians at first thought that all alike were departing without permission, and began to pursue the Peloponnesians, and believing that they were being betrayed, even threw a dart or two at some of their generals who tried to stop them and told them that leave had been given. Eventually, however, they let pass the Mantinians and Peloponnesians, and slew only the Embraciates, there being much dispute and difficulty in distinguishing whether a man was an Embraciate or a Peloponnesian. The number thus slain was about two hundred, the rest escaped into the bordering territory of Agraia and found refuge with Salinthius, the friendly king of the Agraeans. 
Meanwhile, the embraciates from the city arrived at Idomen. Idomen consists of two lofty hills, the higher of which the troops sent on by Demosthenes succeeded in occupying after nightfall, and observed by the embraciates, who had meanwhile ascended the smaller and bivouacked under it. After supper Demosthenes set out with the rest of the army, as soon as it was evening, himself with half his force making for the pass, and the remainder going by the Imphilochian hills. At dawn he fell upon the embraciates while they were still abed, ignorant of what had passed, and fully thinking that it was their own countrymen, Demosthenes having purposely put the Messenians in front with orders to address them in the Doric dialect and thus to inspire confidence in the sentinels, who would not be able to see them as it was still night. In this way he routed their army as soon as he attacked it, slaying most of them where they were, the rest breaking away in flight over the hills. The roads, however, were already occupied, and while the Amphilochians knew their own country, the Ambraciates were ignorant of it and could not tell which way to turn and had also heavy armor as against a light-armed enemy, and so fell into ravines and into the ambushes which had been set for them, and perished there. In their manifold efforts to escape some even turned to the sea, which was not far off, and seeing the Athenian ships coasting along shore just while the action was going on, swam off to them, thinking it better in the panic they were in, to perish, if perish they must by the hands of the Athenians, than by those of the barbarous and detested Amphilochians. Of the large Ambraciate force destroyed in this manner, a few only reached the city in safety, while the Acarnanians, after stripping the dead and setting up a trophy, returned to Argos. The next day arrived a herald from the Ambraciates who had fled from Olpi to the Agraeans to ask leave to take up the dead that had fallen after the first engagement, when they left the camp with the man Tynians and their companions, without, like them, having had permission to do so. At the sight of the arms of the Embraciates from the city, the herald was astonished at their number, knowing nothing of the disaster and fancying that they were those of their own party. Someone asked him what he was so astonished at and how many of them had been killed, fancying in his turn that this was the herald from the troops at Idomen. He replied, about two hundred, upon which his interrogator took him up, saying, why, the arms you see here are of more than a thousand. The herald replied, then they are not the arms of those who fought with us? The other answered, yes, they are, if at least you fought at Idomen yesterday but we fought with no one yesterday, but the day before in the retreat. However, that may be, we fought yesterday with those who came to reinforce you from the city of the Embraciates. When the herald heard this and knew that the reinforcement from the city had been destroyed, he broke into wailing and, stunned at the magnitude of the present evils, went away at once without having performed his errand, or again asking for the dead bodies. Indeed, this was by far the greatest disaster that befell any one Hellenic city in an equal number of days during this war, and I have not set down the number of the dead, because the amount stated seems so out of proportion to the size of the city as to be incredible. In any case I know that if the Acarnanians and Amphilochians had wished to take Ambracia as the Athenians and Demosthenes advised they would have done so without a blow, as it was, they feared that if the Athenians had it they would be worse neighbors to them than the present. After this the Acarnanians allotted a third of the spoils to the Athenians, and divided the rest among their own different towns. The share of the Athenians was captured on the voyage home, the arms now deposited in the Attic temples are three hundred panoplies which the Acarnanians set apart for Demosthenes, and which he brought to Athens in person, his return to his country after the Aetolian disaster being rendered less hazardous by this exploit. The Athenians in the twenty ships also went off to Norpactus. The Acarnanians and Amphilochians, after the departure of Demosthenes and the Athenians, 
granted the Ambraciates and Peloponnesians who had taken refuge with Salinthius and the Agraeans a free retreat from Enedi, to which place they had removed from the country of Salinthius, and for the future concluded with the Ambraciates a treaty and alliance for one hundred years, upon the terms following. It was to be a defensive, not an offensive alliance. The Ambraciates could not be required to march with the Acarnanians against the Peloponnesians, nor the Acarnanians with the Ambraciates against the Athenians, for the rest the Ambraciates were to give up the places and hostages that they held of the Amphilochians, and not to give help to an Actorium, which was at enmity with the Acarnanians. With this arrangement they put an end to the war. After this the Corinthians sent a garrison of their own citizens to Ambrasia, composed of three hundred heavy infantry, under the command of Xenoclides, son of Euthycles, who reached their destination after a difficult journey across the continent. Such was the history of the affair of Ambrasia. The same winter the Athenians in Sicily made a descent from their ships upon the territory of Hymera, in concert with the Sicils who had invaded its borders from the interior, and also sailed to the islands of Aeolus. Upon their return to Regium they found the Athenian general, Pythodorus, son of Isolicus, come to supersede Lacus in the command of the fleet. The allies in Sicily had sailed to Athens and induced the Athenians to send out more vessels to their assistance pointing out that the Syracusans who already commanded their land were making efforts to get together a navy, to avoid being any longer excluded from the sea by a few vessels. The Athenians proceeded to man forty ships to send to them, thinking that the war in Sicily would thus be the sooner ended, and also wishing to exercise their navy. One of the generals, Pythodorus, was accordingly sent out with a few ships, Sophocles, son of Sostratids, and Eurymedon, son of Thecles, being destined to follow with the main body. Meanwhile Pythodorus had taken the command of Lacca's ships, and towards the end of winter sailed against the Locrian fort, which Lacca's had formerly taken, and returned after being defeated in battle by the Locrians. In the first days of this spring, the stream of fire issued from Etna, as on former occasions and destroyed some land of the Catanians, who live upon Mount Etna, which is the largest mountain in Sicily. Fifty years, it is said, had elapsed since the last eruption, there having been three in all since the Hellens have inhabited Sicily. Such were the events of this winter, and with it ended the sixth year of this war, of which Thucydides was the historian. Book 4. Chapter 12. Seventh Year of the War. Occupation of Bylos, Surrender of the Spartan Army in Sphacteria. Next summer, about the time of the corns coming into Ia, ten Syracusan and as many Locrian vessels sailed to Messina, in Sicily, and occupied the town upon the invitation of the inhabitants, and Messina revolted from the Athenians. The Syracusans contrived this chiefly because they saw that the place afforded an approach to Sicily and feared that the Athenians might hereafter use it as a base for attacking them with a larger force, the Locrians because they wished to carry on hostilities from both sides of the strait and to reduce their enemies, the people of Regium. Meanwhile, the Locrians had invaded the region territory with all their forces, to prevent their succoring Messina, and also at the instance of some exiles from Regium who were with them. The long factions by which that town had been torn rendering it for the moment incapable of resistance, and thus furnishing an additional temptation to the invaders. After devastating the country the Locrian land forces retired, their ships remaining to guard Messina, while others were being manned for the same destination to carry on the war from thence. About the same time in the spring, before the corn was ripe. The Peloponnesians and their allies invaded Atticoenda Agas, the son of Archidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians, and sat down and laid waste the country. Meanwhile the Athenians sent off the forty ships which they had been preparing to Sicily, with the remaining generals Eurymedon and Sophocles, 
their colleague Pythodorus having already preceded them thither. These had also instructions as they sailed by to look to the Corsiraeans in the town, who were being plundered by the exiles in the mountain. To support these exiles sixty Peloponnesian vessels had lately sailed, it being thought that the famine raging in the city would make it easy for them to reduce it. Demosthenes also, who had remained without employment since his return from Macarnania, applied and obtained permission to use the fleet, if he wished it, upon the coast of Peloponnes. Off Laconia they heard that the Peloponnesian ships were already at Corsera, upon which Eurymeton and Sophocles wished to hasten to the island, but Demosthenes required them first to touch at Pylos and do what was wanted there, before continuing their voyage. While they were making objections, a squall chanced to come on and carried the fleet into Pylos. Demosthenes at once urged them to fortify the place, it being for this that he had come on the voyage and made them observe there was plenty of stone and timber on the spot, and that the place was strong by nature, and together with much of the country round unoccupied, Bylos, or Corifacium, as the Lacedaemonians call it, being about forty-five miles distant from Sparta, and situated in the old country of the Messenians. The commanders told him that there was no lack of desert headlands in Peloponnes if he wished to put the city to expense by occupying them. He, however, thought that this place was distinguished from others of the kind by having a harbour close by, while the Messenians, the old natives of the country, speaking the same dialect as the Lacedaemonians, could do them the greatest mischief by their incursions from it and would at the same time be a trusty garrison. After speaking to the captains of companies on the subject, and failing to persuade either the generals or the soldiers, he remained inactive with the rest from stress of weather, until the soldiers themselves wanting occupation were seized with a sudden impulse to go round and fortify the place. Accordingly they set to work in earnest, and having no iron tools, picked up stones, and put them together as they happened to fit, and where mortar was needed, carried it on their backs for want of hods, stooping down to make it stay on, and clasping their hands together behind to prevent it falling off, sparing no effort to be able to complete the most vulnerable points before the arrival of the Lacedaemonians, most of the place being sufficiently strong by nature without further fortifications. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians were celebrating a festival, and also at first made light of the news, in the idea that whenever they chose to take the field the place would be immediately evacuated by the enemy or easily taken by force, the absence of their army before Athens having also something to do with the delay. The Athenians fortified the place on the land side, and where it most required it, in a six days, and leaving Demosthenes with five ships to garrison it, with the main body of the fleet hastened on their voyage to Corsera and Sicily. As soon as the Peloponnesians in Attica heard of the occupation of Pylos, they hurried back home, the Lacedaemonians and their king Agis thinking that the matter touched them nearly. Besides, having made their invasion early in the season, and while the corn was still green, most of their troops were short of provisions, the weather also was unusually bad for the time of year, and greatly distressed their army. Many reasons thus combined to hasten their departure and to make this invasion a very short one, indeed they only stayed fifteen days in Attica. About the same time the Athenian general Simonides getting together a few Athenians from the garrisons, and a number of the allies in those parts shook Hyon in Thrace, a Mendian colony and hostile to Athens, by treachery, but had no sooner done so than the Chalcidians and Boschians came up and beat him out of it, with the loss of many of his soldiers. On the return of the Peloponnesians from Attica, the Spartans themselves and the nearest of the Piraeusi at once set out for Pylos the other Lacedaemonians following more slowly, as they had just come in from another campaign. Word was also sent round Peloponnes to come up as quickly as possible to Pylos, 
while the 60 Peloponnesian ships were sent for from Corsera, and being dragged by their crews across the isthmus of Leucas, passed and perceived by the Athenian squadron at Zacynthus, and reached by Lowes, where the land forces had arrived before them. Before the Peloponnesian fleet sailed in, Demosthenes found time to send out and observe two ships to inform Eurymedon and the Athenians on board the fleet at Zacynthus of the danger of Pylos and to summon them to his assistance. While the ships hastened on their voyage in obedience to the orders of Demosthenes, the Lacedaemonians prepared to assault the fort by land and sea, hoping to capture with ease a work constructed in haste and held by a feeble garrison. Meanwhile, as they expected the Athenian ships to arrive from Zacynthus, they intended, if they failed to take the place before, to block up the entrances of the harbour to prevent their being able to anchor inside it. For the island of Sphacteria, stretching along in a line close in front of the harbour, at once makes it safe and narrows its entrances leaving a passage for two ships on the side nearest Pylos and the Athenian fortifications, and freight or nine on that next the rest of the mainland. For the rest, the island was entirely covered with wood, and without paths through not being inhabited, and about one mile and five furlongs in length. The inlets the Lacedaemonians meant to close with a line of ships placed close together, with their prows turned towards the sea, and, Meanwhile, fearing that the enemy might make use of the island to operate against them, carried over some heavy infantry thither, stationing others along the coast. By this means the island and the continent would be alike hostile to the Athenians, as they would be unable to land on either, and the shore of Pylos itself outside the inlet towards the open sea having no harbour, and, therefore, presenting no point which they could use as a base to relieve their countrymen, they, the Lacedaemonians, without sea fight or risk would in all probability become masters of the place, occupied as it had been on the spur of the moment, and unfurnished with provisions. This being determined, they carried over to the island the heavy infantry, drafted by lot from all the companies. Some others had crossed over before in relief parties, but these last who were left there were four hundred and twenty in number, with their helot attendants, commanded by Epidadas, son of Molobrus. Meanwhile Demosthenes, seeing the Lacedaemonians about to attack him by sea and land at once, himself was not idle. He drew up under the fortification and enclosed in a stockade the galleys remaining to him of those which had been left him arming the sailors taken out of them with poor shields made most of them of osier, it being impossible to procure arms in such a desert place, and even these having been obtained from a thirty-odd Messenian privateer and a boat belonging to some Messenians who happened to have come to them. Among these Messenians were forty heavy infantry, whom he made use of with the rest, posting most of his men, unarmed and armed upon the best fortified and strong points of the place towards the interior, with orders to repel any attack of the land forces, he picked sixty heavy infantry and a few archers from his whole force, and with these went outside the wall down to the sea, where he thought that the enemy would most likely attempt to land. Although the ground was difficult and rocky, looking towards the open sea, the fact that this was the weakest part of the wall would, he thought, encourage their ardour, as the Athenians, confident in their naval superiority, had here paid little attention to their defences, and the enemy if he could force a landing might feel secure of taking the place. At this point, accordingly, going down to the water's edge, he posted his heavy infantry to prevent, if possible, the landing and encouraged them in the following terms. Soldiers and comrades in this adventure, I hope that none of you in our present strait will think to show his wit by exactly calculating all the perils that encompass us, but that you will rather hasten to close with the enemy, without staying to count the odds, seeing in this your best chance of safety. In emergencies like ours calculation is out of place. 
the sooner the danger is faced the better. To my mind also most of the chances are for us, if we will only stand fast and not throw away our advantages, overawed by the numbers of the enemy. One of the points in our favor is the awkwardness of the landing. This, however, only helps us if we stand our ground. If we give way it will be practicable enough, in spite of its natural difficulty, without a defender, and the enemy will instantly become more formidable from the difficulty he will have in retreating, supposing that we succeed in repulsing him, which we shall find it easier to do, while he is on board his ships, than after he has landed and meets us on equal terms. As to his numbers, these need not too much alarm you. Large as they may be he can only engage in small detachments, from the impossibility of bringing to. Besides, the numerical superiority that we have to meet is not that of an army on land with everything else equal, but of troops on board ship, upon an element where many favorable accidents are required to act with effect. I therefore consider that his difficulties may be fairly set against our numerical deficiencies and at the same time I charge you, as Athenians who know by experience what landing from ships on their hostile territory means, and how impossible it is to drive back an enemy determined enough to stand his ground and not to be frightened away by the surf and the terrors of the ships sailing in, to stand fast in the present emergency, beat back the enemy at the water's edge, and save yourselves and the place. Thus encouraged by Demosthenes, the Athenians felt more confident, and went down to meet the enemy, posting themselves along the edge of the sea. The Lacedaemonians now put themselves in movement and simultaneously assaulted the fortification with their land forces and with their ships, forty-three in number, under their admiral, Thrasymledus, son of Great Isicles, a Spartan, who made his attack just where Demosthenes expected. The Athenians had thus to defend themselves on both sides, from the land and from the sea, the enemy rowing up in small detachments, the one relieving the other, it being impossible for many to bring to at once, and showing great ardour and cheering each other on, in the endeavour to force a passage and to take the fortification. He who most distinguished himself was Brasidas, captain of a galley and seeing that the captains and steersmen, impressed by the difficulty of the position, hung back even where a landing might have seemed possible, for fear of wrecking their vessels, he shouted out to them, that they must never allow the enemy to fortify himself in the country for the sake of saving timber, but must shiver their vessels and force a landing, and bade the allies instead of hesitating in such a moment to sacrifice their ships for Lacedaemon in return for her many benefits, to run them boldly aground, land in one way or another, and make themselves masters of the place and its garrison. Not content with this exhortation, he forced his own steersman to run his ship ashore, and stepping on to the gangway, was endeavouring to land, when he was cut down by the Athenians and after receiving many wounds fainted away. Falling into the bows, his shield slipped off his arm into the sea, and being thrown ashore was picked up by the Athenians, and afterwards used for the trophy which they set up for this attack. The rest also did their best, but were not able to land, owing to the difficulty of the ground and the unflinching tenacity of the Athenians. It was a strange reversal of the order of things for Athenians to be fighting from the land, and from Lacanian land too, against Lacedaemonians coming from the sea, while Lacedaemonians were trying to land from shipboard in their own country, now become hostile, to attack Athenians, although the former were chiefly famous at the time as an inland people and superior by land, the latter as a maritime people with a navy that had no equal. After continuing their attacks during that day and most of the next, the Peloponnesians desisted, and the day after sent some of their ships to Azine for timber to make engines, hoping to take by their aid, in spite of its height, the wall opposite the harbour, where the landing was easiest. At this moment the Athenian fleet from Zacynthus arrived, 
now numbering 50 sail, having been reinforced by some of the ships on guard at Norpactis and by Phorkian vessels. Seeing the coast and the island both crowded with heavy infantry, and the hostile ships in harbour showing no signs of sailing out, at a loss where to anchor, they sailed for the moment to the desert island of Prot, not far off, where they passed the night. The next day they got and away in readiness to engage in the open sea if the enemy chose to put out to meet them, being determined in the event of his not doing so to sail in and attack him. The Lacedaemonians did not put out to sea, and having omitted to close the inlets as they had intended, remained quiet on shore, engaged in manning their ships and getting ready, in the case of anyone sailing in to fight in the harbour, which is a fairly large one. Perceiving this, the Athenians advanced against them by each inlet, and falling on the enemy's fleet, most of which was by this time afloat and in line, at once put it to flight, and giving chase as far as the short distance allowed, disabled a good many vessels and took five, one with its crew on board, dashing in at the rest that has taken refuge on shore and battering some that were still being manned, before they could put out, and lashing on to their own ships and towing off empty others whose crews had fled. At this sight the Lacedaemonians, maddened by a disaster which cut off their men on the island, rushed to the rescue, and going into the sea with their heavy armour, laid hold of the ships and tried to drag them back, each man thinking that success depended on his individual exertions. Great was the melee, and quite in contradiction to the naval tactics usual to the two combatants, the Lacedaemonians in their excitement and dismay being actually engaged in a sea fight on land, while the victorious Athenians, in their eagerness to push their success as far as possible, were carrying on a land fight from their ships. After great exertions and numerous wounds on both sides they separated, the Lacedaemonians saving their empty ships, except those first taken, and both parties returning to their camp, the Athenians set up a trophy, gave back the dead, secured the wrecks, and at once began to cruise round and jealously watch the island, with its intercepted garrison, while the Peloponnesians on the mainland, whose contingents had now all come up, stayed where they were before Pylos. When the news of what had happened at Pylos reached Sparta, the disaster was thought so serious that the Lacedaemonians resolved that the authorities should go down to the camp and decide on the spot what was best to be done. There, seeing that it was impossible to help their men, and not wishing to risk their being reduced by hunger or overpowered by numbers, they determined, with the consent of the Athenian generals, to conclude an armistice at Pylos and send envoys to Athens to obtain a convention, and to endeavour to get back their men as quickly as possible. The generals accepting their offers, an armistice was concluded upon the terms following. That the Lacedaemonians should bring to Pylos and deliver up to the Athenians the ships that had fought in the late engagement, and all in Laconia that were vessels of war and should make no attack on the fortification either by land or by sea. That the Athenians should allow the Lacedaemonians on the mainland to send to the men in the island a certain fixed quantity of corn ready needed, that is to say, two quarts of barley meal, one pint of wine, and a piece of meat for each man, and half the same quantity for a servant. That this allowance should be sent in under the eyes of the Athenians, and that no boat should sail to the island except openly. That the Athenians should continue to the island same as before, without however landing upon it, and should refrain from attacking the Peloponnesian troops either by land or by sea. That if either party should infringe any of these terms in the slightest particular, the armistice should be at once void that the armistice should hold good until the return of the Lacedaemonian envoys from Athens, the Athenians sending them thither in a galley and bringing them back again, and upon the arrival of the envoys should be at an end, and the ships be restored by the Athenians in the same state as they received them. 
such were the terms of the armistice, and the ships were delivered over to the number of sixty, and the envoys sent off accordingly. Arrived at Athens, they spoke as follows. Athenians, the Lacedaemonians sent us to try to find some way of settling the affair of our men on the island that shall be at once satisfactory to our interests, and as consistent with our dignity in our misfortune as circumstances permit. We can venture to speak at some length without any departure from the habit of our country. Men of few words where many are not wanted, we can be less brief when there is a matter of importance to be illustrated and an end to be served by its illustration. Meanwhile we beg you to take what we may say, not in a hostile spirit, nor as if we thought you ignorant and wished to lecture you, but rather as a suggestion on the best course to be taken, addressed to intelligent judges. You can now, if you choose. Employ your present success to advantage, so as to keep what you have got and gain honor and reputation besides, and you can avoid the mistake of those who meet with an extraordinary piece of good fortune, and are led and by hope to grasp continually at something further, through having already succeeded without expecting it. While those who have known most vicissitudes of good and bad, have also justly least faith in their prosperity, and to teach your city and ours this lesson experience has not been wanting. To be convinced of this you have only to look at our present misfortune. What power in hell has stood higher than we did? And yet we are come to you, although we formerly thought ourselves more able to grant what we are now here to ask. Nevertheless, we have not been brought to this by any decay in our power or through having our heads turned by aggrandizement, no, our resources are what they have always been, and our error has been an error of judgment, to which all are equally liable. Accordingly, the prosperity which your city now enjoys, and the accession that it has lately received, must not make you fancy that fortune will be always with you. Indeed sensible men are prudent enough to treat their gains as precarious just as they would also keep a clear head in adversity, and think that war, so far from staying within the limit to which a combatant may wish to confine it, will run the course that its chances prescribe, and thus, not being puffed up by confidence in military success, they are less likely to come to grief, and most ready to make peace, if they can, while their fortune lasts. This, Athenians, you have a good opportunity to do now with us, and thus to escape the possible disasters which may follow upon your refusal, and the consequent imputation of having owed to accident even your present advantages, when you might have left behind you a reputation for power and wisdom which nothing could endanger. The Lacedaemonians accordingly invite you to make a treaty and to end the war and offer peace and alliance and the most friendly and intimate relations in every way and on every occasion between us, and in return ask for the men on the island, thinking it better for both parties not to stand out to the end, on the chance of some favorable accident enabling the men to force their way out, or of their being compelled to succumb under the pressure of blockade. Indeed if great enmities are ever to be really settled, we think it will be not by the system of revenge and military success, and by forcing an opponent to swear to a treaty to his disadvantage, but when the more fortunate combatant waives these his privileges, to be guided by gentler feelings conquers his rival in generosity, and accords peace on more moderate conditions than he expected. From that moment, instead of the debt of revenge which violence must entail, his adversary owes a debt of generosity to be paid in kind, and is inclined by honor to stand to his agreement. And men oftener act in this manner towards their greatest enemies than where the quarrel is of less importance, they are also by nature as glad to give way to those who first yield to them, as they are apt to be provoked by arrogance to risks condemned by their own judgment. To apply this to ourselves, if peace was ever desirable for both parties, it is surely so at the present moment, before anything irremediable befall us and force us to hate you eternally, 
personally as well as politically, and you to miss the advantages that we now offer you. While this issue is still in doubt, and you have reputation and our friendship in prospect, and we the compromise of our misfortune before anything fatal occur, let us be reconciled, and for ourselves choose peace instead of war, and grant to the rest of the Hellens a remission from their sufferings, for which be sure they will think they have chiefly you to thank. The war that they labour under they know not which began, but the peace that concludes it, as it depends on your decision, will by their gratitude be led to your door. By such a decision you can become firm friends with the Lacedaemonians at their own invitation, which you do not force from them, but oblige them by accepting. And from this friendship consider the advantages that are likely to follow, when Attica and Sparta are at one, the rest of Hellas, be sure, will remain in respectful inferiority before its heads. Such were the words of the Lacedaemonians, their idea being that the Athenians, already desirous of a truce and only kept back by their opposition, would joyfully accept a peace freely offered, and give back the men. The Athenians, however, having the men on the island, thought that the treaty would be ready for them whenever they chose to make it, and grasped at something further. Foremost to encourage them in this policy was Cleon, son of Cleonetus a popular leader of the time and very powerful with the multitude, who persuaded them to answer as follows. First, the men in the island must surrender themselves and their arms and be brought to Athens. Next, the Lacedaemonians must restore Nicaea, Bagi, Droezen, and Achaea, all places acquired not by arms, but by the previous convention, under which they had been ceded by Athens herself at a moment of disaster when a truce was more necessary to her than at present. This done they might take back their men, and make a truce for as long as both parties might agree. To this answer the envoys made no reply, but asked that commissioners might be chosen with whom they might confer on each point, and quietly talk the matter over and try to come to some agreement. Hereupon Cleon violently assailed them saying that he knew from the first that they had no right intentions, and that it was clear enough now by their refusing to speak before the people, and wanting to confer in secret with a committee of two or three. No, if they meant anything honest let them say it out before all. The Lacedaemonians, however, seeing that whatever concessions they might be prepared to make in their misfortune, it was impossible for them to speak before the multitude and lose credit with their allies for a negotiation which might after all miscarry, and on the other hand, that the Athenians would never grant what they asked upon moderate terms, returned from Athens without having effected anything. Their arrival at once put an end to the armistice at Bylos, and the Lacedaemonians asked back their ships according to the convention. The Athenians, however, alleged an attack on the fort in contravention of the truce, and other grievances seemingly not worth mentioning, and refused to give them back, insisting upon the clause by which the slightest infringement made the armistice void. The Lacedaemonians, after denying the contravention and protesting against their bad faith in the matter of the ships, went away and earnestly addressed themselves to the war. Hostilities were now carried on at Pylos upon both sides with vigour. The Athenians' crews drowned the island all day with two ships going different ways, and by night, except on the seaward side in windy weather, anchored round it with a whole fleet, which, having been reinforced by twenty ships from Athens come to aid in the blockade, now numbered seventy sail, while the Peloponnesians remained encamped on the continent making attacks on the fort, and on the lookout for an opportunity which might offer itself for the deliverance of their men. Meanwhile the Syracusans and their allies in Sicily had brought up to the squadron guarding Messina the reinforcement which we left them preparing, and carried on the war from thence, incited chiefly by the Locrians from hatred of the regions, whose territory they had invaded with all their forces. The Syracusans also wished to try their fortune at sea, 
seeing that the Athenians had only a few ships actually at Regium, and hearing that the main fleet destined to join them was engaged in blockading the island. A naval victory, they thought, would enable them to blockade Regium by sea and land, and easily to reduce it, a success which would at once place their affairs upon a solid basis the promontory of Regium in Italy and Messina in Sicily being so near each other that it would be impossible for the Athenians to cruise against them and command the strait. The strait in question consists of the sea between Regium and Messina, at the point where Sicily approaches nearest to the continent, and is the Charybdis through which the story makes Ulysses sail and the narrowness of the passage and the strength of the current that pours in from the vast Tyrrhenian and Sicilian mains, have rightly given it a bad reputation. In this strait the Syracusans and their allies were compelled to fight, late in the day, about the passage of a boat, putting out with rather more than thirty ships against sixteen Athenian and eight region vessels. Defeated by the Athenians they hastily set off, each for himself to their own stations at Messina and Regium, with the loss of one ship, night coming on before the battle was finished. After this the Locrians retired from the region territory, and the ships of the Syracusans and their allies united and came to anchor at Cape Pelorus, in the territory of Messina, where their land forces joined them. Here the Athenians and regions sailed up, and seeing the ships unmanned, made an attack in which they in their turn lost one vessel, which was caught by a grappling iron, the crew saving themselves by swimming. After this the Syracusans got on board their ships, and while they were being towed along shore to Messina, were again attacked by the Athenians, but suddenly got out to sea and became the assailants, and caused them to lose another vessel. After thus holding their own in the voyage along shore and in the engagement as above described, the Syracusans sailed on into the harbour of Messina. Meanwhile the Athenians, having received warning that Camarina was about to be betrayed to the Syracusans by Archias and his party, sailed thither, and the Messenians took this opportunity to attack by sea and land with all their forces their Chalcidian neighbour, Naxos. The first day they forced the Nixians to keep their walls, and laid waste their country, the next they sailed round with their ships, and laid waste their land on the river Arcassines, while their land forces menaced the city. Meanwhile the Sicils came down from the high country in great numbers, to aid against the Messenies, and the Nixians, elated at the sight, and animated by a belief that the Leontines and their other Hellenic allies were coming to their support, suddenly sallied out from the town, and attacked and routed the Messenies, killing more than a thousand of them, while the remainder suffered severely in their retreat home, being attacked by the barbarians on the road, and most of them cut off. The ships put into Messina, and afterwards dispersed for their different homes. The Leontines and their allies, with the Athenians, upon this at once turned their arms against the now weakened Messina, and attacked, the Athenians with their ships on the side of the harbour, and the land forces on that of the town. The Messenies, however, sallying out with Demotles and some Locrians who had been left to garrison the city after the disaster, suddenly attacked and routed most of the Leontine army, killing a great number upon seeing which the Athenians landed from their ships, and falling on the Messenese in disorder chased them back into the town, and setting up a trophy retired to Regium. After this the Huns in Sicily continued to make war on each other by land, without the Athenians. Meanwhile the Athenians at Pylos were still besieging the Lacedaemonians in the island, the Peloponnesian forces on the continent remaining where they were. The blockade was very laborious for the Athenians from want of food and water, there was no spring except one in the citadel of Pylos itself, and that not a large one, and most of them were obliged to grub up the shingle on the sea beach and drink such water as they could find. They also suffered from want of room, being encamped in a narrow space, and as there was no anchorage for the ships, 
some took their meals on shore in their turn, while the others were anchored out at sea. At their greatest discouragement arose from the unexpectedly long time which it took to reduce a body of men shut up in a desert island, with only brackish water to drink, a matter which they had imagined would take them only a few days. The fact was that the Lacedaemonians had made advertisement for volunteers to carry into the island ground corn, wine, cheese, and any other food useful in a siege, high prices being offered and freedom promised to any of the helots who should succeed in doing so. The helots accordingly were most forward to engage in this risky traffic, putting off from this or that part of Peloponnes, and running in by night on the seaward side of the island. They were best pleased, however, when they could catch a wind to carry them in. It was more easy to elude the lookout to the galleys, when it blew from the seaward as it became impossible for them to anchor round the island, while the helots had their boats rated at their value in money, and ran them ashore, without caring how they landed, being sure to find the soldiers waiting for them at the landing places. But all who risked it in fair where they were taken. Divers also swam in underwater from the harbour, dragging by a cord in skins poppy seed mixed with honey, and bruised linseed. These at first escaped notice, but afterwards a lookout was kept for them. In short, both sides tried every possible contrivance, the one to throw in provisions, and the other to prevent their introduction. At Athens, meanwhile, the news that the army was in great distress, and that corn found its way into the men in the island, caused no small perplexity and the Athenians began to fear that winter might come on and find them still engaged in the blockade. They saw that the convoying of provisions round Peloponnes would be then impossible. The country offered no resources in itself, and even in summer they could not send round enough. The blockade of a place without harbours could no longer be kept up, and the men would either escape by the siege being abandoned, or would watch for bad weather and sail out in the boats that brought in their corn. What caused still more alarm was the attitude of the Lacedaemonians, who must, it was thought by the Athenians, feel themselves on strong ground not to send them any more envoys, and they began to repent having rejected the treaty. Cleon, perceiving the disfavour with which he was regarded for having stood in the way of the convention, now said that their informants did not speak the truth, and upon the messengers recommending them, if they did not believe them, to send some commissioners to see, Cleon himself and Thesians were chosen by the Athenians and commissioners. Aware that he would now be obliged either to say what had been already said by the men whom he was slandering, or be proved a liar if he said the contrary, he told the Athenians, whom he saw to be not altogether disinclined for a fresh expedition, that instead of sending and wasting their time and opportunities, if they believed what was told them, they ought to sail against the men. And pointing at Nicias, son of Niceratus, then general, whom he hated, he tauntingly said that it would be easy, if they had men for generals, to sail with a force and take those in the island and that if he had himself been in command, he would have done it. Nicias, seeing the Athenians murmuring against Cleon for not sailing now if it seemed to him so easy, and further seeing himself the object of attack, told him that for all that the generals cared, he might take what force he chose and make the attempt. At first Cleon fancied that this resignation was merely a figure of speech, and was ready to go. But finding that it was seriously meant, he drew back, and said that Nicias, not he, was general, being now frightened, and having never supposed that Nicias would go so far as to retire in his favour. Nicias, however, repeated his offer, and resigned the command against Bylos, and called the Athenians to witness that he did so. And as the multitude is wont to do, the more Cleon shrank from the expedition and tried to back out of what he had said, the more they encouraged Nicias to hand over his command, and clamoured at Cleon to go. At last, 
not knowing how to get out of his words, he undertook the expedition and came forward and said that he was not afraid of the Lacedaemonians, but would sail without taking any one from the city with him, except the Lemnians and Imbrians that were at Athens, with some targeteers that had come up from Enus, and four hundred archers from other quarters. With these and the soldiers at Bylos, he would within twenty days either bring the Lacedaemonians alive, or kill them on the spot. The Athenians could not help laughing at his fatuity, while sensible men comforted themselves with the reflection that they must gain in either circumstance, either they would be rid of Cleon, which they rather hoped, or if disappointed in this expectation, would reduce the Lacedaemonians. After he had settled everything in the assembly, and the Athenians had voted him the command of the expedition, he chose as his colleague Demosthenes, one of the generals at Bylos, and pushed forward the preparations for his voyage. His choice fell upon Demosthenes because he heard that he was contemplating a descent on the island, the soldiers distressed by the difficulties of the position, and rather besieged than besiegers being eager to fight it out, while the firing of the island had increased the confidence of the general. He had been at first afraid, because the island having never been inhabited was almost entirely covered with wood and without paths, thinking this to be in the enemy's favour, as he might land with a large force, and yet might suffer loss by an attack from an unseen position. The mistakes and forces of the enemy the wood would in a great measure conceal from him, while every blunder of his own troops would be at once detected, and they would be thus able to fall upon him unexpectedly just where they pleased, the attack being always in their power. If, on the other hand, he should force them to engage in the thicket, the smaller number who knew the country would, he thought, have the advantage over the larger who were ignorant of it while his own army might be cut off imperceptibly, in spite of its numbers, as the men would not be able to see where to succor each other. The Aetolian disaster, which had been mainly caused by the wood, had not a little to do with these reflections. Meanwhile, one of the soldiers who were compelled by want of room to land on the extremities of the island and take their dinners, without posts fixed to prevent a surprise, set fire to a little of the wood without meaning to do so, and as it came on to blow soon afterwards, almost the whole was consumed before they were aware of it. Demosthenes was now able for the first time to see how numerous the Lacedaemonians really were, having up to this moment been under the impression that they took in provisions for a smaller number. He also saw that the Athenians thought success important and were anxious about it and that it was now easier to land on the island, and accordingly got ready for the attempt, sent for troops from the allies in the neighbourhood, and pushed forward his other preparations. At this moment Cleon arrived at Pylos with the troops which he had asked for, having sent on word to say that he was coming. The first step taken by the two generals after their meeting was to send a herald to the camp on the mainland to ask if they were disposed to avoid all risk and to order the men on the island to surrender themselves and their arms, to be kept in gentle custody until some general convention should be concluded. On the rejection of this proposition the generals let one day pass, and the next, embarking all their heavy infantry on board a few ships, put out by night, and a little before dawn landed on both sides of the island from the open sea and from the harbour, being about eight hundred strong, and advanced with a run against the first post in the island. The enemy had distributed his force as follows. In this first post there were about thirty heavy infantry, the centre and most level part, where the water was, was held by the main body, and by Epitada as their commander while a small party guarded the very end of the island, towards Spilos, which was precipitous on the seaside and very difficult to attack from the land, and where there was also a sort of old fort of stones rudely put together, which they thought might be useful to them, in case they should be forced to retreat. Such was their disposition. 
the advanced post thus attacked by the Athenians was at once put to the sword, the men being scarcely out of bed and still arming, the landing having taken them by surprise, as they fancied the ships were only sailing as usual to their stations for the night. As soon as day broke, the rest of the army landed, that is to say, all the crews of rather more than seventy ships, except the lowest rank of oars, with the arms they carried, eight hundred archers, and as many targeteers, the Messenian reinforcements, and all the other troops on duty round Philos, except the garrison on the fort. The tactics of Demosthenes had divided them into companies of two hundred, more or less, and made them occupy the highest points in order to paralyze the enemy by surrounding him on every side and thus leaving him without any tangible adversary, exposed to the crossfire of their host, plied by those in his rear if he attacked in front, and by those on one flank if he moved against those on the other. In short, wherever he went he would have the assailants behind him, and these light-armed assailants, the most awkward of all, arrows, darts, stones, and slings making them formidable at a distance, and there being no means of getting at them at close quarters, as they could conquer flying, and the moment their pursuer turned they were upon him. Such was the idea that inspired Demosthenes in his conception of the descent, and presided over its execution. Meanwhile the main body of the troops in the island, the Dendiripadadas, seeing their outpost cut off and an army advancing against them, serried their ranks and pressed forward to close with the Athenian heavy infantry in front of them, the light troops being upon their flanks and rear. However, they were not able to engage or to profit by their superior skill, the light troops keeping them in check on either side with their missiles, and the heavy infantry remaining stationary instead of advancing to meet them and although they routed the light troops wherever they ran up and approached too closely, yet they retreated fighting, being lightly equipped, and easily getting the start in their flight, from the difficult and rugged nature of the ground, in an island hitherto desert, over which the Lacedaemonians could not pursue them with a heavy armour. After this skirmishing had lasted some little while, the Lacedaemonians became unable to dash out with the same rapidity as before upon the points attacked, and the light troops finding that they now fought with less vigour, became more confident. They could see with their own eyes that they were many times more numerous than the enemy, they were now more familiar with his aspect and found him less terrible, the result not having justified the apprehensions which they had suffered when they first landed in slavish dismay at the idea of attacking Lacedaemonians, and accordingly their fear changing to disdain, they now rushed all together with loud shouts upon them, and pelted them with stones, darts, and arrows, whichever came first to hand. The shouting accompanying their onset confounded the Lacedaemonians, and accustomed to this mode of fighting, dust rose from the newly burnt wood and it was impossible to see in front of one with the arrows and stones flying through clouds of dust from the hands of numerous assailants. The Lacedaemonians had now to sustain a rude conflict, their caps would not keep out the arrows, darts had broken off in the armour of the wounded, while they themselves were helpless for offence, being prevented from using their eyes to see what was before them and unable to hear the words of command for the hubbub raised by the enemy, danger encompassed them on every side, and there was no hope of any means of defence or safety. At last, after many had been already wounded in the confined space in which they were fighting, they formed in close order and retired on the fort at the end of the island, which was not far off, and to their friends who held it. The moment they gave way, the light troops became bolder and pressed upon them, shouting louder than ever, and killed as many as they came up within their retreat, but most of the Lacedaemonians made good their escape to the fort, and with the garrison in it ranged themselves all along its whole extent to repulse the enemy wherever it was assailable. The Athenians pursuing, unable to surround and hem them in, owing to the strength of the ground, 
attacked them in front and tried to storm the position for a long time. Indeed, for most of the day, both sides held out against all the torments of the battle, thirst, and sun, the one endeavouring to drive the enemy from the high ground, the other to maintain himself upon it, it being now more easy from the Lacedaemonians to defend themselves than before, as they could not be surrounded on the flanks. The struggle began to seem endless, when the commander of the Messenians came to Cleon and Demosthenes, and told them that they were losing their labour, that if they would give him some archers and light troops to go round on the enemy's rear by way he would undertake to find, he thought he could force the approach. Upon receiving what he asked for, he started from a point out of sight in order not to be seen by the enemy and creeping on wherever the precipices of the island permitted, and where the Lacedaemonians, trusting to the strength of the ground, kept no guard, succeeded after the greatest difficulty in getting round without their seeing him, and suddenly appeared on the high ground in the rear, to the dismay of the surprised enemy and the still greater joy of his expectant friends. The Lacedaemonians thus placed between two fires, and in the same dilemma, to compare small things with great, as at Thermopylae, where the defenders were cut off through the Persians getting round by the path, being now attacked in front and behind, began to give way, and overcome by the odds against them and exhausted from want of food, retreated. The Athenians were already masters of the approaches when Cleon and Demosthenes perceiving that, if the enemy gave way a single step further, they would be destroyed by their soldiery, put a stop to the battle and held their men back, wishing to take the Lacedaemonians alive to Athens, and hoping that their stubbornness might relax on hearing the offer of terms, and that they might surrender and yield to the present overwhelming danger. Proclamation was accordingly made, to know if they would surrender themselves and their arms to the Athenians to be dealt at their discretion. The Lacedaemonians hearing this offer, most of them lowered their shields and waved their hands to show that they accepted it. Hostilities now ceased, and a pally was held between Cleon and Demosthenes and Stiphon, son of Phyrax, on the other side, since Epidadas, the first of the previous commanders, had been killed, and Hippogritus, the next in command, left for dead among the slain, though still alive and thus the command had evolved upon Stiphon according to the law, in case of anything happening to his superiors. Stiphon and his companions said they wished to send a herald to the Lacedaemonians on the mainland, to know what they were to do. The Athenians would not let any of them go, but themselves called for heralds from the mainland, and after questions had been carried backwards and forwards two or three times. The last man that passed over from the Lacedaemonians on the continent brought this message, The Lacedaemonians bid you to decide for yourselves so long as you do nothing dishonourable, upon which after consulting together they surrendered themselves and their arms. The Athenians, after guarding them that day and night, the next morning set up a trophy in the island, and got ready to sail giving their prisoners in batches to be guarded by the captains of the galleys, and the Lacedaemonians sent a herald and took up their dead. The number of the killed and prisoners taken in the island was as follows. 420 heavy infantry had passed over, 300 all but 8 were taken alive to Athens, the rest were killed. About 120 of the prisoners were Spartans. The Athenian loss was small the battle not having been fought at close quarters. The blockade in all, counting from the fight at sea to the battle in the island, had lasted seventy-two days. For twenty of these, during the absence of the envoys sent to treat for peace, the men had provisions given them, for the rest they were fed by the smugglers. Corn and other victual was found in the island, the commander Rupertadas having kept the men upon half rations. The Athenians and Peloponnesians now each withdrew their forces from Pylos, and went home, and crazy as Cleon's promise was, he fulfilled it.
by bringing the men to Athens within the twenty days as he had pledged himself to do. Nothing that happened in the war surprised the Huns so much as this. It was the opinion that no force or famine could make the Lacedaemonians give up their arms, but that they would fight on as they could, and die with them in their hands. Indeed people could scarcely believe that those who had surrendered were of the same stuff as the fallen, and an Athenian ally, who some time after insultingly asked one of the prisoners from the island if those that had fallen were men of honour, received for answer that the Atrictos, that is, the arrow, would be worth a great deal if it could tell men of honour from the rest, in allusion to the fact that the killed were those whom the stones and the arrows happened to hit. Upon the arrival of the men the Athenians determined to keep them in prison until the peace, and if the Peloponnesians invaded their country in the interval, to bring them out and put them to death. Meanwhile the defence of Pylos was not forgotten, the Messenians from Norpactus sent to their old country, to which Pylos formerly belonged, some of the likeliest of their number, and began a series of incursions into Laconia which their common dialect rendered most destructive. The Lacedaemonians, hitherto without experience of incursions or a warfare of the kind, finding the Helots deserting, and fearing the march of revolution in their country, began to be seriously uneasy, and in spite of their unwillingness to betray this to the Athenians began to send envoys to Athens, and tried to recover Pylos and the prisoners. The Athenians, however, kept grasping at more, and dismissed envoy after envoy without their having effected anything. Such was the history of the affair of Bylos. Chapter 13 Seventh and Eighth Years of the War End of Corsira Ian Revolution, Peace of Jaila, Capture of Nicaea The same summer, directly after these events, the Athenians made an expedition against the territory of Corinth with 80 ships and 2,000 Athenian heavy infantry, and 200 cavalry on board horse transports, accompanied by the Milesians, Andrians, and Charistians from the Allies, under the command of Nicias, son of Niceratus, with two colleagues. Putting out to sea they made land at daybreak between Chisenes and Rutus at the beach of the country underneath the Silygian hill, upon which the Dorians in old times established themselves and carried on war against the Aeolian inhabitants of Corinth, and where a village now stands called Silygia. The beach where the fleet came to is about a mile and a half from the village, seven miles from Corinth, and two and a quarter from the Isthmus. The Corinthians had heard from Argos of the coming of the Athenian armament and had all come up to the Isthmus long before, with the exception of those who lived beyond it, and also of five hundred who were away in garrison in Embracia and Leucadia, and they were there in full force watching for the Athenians to land. These last, however, gave them the slip by coming in the dark, and being informed by signals of the fact the Corinthians left half their number at Sancri, in case the Athenians should go against Crumian and marched in all haste to the rescue. Battus, one of the two generals present at the action, went with a company to defend the village of Soligia, which was unfortified, Lycophron remaining to give battle with the rest. The Corinthians first attacked the right wing of the Athenians, which had just landed in front of Chisenes, and afterwards the rest of the army. The battle was an obstinate one and fought throughout hand to hand. The right wing of the Athenians and Charistians, who had been placed at the end of the line, received and with some difficulty repulsed the Corinthians, who thereupon retreated to a wall upon the rising ground behind, and throwing down the stones upon them, came on again singing the paean, and being received by the Athenians, were again engaged at close quarters. At this moment a Corinthian company having come to the relief of the left wing, routed and pursued the Athenian right to the sea, whence they were in their turn driven back by the Athenians and Charistians from the ships. Meanwhile the rest of the army on either side fought on tenaciously, especially the right wing of the Corinthians, where Lycophron sustained the attack of the Athenian left, 
which it was feared might attempt the village of Soligia. After holding on for a long while without either giving way, the Athenians aided by their horse, of which the enemy had none, at length routed the Corinthians, who retired to the hill and, halting, remained quiet there, without coming down again. It was in this rout of the right wing that they had the most killed, Lycophron their general being among the number. The rest of the army, broken and put to flight in this way without being seriously pursued or hurried, retired to the high ground and that took up its position, the Athenians, finding that the enemy no longer offered to engage them, stripped his dead and took up their own and immediately set up a trophy. Meanwhile, the half of the Corinthians left at St. Cree to guard against the Athenians sailing on Crimean, although unable to see the battle for Mount Aeneian, found out what was going on by the dust, and hurried up to the rescue, as did also the older Corinthians from the town, upon discovering what had occurred. The Athenians seeing them all coming against them, and thinking that they were reinforcements arriving from the neighboring Peloponnesians, withdrew in haste to their ships with their spoils and their own dead, except two that they left behind, not being able to find them, and going on board crossed over to the islands opposite, and from thence sent a herald, and took up under truce the bodies which they had left behind. Two hundred and twelve Corinthians fell in the battle, and rather less than fifty Athenians. Weighing from the islands, the Athenians sailed the same day to Cromion in the Corinthian territory, about thirteen miles from the city, and coming to anchor laid waste the country, and passed the night there. The next day, after first coasting along to the territory of Epidaurus and making a descent there, they came to Methana between Epidaurus and Droezen, and drew a wall across and fortified the isthmus of the peninsula and left a post there from which incursions were henceforth made upon the country of Droezen, Halli, and Epidaurus. After walling off this spot, the fleet sailed off home. While these events were going on, Eurymeton and Sophocles had put to sea with the Athenian fleet from Pylos on their way to Sicily and, arriving at Corsera, joined the townsmen in an expedition against the party established on Mount Estone who had crossed over, as I have mentioned, after the revolution and become masters of the country, to the great hurt of the inhabitants. Their stronghold having been taken by an attack, the garrison took refuge in a body upon some high ground and they capitulated, agreeing to give up their mercenary auxiliaries, lay down their arms, and commit themselves to the discretion of the Athenian people. The generals carried them across and a truce to the island of Ptychia, to be kept in custody until they could be sent to Athens, upon the understanding that, if any were caught running away, all would lose the benefit of the treaty. Meanwhile the leaders of the Corsiraean commons, afraid that the Athenians might spare the lives of the prisoners, had recourse to the following stratagem. They gained over some few men on the island by secretly sending friends with instructions to provide them with a boat, and to tell them, as if for their own sakes, that they had best escape as quickly as possible, as the Athenian generals were going to give them up to the Corsiraean people. These representations succeeding, it was so arranged that the men were caught sailing out in the boat that was provided, and the treaty became void accordingly and the whole body were given up to the Corsiraeans. For this result the Athenian generals were in a great measure responsible, their evident disinclination to sail for Sicily, and thus to leave to others the honour of conducting the men to Athens, encouraged the intriguers in their design and seemed to affirm the truth of their representations. The prisoners thus handed over were shut up by the Corsiraeans in a large building and afterwards taken out by twenties and led past two lines of heavy infantry, one on each side, being bound together, and beaten and stabbed by the men in the lines whenever any saw pass a personal enemy, while men carrying whips went by their side and hastened on the road those that walked too slowly.
as many as sixty men were taken out and killed in this way without the knowledge of their friends in the building, who fancied they were merely being moved from one prison to another. At last, however, someone opened their eyes to the truth, upon which they called upon the Athenians to kill them themselves, if such was their pleasure, and refused any longer to go out of the building and said they would do all they could to prevent any one coming in. The Corsiraeans, not liking themselves to force a passage by the doors, got up on the top of the building, and breaking through the roof, threw down the tiles and let fly arrows at them, from which the prisoners sheltered themselves as well as they could. Most of their number, meanwhile, were engaged in dispatching themselves by thrusting into their throats the arrows shot by the enemy and hanging themselves with the cords taken from some beds that happened to be there, and with strips made from their clothing, adopting, in short, every possible means of self-destruction, and also falling victims to the missiles of their enemies on the roof. Night came on while these horrors were enacting, and most of it had passed before they were concluded. When it was day the Corsi Ra'ins threw them in layers upon wagons and carried them out of the city. All the women taken in the stronghold were sold as slaves. In this way the Corsi Ra'ins of the mountain were destroyed by the commons, and so after terrible excesses the party strife came to an end, at least as far as the period of this war is concerned, for of one party there was practically nothing left. Meanwhile the Athenians sailed off to Sicily, their primary destination, and carried on the war with their allies there. At the close of the summer, the Athenians at Norpactus and the Acarnanians made an expedition against Dinactorium, the Corinthian town lying at the mouth of the Embracen Gulf, and took it by treachery, and the Acarnanians themselves, sending settlers from all parts of Acarnania, occupied the place. Summer was now over. During the winter ensuing, Aristides, son of Achippus, one of the commanders of the Athenian ships sent to collect money from the allies, arrested Atian, on the streamen, Artaphanes, a Persian, on his way from the king to Lystamon. He was conducted to Athens, where the Athenians got his dispatches translated from the Assyrian character and read them. With numerous references to other subjects, they in substance told the Lacedaemonians that the king did not know what they wanted, as of the many ambassadors they had sent him no two ever told the same story, if however they were prepared to speak plainly they might send him some envoys with this Persian. The Athenians afterwards sent back Artaphanes in a galley to Ephesus, and ambassadors with him, who heard there of the death of King Artaxerxes, son of Xerxes which took place about that time, and so returned home. The same winter the Kians pulled down their new wall at the command of the Athenians, who suspected them of meditating an insurrection, after first however obtaining pledges from the Athenians, and security as far as this was possible for their continuing to treat them as before. Thus the winter ended, and with it ended the seventh year of this war of which Thucydides is the historian. In first days of the next summer there was an eclipse of the sun at the time of new moon, and in the early part of the same month an earthquake. Meanwhile, the Mytilenian and other lesbian exiles set out, for the most part from the continent, with mercenaries hired in Peloponnese, and others levied on the spot, and took it him, but restored it without injury on the receipt of two thousand Fakin staters. After this they marched against Amtandrus and took the town by treachery, their plan being to free Antandrus and the rest of the Actian towns, formerly owned by Mytilene but now held by the Athenians. Once fortified there, they would have every facility for shipbuilding from the vicinity of Ida and the consequent abundance of timber, and plenty of other supplies, and might from this base easily ravage Lesbos, which was not far off and make themselves masters of the Aeolian towns on the continent. While these were the schemes of the exiles, the Athenians in the same summer made an expedition with sixty ships, two thousand heavy infantry, a few cavalry, 
and some allied troops from Miltis and other parts, against Scythera, under the command of Nicias, son of Niceratus, Nicostratus, son of Deutrophes, and Dorticles, son of Ptolemus. Scythera is an island lying off Laconia, opposite Mali. The inhabitants are Lacedaemonians of the class of the Periusi, and an officer called the Judge of Scythera went over to the place annually from Sparta. A garrison of heavy infantry was also regularly sent there, and great attention paid to the island, as it was the landing place for the merchantmen from Egypt and Libya, and at the same time secured Laconia from the attacks of privateers from the sea, at the only point where it is assailable as the whole coast rises abruptly towards the Sicilian and Cretan seas. Coming to land here with their armament, the Athenians with ten ships and two thousand Milesian heavy infantry took the town of Scandia on the sea, and with the rest of their forces landing on the side of the island looking towards Mali, went against the lower town of Scythera, where they found all the inhabitants encamped. A battle ensuing. The Scytherians held their ground for some little while, and then turned and fled into the upper town, where they soon afterwards capitulated to Nicias and his colleagues, agreeing to leave their fate to the decision of the Athenians, their lives only being safe. A correspondence had previously been going on between Nicias and certain of the inhabitants, which caused the surrender to be effected more speedily and upon terms more advantageous, present and future, for the Scytherians, who would otherwise have been expelled by the Athenians on account of their being Lacedaemonians and their island being so near to Lycania. After the capitulation, the Athenians occupied the town of Scandia near the harbour, and appointing a garrison for Scythera, sailed to Azine, Helis, and most of the places on the sea and making descents and passing the night on shore at such spots as were convenient, continued ravaging the country for about seven days, the Lacedaemonians seeing the Athenians masters of Scythera, and expecting descents of the kind upon their coasts, nowhere opposed them in force, but sent garrisons here and there through the country, consisting of as many heavy infantry as the points menaced seemed to require and generally stood very much upon the defensive. After the severe and unexpected blow that had befallen them in the island, the occupation of Pylos and Scythera, and the apparition on every side of a war whose rapidity defied precaution, they lived in constant fear of internal revolution, and now took the unusual step of raising four hundred horse and a force of archers, and became more timid than ever in military matters finding themselves involved in a maritime struggle, which their organization had never contemplated, and that against Athenians, with whom an enterprise unattempted was always looked upon as a success sacrificed. Besides this, their late numerous reverses of fortune, coming close one upon another without any reason, had thoroughly unnerved them, and they were always afraid of a second disaster like that on the island and thus scarcely dared to take the field, but fancied that they could not stir without a blunder, for being new to the experience of adversity they had lost all confidence in themselves. Accordingly they now allowed the Athenians to ravage their seaboard, without making any movement, the garrisons in whose neighbourhood the descents were made always thinking their numbers insufficient, and sharing the general feeling. A single garrison which ventured to resist near Cotita and Aphrodisia, struck Dera by its charge into the scattered mob of light troops, but retreated, upon being received by the heavy infantry, with the loss of a few men and some arms, for which the Athenians set up a trophy, and then sailed off to Scythera. From thence they sailed round to Epidaurus Limera, ravaged part of the country, and so came to Thyra in the Sinurian territory upon the Argive and Lycanian border. This district had been given by its Lacedaemonian owners to the expelled Aeginetans to inhabit, in return for their good offices at the time of the earthquake and the rising of the Helots, and also because, although subjects of Athens, they had always sided with Lacedaemon.
while the Athenians were still at sea, the Aeginetans evacuated a fort which they were building upon the coast, and retreated into the upper town where they lived, rather more than a mile from the sea. One of the Lacedaemonian district garrisons which was helping them in the work, refused to enter here with them at their entreaty, thinking it dangerous to shut themselves up within the wall, and retiring to the high ground remained quiet, not considering themselves a match for the enemy. Meanwhile the Athenians landed, and instantly advanced with all their forces and took Thyre. The town they burnt, pillaging what was in it. The Aeginetans who were not slain in action they took with them to Athens, with Tantiles, son of Patrocles, their Lacedaemonian commander, who had been wounded and taken prisoner. They also took with them a few men from Scythera whom they thought it safest to remove. These the Athenians determined to lodge in the islands, the rest of the Scytherians were to retain their lands and pay four talents tribute, the Aeginetans captured to be all put to death on account of the old inveterate feud, and Tantalus to share the imprisonment of the Lacedaemonians taken on the island. The same summer, the inhabitants of Camarina and Jailer in Sicily first made an armistice with each other, after which embassies from all the other Sicilian cities assembled at Jailer to try to bring about a pacification. After many expressions of opinion on one side and the other, According to the griefs and pretensions of the different parties complaining, Hermocrates, son of Hermon, a Syracusan, the most influential man among them, addressed the following words to the assembly. If I now address you, Sicilians, it is not because my city is the least in Sicily or the greatest sufferer by the war, but in order to state publicly what appears to me to be the best policy for the whole island. That war is an evil is a proposition so familiar to everyone that it would be tedious to develop it. No one is forced to engage in it by ignorance, or kept out of it by fear, if he fancies there is anything to be gained by it. To the former the gain appears greater than the danger, while the latter would rather stand the risk than put up with any immediate sacrifice. But if both should happen to have chosen the wrong moment for acting in this way, Advice to make peace would not be unserviceable, and this, if we did but see it, is just what we stand most in need of at the present juncture. I suppose that no one will dispute that we went to war at first in order to serve our own several interests, that we are now, in a view of the same interests, debating how we can make peace, and that if we separate without having as we think our rights, we shall go to war again. And yet, as men of sense, we ought to see that our separate interests are not alone at stake in the present Congress. There is also the question whether we have still time to save Sicily, the whole of which in my opinion is menaced by Athenian ambition, and we ought to find in the name of that people more imperious arguments for peace than any which I can advance. When we see the first power in Hellas watching our mistakes with the few ships that she has at present in our waters, and under the fair name of alliance speciously seeking to turn to account the natural hostility that exists between us. If we go to war, and call in to help us a people that are ready enough to carry their arms even where they are not invited, and if we injure ourselves at our own expense and at the same time serve as the pioneers of their dominion, we may expect, when they see us worn out, that they will one day come with a larger armament, and seek to bring all of us into subjection. And yet, as sensible men, if we call in allies and court danger, it should be in order to enrich our different countries with new acquisitions, and not to ruin what they possess already and we should understand that the intestine discords which are so fatal to communities generally, will be equally so to Sicily, if we, its inhabitants, absorbed in our local quarrels, neglect the common enemy. These considerations should reconcile individual with individual, and city with city, and unite us in a common effort to save the whole of Sicily. Nor should anyone imagine that the Dorians only are enemies of Athens, while the Chalcidian race is secured by its Ionian blood, 
The attack in question is not inspired by hatred of one of two nationalities, but by a desire for the good things in Sicily, the common property of her soul. This is proved by the Athenian reception of the Chalcidian invitation, an ally who has never given the many assistance whatever, at once receives from them almost more than the treaty entitles him to. That the Athenians should cherish this ambition and practice this policy is very excusable, and I do not blame those who wish to rule, but those who are over ready to serve. It is just as much in man's nature to rule those who submit to them, as it is to resist those who molest them, one is not less invariable than the other. Meanwhile all who see these dangers and refuse to provide for them properly, or who have come here without having made up their minds that our first duty is to unite to get rid of the common peril, are mistaken. The quickest way to be rid of it is to make peace with each other, since the Athenians menace us not from their own country but from that of those who invited them here. In this way instead of war issuing in war, peace quietly ends our quarrels, and the guests who come hither under fair pretenses for bad ends, will have good reason for going away without having attained them. So far as regards the Athenians, such are the great advantages proved inherent in a wise policy. Independently of this, in the face of the universal consent, that peace is the first of blessings, how can we refuse to make it amongst ourselves, or do you not think that the good which you have, and the ills that you complain of, would be better preserved and cured by quiet than by war, that peace has its honours and splendours of a less perilous kind, not to mention the numerous other blessings that one might dilate on, with the not less numerous miseries of war. These considerations should teach you not to disregard my words, but rather to look in them every one for his own safety. If there be any here who feels certain either by right or might to effect his object, let not this surprise be to him too severe a disappointment. Let him remember that many before now have tried to chastise a wrongdoer, and failing to punish their enemy have not even saved themselves while many who have trusted in force to gain an advantage, instead of gaining anything more, have been doomed to lose what they had. Vengeance is not necessarily successful because wrong has been done, or strength sure because it is confident, but the incalculable element in the future exercises the widest influence, and is the most treacherous, and yet in fact the most useful of all things, as it frightens us all equally and thus makes us consider before attacking each other. Let us therefore now allow the undefined fear of this unknown future, and the immediate terror of the Athenians' presence, to produce the natural impression, and let us consider any failure to carry out the programs that we may each have sketched out for ourselves as sufficiently accounted for by these obstacles, and send away the intruder from the country and if everlasting peace be impossible between us, let us at all events make a treaty for as long a term as possible, and put off our private differences to another day. In fine, let us recognize that the adoption of my advice will leave us each citizens of a free state, and as such arbiters of our own destiny, able to return good or bad offices with equal effect, while its rejection will make us dependent on others, and thus not only impotent to repel an insult, but on the most favourable opposition, friends to our direst enemies, and at feud with our natural friends. For myself, though, as I said at first, the representative of the great city, and able to think less of defending myself than of attacking others, I am prepared to concede something in prevision of these dangers. I am not inclined to ruin myself for the sake of hurting my enemies, or so blinded by animosity as to think myself equally master of my own plans and of fortune which I cannot command, but I am ready to give up anything in reason. I call upon the rest of you to imitate my conduct of your own free will, without being forced to do so by the enemy. There is no disgrace in connections giving way to one another a Dorian to the Dorian, or a Chalcidian to his brethren, above and beyond this we are neighbours, live in the same country, 
Argot by the same sea, and go by the same name of Sicilians. We shall go to war again, I suppose, when the time comes, and again make peace among ourselves by means of future congresses, but the foreign invader, if we are wise, will always find us united against him, since the hurt of one is the danger of all, and we shall never, in future, invite into the island either allies or mediators. By so acting we shall at the present moment do for Sicily a double service, ridding her at once of the Athenians, and of civil war, and in future shall live in freedom at home, and be less menaced from abroad. Such were the words of Hermocrates. The Sicilians took his advice, and came to an understanding among themselves to end the war, each keeping what they had, the Camerinians taking Morgantina at a price fixed to be paid to the Syracusans, and the allies of the Athenians called the officers in command, and told them that they were going to make peace and that they would be included in the treaty. The generals assenting, the peace was concluded and the Athenian fleet afterwards sailed away from Sicily. Upon their arrival at Athens, the Athenians banished Pythodorus and Sophocles, and fined Eurymedon for having taken bribes to depart when they might have subdued Sicily. So thoroughly had the present prosperity persuaded the citizens that nothing could withstand them, and that they could achieve what was possible and impracticable alike with means ample or inadequate it mattered not. The secret of this was their general extraordinary success, which made them confuse their strength with their hopes. The same summer the Megarians in the city, pressed by the hostilities of the Athenians, who invaded their country twice every year with all their forces, and harassed by the incursions of their own exiles at Pegi who had been expelled in a revelation by the popular party, began to ask each other whether it would not be better to receive back their exiles, and free the town from one of its two scourges. The friends of the emigrants, perceiving the agitation, now more openly than before demanded the adoption of this proposition, and the leaders of the commons, seeing that the sufferings of the times had tired out the constancy of their supporters, entered in their alarm and to correspondence with the Athenian generals, Hippocrates, son of Ariphron, and Demosthenes, son of Alcestis, and resolved to betray the town, thinking this less dangerous to themselves than the return of the party which they had banished. It was accordingly arranged that the Athenians should first take the long walls extending for nearly a mile from the city to the port of Nicaea to prevent the Peloponnesians coming to the rescue from that place, where they formed the sole garrison to secure the fidelity of Megara, and that after this the attempt should be made to put into the hands the upper town, which it was thought would then come over with less difficulty. The Athenians, after plans had been arranged between themselves and their correspondents both as to words and actions, sailed by night to Minoa, the island of Megara with six hundred heavy infantry under the command of Hippocrates, and took post in a quarry not far off, out of which bricks used to be taken for the walls, while Demosthenes, the other commander, with a detachment of Platean light troops and another of Peripoli, placed himself in ambush in the precinct of Inilius, which was still nearer. No one knew of it, except those whose business it was to know that night. A little before daybreak. The traitors in Megara began to act. Every night for a long time back, under pretense of marauding, in order to have a means of opening the gates, they had been used, with the consent of the officer in command, to carry by night a sculling boat upon a cart along the ditch to the sea, and so to sail out, bringing it back again before day upon the cart, and taking it within the wall through the gates, in order, as they pretended, to baffle the Athenian blockade at Minoa, there being no boat to be seen in the harbour. On the present occasion the cart was already at the gates, which had been opened in the usual way for the boat, when the Athenians, with whom this had been concerted, saw it, and ran at the top of their speed from the ambush in order to reach the gates before they were shut again, and while the cart was still there to prevent their being closed, 
their Magarian accomplices at the same moment killing the guard at the gates. The first to run in was Demosthenes with his platines and Propoli, just where the trophy now stands, and he was no sooner within the gates than the platines engaged and defeated the nearest party of Peloponnesians who had taken the alarm and come to the rescue and secured the gates for the approaching Athenian heavy infantry. After this, each of the Athenians as fast as they entered went against the wall. A few of the Peloponnesian garrison stood their ground at first, and tried to repel the assault, and some of them were killed, but the main body took fright and fled, the night attack and the sight of the Megarian traitors in arms against them making them think that all Megara had gone over to the enemy. It so happened also that the Athenian herald of his own idea called out and invited any of the Megarians that wished to join the Athenian ranks, and this was no sooner heard by the garrison than they gave way, and, convinced that they were the victims of a concerted attack, took refuge in Nicaea. By daybreak, the walls being now taken and the Megarians in the city in great agitation, the persons who had negotiated with the Athenians, supported by the rest of the popular party which was privy to the plot, said that they ought to open the gates and march out to battle. It had been concerted between them that the Athenians should rush in the moment that the gates were opened, while the conspirators were to be distinguished from the rest by being anointed with oil, and so to avoid being hurt. They could open the gates with more security as 4,000 Athenian heavy infantry from Eleusis, and 600 horse, had marched all night, according to agreement, and were now close at hand. The conspirators were already anointed and at their posts by the gates, when one of their accomplices denounced the plot to the opposite party, who gathered together and came in a body, and roundly said that they must not march out a thing they had never yet ventured on even when in greater force than at present, or wantonly compromise the safety of the town, and that if what they said was not attended to, the battle would have to be fought in Megara. For the rest, they gave no signs of their knowledge of the intrigue, but stoutly maintained that their advice was the best, and meanwhile kept close by and watched the gate making it impossible for the conspirators to effect their purpose. The Athenian generals seeing that some obstacle had arisen, and that the capture of the town by force was no longer practicable, at once proceeded to invest Nicaea, thinking that, if they could take it before relief arrived, the surrender of Megara would soon follow. Iron, stone masons, and everything else required quickly coming up from Athens, the Athenians started from the wall which they occupied, and from this point built a cross wall looking towards Megara down to the sea on either side of Nicaea, the ditch and the walls being divided among the army, stones and bricks taken from the suburb, and the fruit trees and timber cut down to make a palisade wherever this seemed necessary, the houses also in the suburb with the addition of battlements sometimes entering into the fortification. The whole of this day the work continued, and by the afternoon of the next the wall was all but completed, when the garrison in Nicaea, alarmed by the absolute want of provisions, which they used to take in for the day from the upper town, not anticipating any speedy relief from the Peloponnesians, and supposing Megari to be hostile, capitulated to the Athenians on condition that they should give up their arms, and should each be ransomed for a stipulated sum their Lacedaemonian commander, and any others of his countrymen in the place, being left to the discretion of the Athenians. On these conditions they surrendered and came out, and the Athenians broke down the long walls at their point of junction with Megara, took possession of Nicaea, and went on with their other preparations. Just at this time the Lacedaemonian proceeders, son of Tellus, happened to be in the neighborhood of Sicyon and Corinth, getting ready an army for Thrace. As soon as he heard of the capture of the walls, fearing for the Peloponnesians in Nicaea and the safety of Megara, he sent to the Boeotians to meet him as quickly as possible at Dryphidiscus, 
a village so called of the Megarid, and demanked Jurana, and went himself, with 2,700 Corinthian heavy infantry, 400 fly Asians, 600 Sicyonians, and such troops of his own as he had already levied, expecting to find Nicaea not yet taken. Hearing of its fall, he had marched out by night to try for discourse. He took three hundred picked men from the army, without waiting till his coming should be known, and came up to Megarno unobserved by the Athenians, who were down by the sea, ostensibly, and really if possible, to attempt Nicaea, but above all to get into Megara and secure the town. He accordingly invited the townspeople to admit his party, saying that he had hopes of recovering Nicaea. However, one of the Megarian factions feared that he might expel them and restore the exiles, the other that the commons, apprehensive of this very danger, might set upon them, and the city be thus destroyed by a battle within its gates under the eyes of the ambushed Athenians. He was accordingly refused admittance, both parties electing to remain quiet and await the event, each expecting a battle between the Athenians and the relieving Red Army and thinking it safer to see their friends victorious before declaring in their favour. Unable to carry his point, Brasidas went back to the rest of the army. At daybreak the Boeotians joined him. Having determined to relieve Megara, whose danger they considered their own, even before hearing from Brasidas, they were already in full force at Plataea, when his messenger arrived to add spurs to their resolution and they at once sent on to him 2,200 heavy infantry, and 600 horse, returning home with the main body. The whole army thus assembled numbered 6,000 heavy infantry. The Athenian heavy infantry were drawn up by Nicaea and the sea, but the light troops being scattered over the plain were attacked by the Boeotian horse and driven to the sea, being taken entirely by surprise as on previous occasions no relief had ever come to the Megarians from any quarter. Here the Boeotians were in their turn charged and engaged by the Athenian horse, and a cavalry action ensued which lasted a long time, and in which both parties claimed the victory. The Athenians killed and stripped the leader of the Boeotian horse and some few of his comrades who had charged right up to Nicaea and remaining masters of the bodies gave them back under truce, and set up a trophy, but regarding the action as a whole the forces separated without either side having gained a decisive advantage, the Boeotians returning to their army and the Athenians to Nicaea. After this procedures and the army came nearer to the sea and to Megara, and taking up a convenient position, remained quiet in order of battle expecting to be attacked by the Athenians and knowing that the Megarians were waiting to see which would be the victor. This attitude seemed to present two advantages. Without taking the offensive or willingly provoking the hazards of a battle, they openly showed their readiness to fight, and thus without bearing the burden of the day would fairly reap its honours, while at the same time they effectually served their interests at Megara if they had failed to show themselves they would not have had a chance, but would have certainly been considered vanquished, and have you lost the town? As it was, the Athenians might possibly not be inclined to accept their challenge, and their object would be attained without fighting. And so it turned out. The Athenians formed outside the long walls and, the enemy not attacking, they remained motionless their generals having decided that the risk was too unequal. In fact most of their objects had been already attained, and they would have to begin a battle against superior numbers, and if victorious could only gain Megara, while the defeat would destroy the flower of the heavy soldiery. For the enemy it was different, as even the states actually represented in his army risked each only a part of its entire force, he might well be more audacious. Accordingly, after waiting for some time without either side attacking, the Athenians withdrew to Nicaea, and the Peloponnesians after them to the point from which they had set out. The friends of the Megarian exiles now threw aside their hesitation, 
and opened the gates to proceeders and the commanders from the different states, looking upon him as the victor and upon the Athenians as having declined the battle, and receiving them into the town proceeded to discuss matters with them, the party in correspondence with the Athenians being paralyzed by the turn things had taken. Afterwards proceeders let the allies go home, and himself went back to Corinth, to prepare for his expedition to Thrace his original destination. The Athenians also returning home, the Megarians in the city most implicated in the Athenian negotiation, knowing that they had been detected, presently disappeared, while the rest conferred with the friends of the exiles, and restored the party at Peggy, after binding them under solemn oaths to take no vengeance for the past, and only to consult the real interests of the town. However, as soon as they were in office, they held a review of the heavy infantry, and separating the battalions, picked out about a hundred of their enemies, and of those who were thought to be most involved in the correspondence with the Athenians, brought them before the people, and compelling the vote to be given openly, had them condemned and executed, and established a close oligarchy in the town, a revolution which lasted a very long while although affected by a very few partisans. Chapter 14 Eighth and Ninth Years of the War, Invasion of Boeotia, Fall of Amphitlis, Brilliant Successes of Brasidas. The same summer the Mytilenians were about to fortify Antandrus, as they had intended, when Demodocus and Aristides, the commanders of the Athenian squadron engaged in levying subsidies heard on the house pont of what was being done to the place, Lamachus their colleague having sailed with ten ships into the Pontus, and conceived fears of its becoming a second and a the place in which the Samian exiles had established themselves to annoy Samos, helping the Peloponnesians by sending pilots to their navy, and keeping the city in agitation and receiving all its outlaws. They accordingly got together a force from the allies and set sail, defeated in battle the troops that met them from Antandrus, and retook the place. Not long after, Lamachus, who had sailed into the Pontus, lost his ships at anchor in the river Calix, in the territory of Heracle, rain having fallen in the interior and the flood coming suddenly down upon them and himself and his troops passed by land through the Bithynian Thracians on the Asiatic side, and arrived at Chalcedon, the Megarian colony at the mouth of the Pontus. The same summer the Athenian general, Demosthenes, arrived at Norpactus with forty ships immediately after the return from the Megarid. Hippocrates and himself had had overtures made to them by certain men in the cities in Boeotia who wished to change the constitution and introduce a democracy as at Athens, to Eodorus, a Theban exile, being the chief mover in this intrigue. The seaport town of Siphae, in the Bay of Chrysi, in the Thespian territory, was to be betrayed to them by one party, Cheronea, a dependency of what was formerly called the Minion, now the Boeosian, or Chomenus, to be put into the hands by another from that town whose exiles were very active in the business, hiring men in Peloponnes. Some Phocians also were in the plot, Cheronia being the frontier town of Boeotia and close to Phanotis in Phocia. Meanwhile the Athenians were to seize Delium, the sanctuary of Apollo, in the territory of Tanagra looking toward Ubia, and all these events were to take place simultaneously upon a day appointed in order that the Boeotians might be unable to unite to oppose them at Delium, being everywhere detained by disturbances at home. Should the enterprise succeed, and Delium be fortified, its authors confidently expected that even if no revolution should immediately follow in Boeotia, yet with these places in their hands, and the country being harassed by incursions, and a refuge in each instance near for the partisans engaged in them things would not remain as they were, but that the rebels being supported by the Athenians and the forces of the oligarchs divided, it would be possible after a while to settle matters according to their wishes. Such was the plot in contemplation.
Hippocrates, with a force raised at home, awaited the proper moment to take the field against the Bowie Oceans, while he sent on Demosthenes with the forty ships above mentioned to Norpactus, to raise in those parts an army of Acarnanians and of the other allies, and sail and receive Cyphae from the conspirators, a day having been agreed on for the simultaneous execution of both these operations. Demosthenes on his arrival found Deniadi already compelled by the united Acarnanians to join the Athenian confederacy, and himself raising all the allies in those countries marched against and subdued Salinthius and the Agraeans, after which he devoted himself to the preparations necessary to enable him to be at Cyphae by the time appointed. About the same time in the summer. Procedus set out on his march for the Thracian places with 1700 heavy infantry, and arriving at Heracle in Trachis, from thence sent on a messenger to his friends at Phasalus, to ask them to conduct himself and his army through the country. Accordingly they came to militia in Achaea Panuus, Dorus, Hippolochidas, Torilaus, and Strophicus, the Chalcidian Proxenus, under whose escort he resumed his march being accompanied also by other Thessalians, among whom was Nikonidas from Larissa, a friend of Perdiccas. It was never very easy to traverse Thessaly without an escort, and throughout all Hellas foreign armed force to pass without leave through a neighbor's country was a delicate step to take. Besides this the Thessalian people had always sympathized with the Athenians. Indeed, if instead of the customary close oligarchy there had been no constitutional government in Thessaly, he would never have been able to proceed, since even as it was, he was met on his march at the river Enipus by certain of the opposite party who forbade his further progress, and complained of his making the attempt without the consent of the nation. To this his escort answered that they had no intention of taking him through against their will. They were only friends in attendance on an unexpected visitor. Procedus himself added that he came as a friend to Thessaly and its inhabitants, his arms not being directed against them but against the Athenians, with whom he was at war, and that although he knew of no quarrel between the Thessalians and Lacedaemonians to prevent the two nations having access to each other's territory, he neither would nor could proceed against their wishes. He could only beg them not to stop him. With this answer they went away, and he took the advice of his escort, and pushed on without halting, before a greater force might gather to prevent him. Thus in the day that he set out from militia he performed the whole distance to Phasalus, and encamped on the river Rapidanus, and so to Phasium and from thence to Pabia. Here his Thessalian escort went back, and the Pabians, who are subjects of Thessaly, set him down at them in the dominions of Pedicus, a Macedonian town and a Mount Olympus, looking towards Thessaly. In this way Procedus hurried through Thessaly before any one could be got ready to stop him, and reached Pedicus and Chalcidus. The departure of the army from Peloponnes had been procured by the Thracian towns in revolt against Athens and by Pedicus alarmed at the successes of the Athenians. The Chalcidians thought that they would be the first objects of an Athenian expedition, not that the neighboring towns which had not yet revolted did not also secretly join in the invitation, and Pedicus also had his apprehensions on account of his old quarrels with the Athenians, although not openly at war with them, and above all wished to reduce Arabus, king of the Lincestines. It had been less difficult for them to get an army to leave Peloponnes, because of the ill fortune of the Lacedaemonians at the present moment. The attacks of the Athenians upon Peloponnes, and in particular upon Ligonia, might, it was hoped, be diverted most effectually by annoying them in return, and by sending an army to their allies, especially as they were willing to maintain it and asked for it to aid them in revolting. The Lacedaemonians were also glad to have an excuse for sending some of the helots out of the country, for fear that the present aspect of affairs and the occupation of Pylos might encourage them to move.
Indeed fear of their numbers and obstinacy even persuaded the Lacedaemonians to the action which I shall now relate, their policy at all times having been governed by the necessity of taking precautions against them. The Helots were invited by a proclamation to pick out those of their number who claimed to have most distinguished themselves against the enemy, in order that they might receive their freedom, the object being to test them as it was thought that the first to claim their freedom would be the most high-spirited and the most apt to rebel. As many as two thousand were selected accordingly, who crowned themselves and went round the temples, rejoicing in their new freedom. The Spartans, however, soon afterwards did away with them, and no one ever knew how each of them perished. The Spartans now therefore gladly sent seven hundred as heavy infantry with Brasidas, who recruited the rest of his force by means of many in Peloponnes. Brasidas himself was sent out by the Lacedaemonians mainly at his own desire, although the Chalcidians also were eager to have a man so thorough as he had shown himself whenever there was anything to be done at Sparta, and whose after service aboard proved of the utmost use to his country. At the present moment his just and moderate conduct towards the towns generally succeeded in procuring their revolt, besides the places which he managed to take by treachery, and thus when the Lacedaemonians desired to treat, as they ultimately did, they had places to offer in exchange, and the burden of war meanwhile shifted from Ploponnes. Later on in the war, after the events in Sicily, the present valour and conduct of Brasidas, known by experience to some, by hearsay to others, was what mainly created in the allies of Athens a feeling for the Lacedaemonians. He was the first who went out and showed himself so good a man at all points as to leave behind him the conviction that the rest were like him. Meanwhile his arrival in the Thracian country no sooner became known to the Athenians than they declared war against Pedicus, whom they regarded as the author of the expedition, and kept a close a watch on their allies in that quarter. Upon the arrival of Brasidas and his army, Pedicus immediately started with them and with his own forces against Erebus, son of Bromerus, king of the Lincestian Macedonians, his neighbour with whom he had a quarrel and whom he wished to subdue. However, when he arrived with his army and Brasidas at the pass leading into Lyncus, Brasidas told him that before commencing hostilities he wished to go and try to persuade Abus to become the ally of Lacedaemon, this latter having already made overtures intimating his willingness to make Brasidas arbitrator between them and the Chalcidian envoys accompanying him having warned him not to remove the apprehensions of Pedicus, in order to ensure his greater zeal in their cause. Besides, the envoys of Pedicus had talked at Lacedaemon about his bringing many of the places round him into alliance with them, and thus Brasidas thought he might take a larger view of the question of Erebus. Pedicus however retorted that he had not brought him with him to arbitrate in their quarrel, but to put down the enemies whom he might point out to him, and that while he, Pedicus, maintained half his army it was a breach of faith for Brasidas to parley with Erebus. Nevertheless Brasidas disregarded the wishes of Pedicus and held the parley in spite of him and suffered himself to be persuaded to lead off the army without invading the country of Erebus, after which Pedicus, holding that faith had not been kept with him, contributed only a third instead of half of the support of the army. The same summer, without loss of time, Brasidas marched with the Chalcidians against Acanthus, a colony of the Andrians, a little before vintage. The inhabitants were divided into two parties on the question of receiving him, those who had joined the Chalcidians in inviting him, and the popular party. However, fear for their fruit, which was still out, enabled Brosidas to persuade the multitude to admit him alone, and to hear what he had to say before making a decision, and he was admitted accordingly and appeared before the people, and not being a bad speaker for a Lacedaemonian addressed them as follows. Acanthians, 
the Lacedaemonians have sent out me and my army to make good the reason that we gave for the war when we began it, viz, that we were going to war with the Athenians in order to free Hellas. Our delay in coming has been caused by mistaken expectations as to the war at home, which led us to hope, by our own unassisted efforts and without your risking anything, to effect the speedy downfall of the Athenians, and you must not blame us for this, as we are now come the moment that we were able, prepared with your aid to do our best to subdue them. Meanwhile I am astonished at finding your gates shut against me and at not meeting with a better welcome. We Lacedaemonians thought of you as allies eager to have us, to whom we should come in spirit even before we were with you in body, and in this expectation undertook all the risks of a march of many days through a strange country, so far did ours ill carry us. It would be a terrible thing if after this you have other intentions, and mean to stand in the way of your own unhellenic freedom. It is not merely that you oppose me yourselves, but wherever I may go people will be less inclined to join me, on the score that you, to whom I first came, an important town like Acanthus, and prudent men like the Acanthians, refuse to admit me. I shall have nothing to prove that the reason which I advance is the true one, it will be said either that there is something unfair in the freedom which I offer or that I am an insufficient force and unable to protect you against an attack from Athens. Yet when I went with the army which I now have to the relief of Nicaea, the Athenians did not venture to engage me although in greater force than I, and it is not likely they will ever send across here against you an army as numerous as they had at Nicaea. And for myself, I have come here not to hurt but to free the Helens. Witness the solemn oaths by which I have bound by government that the allies that I may bring over shall be independent, and besides my object in coming is not by force or fraud to obtain your alliance, but to offer you mine to help you against your Athenian masters. I protest, therefore, against any suspicions of my intentions after the guarantees which I offer, and equally so against doubts of my ability to protect you and I invite you to join me without hesitation. Some of you may hang back because they have private enemies, and fear that I may put the city into the hands of a party, none need be more tranquil than they. I am not come here to help this party or that, and I do not consider that I should be bringing you freedom in any real sense, if I should disregard your constitution, and enslave the many to the few or the few to the many. This would be heavier than a foreign yoke, and we Lacedaemonians, instead of being thanked for our pains, should get neither honor nor glory, but, contrarywise, reproaches. The charges which strengthen our hands in the war against the Athenians would on our own showing be merited by ourselves, and more hateful in us than in those who make no pretensions to honesty as it is more disgraceful for persons of character to take what they covet by fair seeming fraud than by open force, the one aggression having for its justification the might which fortune gives, the other being simply a piece of clever roguery, a matter which concerns us thus nearly we naturally look to most jealously, and over and above the oaths that I have mentioned, what stronger assurance can you have, when you see that our words, compared with the actual facts, produce the necessary conviction that it is our interest to act as we say. If to these considerations of my new put in the plea of inability, and claim that your friendly feeling should save you from being hurt by your refusal, if you say that freedom, in your opinion, is not without its dangers, and that it is right to offer it to those who can accept it, but not to force it on any against their will then I shall take the gods and heroes of your country to witness that I came for your good and was rejected, and shall do my best to compel you by laying waste your land. I shall do so without scruple, being justified by the necessity which constrains me, first, to prevent the Lacedaemonians from being damaged by you, their friends, in the event of your non-adhesion, through the monies that you paid to the Athenians, and secondly, to prevent the Huns from being hindered by you in shaking off their servitude. 
Otherwise, indeed, he should have no right to act as we propose, except in the name of some public interest. What call should we lay Stimonians have to free those who do not wish it? Empire we do not aspire to. It is what we are laboring to put down, and we should wrong the greater number if we allowed you to stand in the way of the independence that we offer to all. Endeavor, therefore, to decide wisely, and strive to begin the work of liberation for the Helms, and lay up for yourselves endless renown, while you escape private loss, and cover your commonwealth with glory. Such were the words of Brasidas. The Acanthians, after much had been said on both sides of the question, gave their votes in secret, and the majority, influenced by the seductive arguments of Brasidas and by fear for their fruit, decided to revolt from Athens, not however admitting the army until they had taken his personal security for the oaths sworn by his government before they sent him out, assuring the independence of the allies whom he might bring over. Not long after, Stagyrus, a colony of the Andrians, followed their example and revolted. Such were the events of the summer. It was in the first days of the winter following that the places in Boeotia were to be put into the hands of the Athenian generals, Hippocrates and Demosthenes, the latter of whom was to go with his ships to Siphae, the former to Delium. A mistake, however, was made in the days on which they were each to start, and Demosthenes, sailing first to Siphae, with the Acarnanians and many of the allies from those parts on board, failed to effect anything, through the plot having been betrayed by Nicomachus, a Phocian from Thanotus, who told the Lacedaemonians, and they the Boeotians. Suckers accordingly flocked in from all parts of Boeotia, Hippocrates not being yet the to make his diversion, and Siphae and Cheronia were promptly secured, and the conspirators, informed of the mistake, did not venture on any movement in the towns. Meanwhile Hippocrates made a levy in mass of the citizens, resident aliens, and foreigners in Athens, and arrived at his destination after the Boeotians had already come back from Siphae, and encamping his army began to fortify Delium, the sanctuary of Apollo, in the following manner. A trench was dug all round the temple and the consecrated ground, and the earth thrown up from the excavation was made to do duty as a wall, in which stakes were also planted, the vines round the sanctuary being cut down and thrown in, together with stones and bricks pulled down from the houses near, every means, in short, being used to run up the rampart. Wooden towers were also erected where they were wanted and where there was no part of the temple buildings left standing, as on the side where the gallery once existing had fallen in. The work was begun on the third day after leaving home, and continued during the fourth, until dinner time on the fifth, when most of it being now finished the army removed from Delium about a mile and a quarter on its way home. From this point most of the light troops went straight on, while the heavy infantry halted and remained where they were. Hippocrates having stayed behind at Delium to arrange the posts, and to give directions for the completion of such part of the outworks as had been left unfinished. During the days thus employed the Bowie Oceans were mustering at Tanagra, and by the time that they had come in from all the towns, found the Athenians already on their way home. The rest of the eleven Boeotics were against giving battle. As the enemy was no longer in Boeotia, the Athenians being just over the Opian border, when they halted, but Pagundas, son of Violidas, one of the Boeotics of Thebes, Arianthides, son of Lysimachidas, being the other, and then commander in chief, thought it best to hazard a battle. He accordingly called the men to him, company after company, to prevent their all leaving their arms at once and urged them to attack the Athenians, and stand the issue of a battle, speaking as follows. Boeotians, the idea that we ought not to give battle to the Athenians, unless we came up with them in Boeotia, is one which should never have entered into the head of any of us, your generals. 
It was to annoy Bowie Osea that they crossed the frontier and built a fort in our country, and they are, therefore, I imagine, our enemies wherever we may come up with them, and from wheresoever they may have come to act as enemies do. And if any one has taken up with the idea in question for reasons of safety, it is high time for him to change his mind. The party attacked, whose own country is in danger, can scarcely discuss what is prudent with the calmness of men who are in full enjoyment of what they have got, and are thinking of attacking a neighbor in order to get more. It is your national habit, in your country or out of it, to oppose the same resistance to a foreign invader, and when that invader is Athenian, and lives upon your frontier besides, it is doubly imperative to do so. As between neighbors generally, Freedom means simply a determination to hold one's own, and with neighbors like these, who are trying to enslave near and far alike, there is nothing for it but to fight it out to the last. Look at the condition of the Uboeans and of most of the rest of Hellas, and be convinced that others have to fight with their neighbors for this frontier or that, but that for us conquest means one frontier for the whole country, about which no dispute can be made for they will simply come and take by force what we have. So much more have we to fear from this neighbor than from another. Besides, people who, like the Athenians in the present instance, are tempted by pride of strength to attack their neighbors, usually march most confidently against those who keep still, and only defend themselves in their own country, but think twice before they grapple with those who meet them outside their frontier and strike the first blow if opportunity offers. The Athenians have shown us this themselves, the defeat which we inflicted upon them at Coronea, at the time when our quarrels had allowed them to occupy the country, has given great security to Boeotia until the present day. Remembering this, the old must equal their ancient exploits, and the young, the sons of the heroes of that time, must endeavor not to disgrace their native valor, and trusting in the help of the God whose temple has been sacrilegiously fortified, and in the victims which in our sacrifices have proved propitious, we must march against the enemy, and teach him that he must go and get what he wants by attacking someone who will not resist him, but that men whose glory it is to be always ready to give battle for the liberty of their own country and never unjustly to enslave that of others, will not let him go without a struggle. By these arguments Pagundas persuaded the Boeotians to attack the Athenians, and quickly breaking up his camp led his army forward, it being now late in the day. On nearing the enemy, he halted in a position where a hill intervening prevented the two armies from seeing each other, and then formed and prepared for action. Meanwhile Hippocrates at Delium, informed of the approach of the Bowie Oceans, sent orders to his troops to throw themselves into line, and himself joined them not long afterwards, leaving about three hundred horse behind him at Delium, at once to guard the place in case of attack, and to watch their opportunity and fall upon the Bowie Oceans during the battle. The Bowie Oceans placed a detachment to deal with these and when everything was arranged to their satisfaction appeared over the hill, and halted in the order which they had determined on, to the number of seven thousand heavy infantry, more than ten thousand light troops, one thousand horse, and five hundred targeteers. On their right were the Thebans and those of their province, in the center the Hali, Ashans, Coronines, Copians, and the other people around the lake, and on the left the Thespians. Thanagraeans, and Orchomenians, the cavalry and the light troops being at the extremity of each wing. The Thebans formed twenty-five shields deep, the rest as they pleased. Such was the strength and disposition of the Boeotian army. On the side of the Athenians, the heavy infantry throughout the whole army formed eight deep, being in numbers equal to the enemy, with the cavalry upon the two wings. Light troops regularly armed, there were none in the army, nor had there ever been any at Athens. Those who had joined in the invasion, though many times more numerous than those of the enemy, 
had mostly followed unarmed as part of the levy in mass of the citizens and foreigners at Athens, and having started first on their way home were not present in any number, the armies being now in line and upon the point of engaging, Hippocrates, the general, passed along the Athenian ranks, and encouraged them as follows. Athenians, I shall only say a few words to you, that brave men require no more, and they are addressed more to your understanding than to your courage. None of you must fancy that we are going out of our way to run this risk in the country of another. Fought in the territory the battle will be for hours, if we conquer, the Peloponnesians will never invade your country without the Boeotian horse, and in one battle you will win Boeotia and in a manner free Attica. Advance to meet them then like citizens of a country in which you all glory as the first in Hellas and like sons of the fathers who beat the Matina fitter with Myronides and thus gained possession of Boeotia. Hippocrates had got half through the army with his exhortation, when the Boeotians, after a few more hasty words from Pagandas, struck up the paean, and came against them from the hill, the Athenians advancing to meet them, and closing at a run. The extreme wing of neither army came into action one like the other being stopped by the watercourses in the way, the rest engaged with the utmost obstinacy, shield against shield. The bowie ocean left, as far as the centre, was worsted by the Athenians. The Thespians in that part of the field suffered most severely. The troops alongside them having given way, they were surrounded in a narrow space and cut down fighting hand to hand. Some of the Athenians also fell into confusion in surrounding the enemy and mistook and so killed each other. In this part of the field the Boeotians were beaten, and retreated upon the troops still fighting, but the right, where the Thebans were, got the better of the Athenians and shoved them further and further back, though gradually at first. It so happened also that Pagandas, seeing the distress of his left, had sent two squadrons of horse, where they could not be seen, round the hill, and their sudden appearance struck a panic into the victorious wing of the Athenians, who thought that it was another army coming against them. At length in both parts of the field, disturbed by this panic, and with their line broken by the advancing Thebans, the whole Athenian army took to flight. Some made for Delium and the sea, some for Opus others for Mount Pans, or wherever they had hopes of safety, pursues and cut down by the Boeotians, and in particular by the cavalry, composed partly of Boeotians and partly of Locrians, who had come up just as the rout began. Night however coming on to interrupt the pursuit, the mass of the fugitives escaped more easily than they would otherwise have done. The next day the troops at Opus and Delium returned home by sea after leaving a garrison in the latter place, which they continued to hold notwithstanding the defeat. The Boeotians set up a trophy, shook up their own dead, and stripped those of the enemy, and leaving a guard over them, retired to Tanagra, there to take measures for attacking Delium. Meanwhile a herald came from the Athenians to ask for the dead, but was met and turned back by a Boeotian herald who told him that he would effect nothing until the return of himself the Boeotian herald, and who then went on to the Athenians, and told them on the part of the Boeotians that they had done wrong in transgressing the law of the Helens. Of what use was the universal custom protecting the temples in an invaded country, if the Athenians were to fortify Delium and live there, acting exactly as if they were on unconsecrated ground? and drawing and using for their purposes the water which they, the bowie oceans, never touched except for sake reduces. Accordingly for the god as well as for themselves, in the name of the deities concerned, and of Apollo, the bowie oceans invited them first to evacuate the temple, if they wished to take up the dead that belonged to them. After these words from the herald, the Athenians sent their own herald to the Bowie Oceans to say that they had not done any wrong to the temple, and for the future would do it no more harm than they could help, not having occupied it originally in any such design, 
it to defend themselves from it against those who were really wronging them. The law of the Huns was that conquest of a country, whether more or less extensive, carried with it possession of the temples in that country, with the obligation to keep up the usual ceremonies, at least as far as possible. The Bowie Oceans and most of the people who had turned out the owners of a country, and put themselves in their places by force, now held as of right the temples which they originally entered as usurpers. If the Athenians could have conquered more of Boeotia this would have been the case with them, as things stood, the piece of it which they had got they should treat as their own, and not quit unless obliged. The water they had disturbed under the impulsion of a necessity which they had not wantonly incurred, having been forced to use it in defending themselves against the Bowie Oceans who first invaded Attica. Besides, Anything done under the pressure of war and danger might reasonably claim indulgence even in the eye of the god, or why, pray, were the altars the asylum for involuntary offences. Transgression also was a term applied to presumptuous offenders, not to the victims of adverse circumstances. In short, which were most impious, the Bowie Oceans who wished to bar to dead bodies for holy places, or the Athenians who refused to give up holy places to obtain what was theirs by right. The condition of evacuating Boeotia must therefore be withdrawn. They were no longer in Boeotia. They stood where they stood by the right of the sword. All that the Boeotians had to do was to tell them to take up their dead under a truce according to the national custom. The Boeotians replied that if they were in Boeotia, they must evacuate that country before taking up their dead, if they were in their own territory, they could do as they pleased, for they knew that, although the opid where the bodies as it chanced were lying, the battle having been fought on the borders, was subject to Athens, yet the Athenians could not get them without their leave. Besides, why should they grant a truce for Athenian ground? And what could be fairer than to tell them to evacuate Boeotia if they wished to get what they asked? The Athenian herald accordingly returned with this answer, without having accomplished his object. Meanwhile the Boeotians at once sent for darters and slingers from the Million Gulf, and with two thousand Corinthian heavy infantry who had joined them after the battle, the Peloponnesian garrison which had evacuated Nicaea and some Megarians with them, marched against Delium, and attacked the fort, and after divers' efforts finally succeeded in taking it by an engine of the following description. They sawed in two and scooped out a great beam from end to end, and fitting it nicely together again like a pipe, hung by chains a cauldron at one extremity, with which communicated an iron tube projecting from the beam which was itself in great part plated with iron. This they brought up from a distance upon carts to the part of the wall principally composed of vines and timber, and when it was near, inserted huge bellows into their end of the beam and blew with them. The blast passing closely confined into the cauldron, which was filled with lighted coals, sulphur and pitch, made a great blaze, and set fire to the wall which soon became untenable for its defenders, who left it and fled, and in this way the fort was taken. Of the garrison some were killed and two hundred made prisoners, most of the rest got on board their ships and returned home. Soon after the fall of Delium, which took place seventeen days after the battle, the Athenian herald, without knowing what had happened, came again for the dead, which were now restored by the Bowie Oceans who no longer answered as at first. Not quite five hundred Bowie Oceans fell in the battle, and nearly one thousand Athenians, including Hippocrates the general, besides a great number of light troops and camp followers. Soon after this battle Demosthenes, after the failure of his voyage to Cyphae and of the plot on the town, availed himself of the Acarnanian and Agraean troops and of the 400 Athenian heavy infantry which he had on board, to make a descent on the Sicyonian coast. Before however all his ships had come to shore, the Sicyonians came up and routed and chased to their ships those that had landed, 
killing some and taking others prisoners, after which they set up a trophy and gave back the dead under truce. About the same time with the affair of Delium took place the death of Cythalces, king of the Adrigians, who was defeated in battle in a campaign against the tribally Seuths, son of Sparadicus, his nephew, succeeding to the kingdom of the Adrigians and of the rest of Thrace ruled by Cythalces. The same winter proceeders, with his allies in the Thracian places, marched against Tamphilus, the Athenian colony on the river Streamen. A settlement upon the spot on which the city now stands was before attempted by Aristigeras, the Milesian, when he fled from King Darius, who was however dislodged by the Edonians, and thirty-two years later by the Athenians, who sent thither ten thousand settlers of their own citizens, and whoever else chose to go. These were cut off at Drabascus by the Thracians. Twenty-nine years after, the Athenians returned, Hagnon, son of Nishas, being sent out as leader of the colony, and drove out the Edonians, and founded a town on the spot, formerly called Inia Hoed Oyo Nine Ways. The base from which they started was Iron, their commercial seaport at the mouth of the river, not more than three miles from the present town which Hagnon named Damphilus, because the stream and flows round it on two sides, and he built it so as to be conspicuous from the sea and land alike, running a long wall across from river to river, to complete the circumference. Proceeders now marched against this town, starting from Man in Shilcetis, arriving about dusk at Holon and Bromiscus, where the lake of Bolbi runs into the sea, he supped there and went on during the night. The weather was stormy and it was snowing a little, which encouraged him to hurry on, in order, if possible, to take everyone at Amphipolis by surprise, except the party who were to betray it. The plot was carried on by some natives of Argilus, an Andrian colony, residing in Amphipolis, where they had also other accomplices gained over by the dickers of the Chalcidians. At the most active in the matter were the inhabitants of Argilus itself, which is close by, who had always been suspected by the Athenians, and had had designs on the place. These men now saw their opportunity arrive with proceeders, and having for some time been in correspondence with their countrymen in Amphipolis for the betrayal of the town, at once received him into Argilus, and revolted from the Athenians and that same night took him onto the bridge over the river, where he found only a small guard to oppose him, the town being at some distance from the passage, and the walls not reaching down to it as at present. This guard he easily drove in, partly through the being treason in the ranks, partly from the stormy state of the weather and the suddenness of his attack, and so got across the bridge, and immediately became master of all the property outside the Amphipolitans having houses all over the quarter. The passage of proceeders was a complete surprise to the people in the town, and the capture of many of those outside, and the flight of the rest within the wall, combined to produce great confusion among the citizens, especially as they did not trust one another. It is even said that if proceeders, instead of stopping to pillage, had advanced straight against the town, he would probably have taken it. In fact, however, he established himself where he was and overran the country outside, and for the present remained inactive, vainly awaiting a demonstration on the part of his friends within. Meanwhile the party opposed to the traitors proved numerous enough to prevent the gates being immediately thrown open, and in concert with Eucles, the general, who had come from Athens to defend the place, sent to the other commander in Thrace, Thucydides, son of Olorus, the author of this history, who was at the Isle of Thassos, a Parian colony, half a day's sail from Amphipolis, to tell him to come to their relief. On receipt of this message he at once set sail with seven ships which he had with him, in order, if possible, to reach Amphipolis in time to prevent its capitulation, or in any case to save Ion. Meanwhile proceeders, afraid of succors arriving by sea from Thassos, 
and learning that Thucydides possessed the right of working the gold mines in that part of Thrace, and had thus great influence with the inhabitants of the continent, hastened to gain the town, if possible, before the people of Amphipolis should be encouraged by his arrival to hope that he could save them by getting together a force of allies from the sea and from Thrace, and so refused to surrender. He accordingly offered moderate terms, proclaiming that any of the Amphipolitans and Athenians who chose, might continue to enjoy their property with full rights of citizenship, while those who did not wish to stay had five days to depart, taking their property with them. The bulk of the inhabitants, upon hearing this, began to change their minds, especially as only a small number of the citizens were Athenians the majority having come from different quarters, and many of the prisoners outside had relations within the walls. They found the proclamation a fair one in comparison of what their fear had suggested, the Athenians being glad to go out, as they thought they ran more risk than the rest, and further, did not expect any speedy relief, and the multitude generally being content at being left in possession of their civic rights and at such an unexpected reprieve from danger. The partisans of proceeders now openly advocated this course, seeing that the feeling of the people had changed, and that they no longer gave ear to the Athenian general present, and thus the surrender was made and proceeders was admitted by them on the terms of his proclamation. In this way they gave up the city, and late in the same day Thucydides and his ship entered the harbour of Ion. Brasidas having just got hold of Amphipolis, and having been within a night of taking iron, had the ships been less prompt in relieving it, in the morning it would have been his. After this Thucydides put all in order at iron to secure it against any present or future attack of Brasidas, and received such as had elected to come the from the interior according to the terms agreed on. Meanwhile Brasidas suddenly sailed with a number of boats down the river time to see if he could not seize the point running out from the wall, and so command the entrance. At the same time he attempted it by land, but was beaten off on both sides and had to content himself with arranging matters at Amphipolis and in the neighborhood. Messinus, an Edonian town, also came over to him. The Edonian king Pittacus having been killed by the sons of Goxus and his own wife Braro, and Galepsus and Esime, which Arthasian colonies, not long after followed its example. Pedicus too came up immediately after the capture and joined in these arrangements. The news that Amphipolis was in the hands of the enemy caused great alarm at Athens. Not only was the town valuable for the timber it afforded for shipbuilding, and the money that it brought in, but also, although the escort of the Thessalians gave the Lacedaemonians a means of reaching the allies of Athens as far as the streamen, yet as long as they were not masters of the bridge but were watched on the side of iron by the Athenian galleys, and on the land side impeded by a large and extensive lake formed by the waters of the river, it was impossible for them to go any further. Now, on the contrary, the path seemed open. There was also the fear of the Allies revolting, owing to the moderation displayed by Brasidas in all his conduct, and to the declarations which he was everywhere making that he sent out to free Hellas. The towns subject to the Athenians, hearing of the capture of Amphipolis and of the terms accorded to it, and of the gentleness of Brasidas, felt most strongly encouraged to change their condition and sent secret messages to him, begging him to come unto them, each wishing to be the first to revolt. Indeed there seemed to be no danger in so doing, their mistake in their estimate of the Athenian power was as great as that power afterwards turned out to be, and their judgment was based more upon blind wishing than upon any sound provision for it is a habit of mankind to entrust to careless hope what they long for and to use sovereign reason to thrust aside what they do not fancy. Besides the late severe blow which the Athenians had met within Boeotia, joined to the seductive, though untrue, statements of Brasidas, 
about the Athenians not having ventured to engage his single army at Nicaea, made the allies confident, and caused them to believe that no Athenian force would be sent against them. Above all their wish to do what was agreeable at the moment, and the likelihood that they should find the Lacedaemonians full of zeal at starting, made them eager to venture. Observing this, the Athenians sent garrisons to the different towns, as far as was possible at such short notice and in winter, while Brasidas sent dispatches to Lacedaemon asking for reinforcements, and himself made preparations for building galleys in the streamen. The Lacedaemonians however did not send him any, partly through envy on the part of their chief men, partly because they were more bent on recovering the prisoners of the island and ending the war. The same winter the Megarians took and raised to the foundations the long walls which had been occupied by the Athenians, and Brasidas after the capture of Amphilus marched with his allies against Tact, a promontory running out from the king's dike with an inward curve and ending in Athos, a lofty mountain looking towards the Aegean Sea. In it are various towns, Seine, an Andrian colony, close to the canal, and facing the sea in the direction of Ubia, the others being Thessus, Cleone, Ecritoi, Olophixus, and Dem, inhabited by mixed barbarian races speaking the two languages. There is also a small Chalcidian element, but the greater number are Tyrannopelasgians when settled in Lemnos and Athens, and Bisaltans, Christonians, and Edonians, the towns being all small ones. Most of these came over to Brasidas, but Sain and Dem held out and saw their land ravaged by him and his army. Upon their not submitting, he at once marched against Tyrone in Chalcidus, which was held by an Athenian garrison having been invited by a few persons who were prepared to hand over the town. Arriving in the dark a little before daybreak, he sat down with his army near the temple of the Dioscuri, rather more than a quarter of a mile from the city. The rest of the town of Tyrone and the Athenians in garrison did not perceive his approach, but his partisans knowing that he was coming, a few of them had secretly gone out to meet him, were on the watch for his arrival and were no sooner aware of it than they took it to them seven light-armed men with daggers, who alone of twenty men ordered on this service dared to enter, commanded by Lysistratus and Olynthian. These passed through the sea wall, and without being seen went up and put to the sword the garrison of the highest post in the town, which stands on a hill, and broke open the postern on the side of Canastrium. Brasidas meanwhile came a little nearer and then halted with his main body, sending on one hundred targeteers to be ready to rush in first, the moment that a gate should be thrown open and the beacon lighted as agreed. After some time passed in waiting and wondering at the delay, the targeteers by degrees got up close to the town. The Tyrannines inside at work with the party that had entered had by this time broken down the postern and opened the gates leading to the marketplace by cutting through the bar, and first brought some men round and let them in by the postern, in order to strike a panic into the surprised townsmen by suddenly attacking them from behind and on both sides at once, after which they raised the fire signal as had been agreed, and took in by the market gates the rest of the targeteers. Brasidas seeing the signal told the troops to rise, and dashed forward amid the loud hurrahs of his men, which carried dismay among the astonished townspeople. Some burst in straight by the gate, others over some square pieces of timber placed against the wall, which has fallen down and was being rebuilt, to draw up stones, Brasidas and the greater number making straight uphill for the higher part of the town in order to take it from top to bottom, and once for all, while the rest of the multitude spread in all directions. The capture of the town was effected before the great body of the Tyrrhenians had recovered from their surprise and confusion, but the conspirators and the citizens of their party at once joined the invaders. About fifty of the Athenian heavy infantry happened to be sleeping in the marketplace when the alarm reached them. A few of these were killed fighting, 
the rest escaped, some by land, others to the two ships on the station, and took refuge in Lesithus, a fort garrisoned by their own men in the corner of the town, running out into the sea and cut off by a narrow isthmus, where they were joined by the trinines of their party. Day now arrived, and the town being secured, Brasidas made a proclamation to the Tyrrhenians who had taken refuge with the Athenians, to come out, as many as chose, to their homes without fearing for their rights or persons, and sent a herald to invite the Athenians to accept the truce, and to evacuate Lesithus with their property, as being Chalcidian ground. The Athenians refused this offer, but asked for a truce for a day to take up their dead. Brasidas granted it for two days which he employed in fortifying the houses near, and the Athenians in doing the same to their positions. Meanwhile he called a meeting of the Tyrrhenians, and said very much what he had said at Acanthus, namely, that they must not look upon those who had negotiated with him from the capture of the town as bad men or as traitors, as they had not acted as they had done from corrupt motives or in order to enslave the city but for the good and freedom of Tyrone, nor again must those who had not shared in the enterprise fancy that they would not equally reap its fruits, as he had not come to destroy the city or individual. This was the reason of his proclamation to those that had fled for refuge to the Athenians, he thought none the worse of them for their friendship for the Athenians, he believed that they had only to make trial of the Lacedaemonians to like them as well or even much better, as acting much more justly, it was for want of such a trial that they were now afraid of them. Meanwhile he warned all of them to prepare to be stone shallies, and for being held responsible for all faults in future, for the past, they had not wronged the Lacedaemonians but had been wronged by others who were too strong for them, and any opposition that they might have offered him could be excused. Having encouraged them with this address, as soon as the truce expired he made his attack upon Lesithus, the Athenians defending themselves from a poor wall and from some houses with parapets. One day they beat him off, the next the enemy were preparing to bring up an engine against them from which they meant to throw fire upon the wooden defences, and the troops were already coming up to the point where they fancied they could best bring up the engine and where place was most assailable. Meanwhile the Athenians put a wooden tower upon the house opposite, and carried up a quantity of jars and casks of water and big stones, and a large number of men also climbed up. The house thus laid and too heavily suddenly broke down with a loud crash, at which the men who were near and saw it were more vexed than frightened, but those not so near, and still more those furthest off, thought that the place was already taken at that point, and fled in haste to the sea and the ships. Brasidas, perceiving that they were deserting the parapet, and seeing what was going on, dashed forward with his troops, and immediately took the fort, and put to the sword all whom he found in it. In this way the place was evacuated by the Athenians, who went across in their boats and ships to Palene. Now there is a temple of Athene in Lesithus, and Brasidas had proclaimed in the moment of making the assault that he would give thirty silver money to the man first on the wall. Being now of opinion that the capture was scarcely due to human means, he gave the thirty money to the goddess for her temple, and raised and cleared Lesithus, and made the whole of it consecrated ground. The rest of the winter he spent in settling the places in his hands and in making designs upon the rest, and with the expiration of the winter the eighth year of this war ended. In the spring of the summer following, the Lacedaemonians and Athenians made an armistice for a year, the Athenians thinking that they would thus have full leisure to take their precautions before proceeders could procure revolt of any more of their towns, and might also, if it suited them, conclude the general peace the Lacedaemonians divining the actual fears of the Athenians, and thinking that after once tasting a respite from trouble and misery they would be more disposed to consent to a reconciliation, and to give back the prisoners, and make a treaty for the longer period.
The great idea of the Lacedaemonians was to get back their men while Perseus's good fortune lasted. Further successes might make the struggle a less unequal one in Chalcedus, but would leave them still deprived of their men, and even in Chalcedus not more than a match for the Athenians and by no means certain of victory. An armistice was accordingly concluded by Lacedaemon and her allies upon the terms following. 1. As to the temple and oracle of the Pythian Apollo, we are agreed that whosoever will shall have access to it, without fraud or fear, according to the usages of his forefathers. The Lacedaemonians and the allies present agreed to this, and promised to send heralds to the Boeotians and Phocians, and to do their best to persuade them to agree likewise. 2. As to the treasure of the god, we agree to exert ourselves to detect all malversators, truly and honestly following the customs of our forefathers, we and you and all others willing to do so, all following the customs of our forefathers. As to these points the Lacedaemonians and the other allies are agreed as has been said. 3. As to what follows, the Lacedaemonians and the other allies agree, if the Athenians conclude a treaty, to remain, each of us in our own territory, retaining our respective acquisitions, the garrison in Corifacium keeping within Bepris and Tomus, that insider attempting no communication with the Peloponnese in Confederacy, neither we with them, nor they with us that in Nicaea and Mano are not crossing the road leading from the gates of the temple of Nisus to that of Poseidon and from thence straight to the bridge at Minoa, the Megarians and the allies being equally bound not to cross this road, and the Athenians retaining the island they have taken, without any communication on either side, as to Troezen, each side retaining what it has, and as was arranged with the Athenians. 4. As to the use of the sea, so far as refers to their own coast and to that of their confederacy, that the Lacedaemonians and their allies may voyage upon it in any vessel rowed by oars and of not more than five hundred talents tonnage, not a vessel of war. 5. That all heralds and embassies, with as many attendants as they please, for concluding the war and adjusting claims, shall have free passage, going and coming to Peloponnes or Athens by land and by sea. 6. That during the truce, deserters whether bond or free shall be received neither by you, nor by us. 7. Further, that satisfaction shall be given by you to us and by us to you according to the public law of our several countries, all disputes being settled by law without recourse to hostilities. The Lacedaemonians and allies agree to these articles, but if you have anything fairer or juster to suggest, come to Lacedaemon and let us know, whatever shall be just will meet with no objection either from the Lacedaemonians or from the allies. Only let those who come come with full powers, as you desire us. The truce shall be for one year. Approved by the people. The tribe of Acomantis and the Prytony. Phenopus was secretary, Nishade's chairman. Lack is moved, in the name of the good luck of the Athenians, that they should conclude the armistice upon the terms agreed upon by the Lacedaemonians and the allies. It was agreed accordingly in the popular assembly that the armistice should be for one year, beginning that very day, the fourteenth of the month of Lathbolion during which time ambassadors and heralds should go and come between the two countries to discuss the bases of a pacification. That the generals and prytanes should call an assembly of the people, in which the Athenians should first consult on the peace, and on the mode in which the embassy for putting an end to the war should be admitted. That the embassy now present should at once take the engagement before the people to keep well and truly this truce for one year. On these terms the Lacedaemonians concluded with the Athenians and their allies on the twelfth day of the Spartan month Gerasius, the allies also taking the oaths, those who concluded and poured the libation were Taurus, son of Eshtimides, Athenus, son of Bericlides, and Philocarides, son of Erexides, Lacedaemonians, Aeneas, son of Ossetus, 
and Euphemidas, son of Aristinimus, Corinthians, Damotimus, son of Nogrets, and Onassimus, son of Megarchals, Sicyonians, Nicosus, son of Sicilus, and Menegrets, son of Amphidorus, Megarians, and Amphias, son of Eupedas, an Epidarian, and the Athenian generals Nicostratus, son of Ditrophes, Nicias, son of Niceratus, and Dortacles, son of Ptolemus. Such was the armistice, and during the whole of it conferences went on on the subject of a pacification. In the days in which they were going backwards and forwards to these conferences, son, a town in Palin, revolted from Athens, and went over to Brasidas. The Sinaeans say that they are Palinians from Peloponnes, and that their first founders on their voyage from Troy were carried into this spot by the storm which the Achaeans were caught in, and there settled. The Sinaeans had no sooner revolted than Brasidas crossed over by night to Sin, with a friendly galley ahead and himself in a small boat some way behind, his idea being that if he fell in with a vessel larger than the boat he would have the galley to defend him, while a ship that was a match for the galley would probably neglect the small vessel to attack the large one, and thus leave him time to escape. His passage effected, he called a meeting of the Sinaeans and spoke to the same effect as at Acanthus and Throne, adding that they merited the utmost commendation, in that, in spite of Palin within the isthmus being cut off by the Athenian occupation of Potidaea and of their own practically insular position, they had of their own free will gone forward to meet their liberty instead of timorously waiting until they had been by force compelled to their own manifest good. This was a sign that they would valiantly undergo any trial, however great, and if he should order affairs as he intended, he should count them among the truest and sincerest friends of the Lacedaemonians, and would in every other way honor them. The Sinaeans were elated by his language and even those who had at first disapproved of what was being done catching the general confidence, they determined on a vigorous conduct of the war, and welcomed Brasidas with all possible honours, publicly crowning him with a crown of gold as the liberator of Hellas, while private persons crowded round him and decked him with garlands as though he had been an athlete. Meanwhile Brasidas left them a small garrison for the present and crossed back again and not long afterwards sent over a larger force, intending with the help of the Sinaeans to attempt Mend and Potidaea before the Athenians should arrive, Sin, he felt, being too like an island for them not to relieve it. He had besides intelligence in the above towns about their betrayal. In the midst of his designs upon the towns in question, a galley arrived with the commissioners carrying round the news of the armistice. Aristonymus for the Athenians and Athenus for the Lacedaemonians. The troops now crossed back to Drone, and the commissioners gave Brasidas notice of the convention. All the Lacedaemonian allies in Thrace accepted what had been done, and Aristonymus made no difficulty about the rest, but finding, on counting the days, that the Sinaeans had revolted after the date of the convention, refused to include them in it. To this Brasidas earnestly objected, asserting that the revolt took place before, and would not give up the town. Upon Aristonymus reporting the case to Athens, the people at once prepared to send an expedition to Sin. Upon this, envoys arrived from Elais Dimon, alleging that this would be a breach of the truce, and laying claim to the town upon the faith of the assertion of Brasidas and meanwhile offering to submit the question to arbitration. Arbitration, however, was what the Athenians did not choose to risk, being determined to send troops at once to the place, and furious at the idea of even the islanders now daring to revolt, in a vain reliance upon the power of the Lacedaemonians by land. Besides the facts of the revolt were rather as the Athenians contended the Sinaeans having revolted two days after the convention. Cleon accordingly succeeded in carrying a decree to reduce and put to death the Sinaeans, and the Athenians employed the leisure which they now enjoyed in preparing for the expedition. Meanwhile men revolted, 
a town in Palene and a colony of the Eritreans, and was received without scruple by Brasidas, in spite of its having evidently come over during the armistice, on account of certain infringements of the truce alleged by him against the Athenians. This audacity of Ment was partly caused by seeing Brasidas forward in the matter and by the conclusions drawn from his refusal to betray him, and besides, the conspirators in Ment were few, and, as I have already intimated, had carried on their practices too long not to fear detection for themselves, and not to wish to force the inclination of the multitude. This news made the Athenians more furious than ever and they at once prepared against both towns. Brasidas, expecting their arrival, conveyed away to Olynthus in Chalcidus the women and children of the Sains and Mandines, and sent over to them five hundred Peloponnesian heavy infantry and three hundred Chalciduan targeteers, all under the command of Polydermidas. Leaving these two towns to prepare together against the speedy arrival of the Athenians, Brasidas and Pedicus started on a second joint expedition into Lyncus against Erebus, the latter with the forces of his Macedonian subjects, and a corps of heavy infantry composed of Helens domiciled in the country, the former with the Peloponnesians whom he still had with him and the Chalcidians, Acanthians, and the rest in such force as they were able. In all there were about three thousand Hellenic heavy infantry accompanied by all the Macedonian cavalry with the Chalcidians, near one thousand strong, besides an immense crowd of barbarians. On entering the country of Erebus, they found the Lincestians encamped awaiting them, and themselves took up a position opposite. The infantry on either side were upon the hill, with a plain between them, into which the horse of both armies first galloped down and engaged a cavalry action. After this the Lincestian heavy infantry advanced from the hill to join their cavalry and offered battle, upon which Procedus and Pedicus also came down to meet them, and engaged and routed them with heavy loss, the survivors taking refuge upon the heights and their remaining inactive. The victors now set up a trophy and waited two or three days for the Illyrian mercenaries who were to join Pedicus. Pedicus then wished to go on and attack the villages of Erebus, and to sit still no longer, but Brasidas, afraid that the Athenians might sail up during his absence, and of something happening to Mand, and seeing besides that the Illyrians did not appear, far from seconding this wish was anxious to return. While they were thus disputing, the news arrived that the Illyrians had actually betrayed Pedicus and had joined Erebus, and the fear inspired by their warlike character made both parties now think it best to retreat. However, owing to the dispute, nothing had been settled as to when they should start, and night coming on, the Macedonians and the barbarian crowd took fright in a moment in one of those mysterious panics to which great armies are liable, and persuaded that an army many times more numerous than that which had really arrived was advancing and all but upon them, suddenly broke and fled in the direction of home, and thus compelled Pedicus, who at first did not perceive what had occurred, to depart without seeing Brasidas, the two armies being encamped at a considerable distance from each other. At daybreak Brasidas, perceiving that the Macedonians had gone on, and that the Illyrians and Erebus were on the point of attacking him, formed his heavy infantry into a square, with the light troops in the centre, and himself also prepared to retreat. Posting his youngest soldiers to dash out wherever the enemy should attack them, he himself with three hundred picked men in the rear intended to face about during the retreat and beat off the most forward of their assailants, meanwhile, before the enemy approached. He sought to sustain the courage of his soldiers with the following hasty exhortation. Peloponnesians, if I did not suspect you of being dismayed at being left alone to sustain the attack of a numerous and barbarian enemy, I should just have said a few words to you as usual without further explanation. As it is, in the face of the desertion of our friends and the numbers of the enemy, I have some advice and information to offer, which, 
brief as they must be, will, I hope, suffice for the more important points. The bravery that you habitually display in war does not depend on your having allies at your side in this or that encounter, but on your native courage, nor have numbers any terrors for citizens of states like yours, in which the many do not rule the few, but rather the few the many, owing their position to nothing else than to superiority in the field. Inexperience now makes you afraid of barbarians and yet the trial of strength which you had with the Macedonians among them, and my own judgment, confirmed by what I hear from others, should be enough to satisfy you that they will not prove formidable. Where an enemy seems strong but is really weak, a true knowledge of the facts makes his adversary the bolder, just as a serious antagonist is encountered most confidently by those who do not know him. Thus the present enemy might terrify an inexperienced imagination, they are formidable in outward bulk, their loud yelling is unbearable, and the brandishing of their weapons in the air has a threatening appearance, but when it comes to real fighting with an opponent who stands his ground, they are not what they seemed, they have no regular order that they should be ashamed of deserting their positions when hard pressed, flight and attack are with them equally honorable and afford no test of courage, their independent mode of fighting never leaving anyone who wants to run away without a fair excuse for so doing. In short, they think frightening you at a secure distance a surer game than meeting you hand to hand, otherwise they would have done the one and not the other. You can thus plainly see that the terrors with which they were at first invested are in fact trifling enough though to the eye and ear, very prominent. Stand your ground therefore when they advance, and again wait your opportunity to retire in good order, and you will reach a place of safety all the sooner, and will know forever afterwards that rabble such as these, to those who sustain their first attack, do but show off their courage by threats of the terrible things that they are going to do, at a distance but with those who give way to their mark quick enough to display their heroism in pursuit when they can do so without danger. With this brief address Brasidas began to lead off his army. Seeing this, the barbarians came on with much shouting and hubbub, thinking that he was flying and that they would overtake him and cut him off. But wherever they charged they found the young men ready to dash out against them while Brasidas with his picked company sustained their onset. Thus the Peloponnesians withstood the first attack, to the surprise of the enemy, and afterwards received and repulsed them as fast as they came on, retiring as soon as their opponents became quiet. The main body of the barbarians ceased therefore to molest the Hellens with Brasidas in the open country, and leaving behind a certain number to harass their march. The rest went on after the flying Macedonians, slaying those with whom they came up, and so arrived in time to occupy the narrow pass between two hills that leads into the country of Erebus. They knew that this was the only way by which Brasidas could retreat, and now proceeded to surround him just as he entered the most impracticable part of the road, in order to cut him off. Brasidas, perceiving their intention, told his three hundred to run on without order, each as quickly as he could, to the hill which seemed easiest to take, and to try to dislodge the barbarians already there, before they should be joined by the main body closing round him. These attacked and overpowered the party upon the hill, and the main army of the Huns now advanced with less difficulty towards it the barbarians being terrified at seeing their men on that side driven from the height and no longer following the main body, who, they considered, had gained the frontier and made good their escape. The heights once gained, Brasidas now proceeded more securely, and the same day arrived at Arnisa, the first town in the dominions of Pitticus. The soldiers, enraged at the desertion of the Macedonians, vented their rage on all their yokes of oxen which they found on the road, and on any baggage which had tumbled off, as might easily happen in the panic of a night retreat, by unyoking and cutting down the cattle and taking the baggage for themselves. 
from this moment the Dickers began to regard Brasidas as an enemy and to feel against the Peloponnesians a hatred which could not be congenial to the adversary of the Athenians. However, he departed from his natural interests and made it his endeavour to come to terms with the latter and to get rid of the former. On his return from Macedonia to Tyrone, Brasidas found the Athenians already masters of Mend, and remained quiet where he was, thinking it now out of his power to cross over into Pallene and assist the Mendines, but he kept good watch over Tyrone. For about the same time as the campaign in Lyncus, the Athenians sailed upon the expedition which we left them preparing against Mend and Sin, with fifty ships, ten of which Wickians, one thousand Athenian heavy infantry and six hundred archers, one hundred Thracian mercenaries and some targeteers drawn from their allies in the neighbourhood, under the command of Nicias, son of Niceratus, and Nicostratus, son of Ditrophes. Weighing from Potidaea, the fleet came to land opposite the temple of Poseidon, and proceeded against Mand, the men of which town, reinforced by three hundred Sains, with their Peloponnesian auxiliaries, seven hundred heavy infantry in all, under Polydemidas, they found encamped upon a strong hill outside the city. These niches, with one hundred and twenty light-armed Methanines, sixty picked men from the Athenian heavy infantry, and all the archers, tried to reach by a path running up the hill, but received a wound and found himself unable to force the position, while Nicostratus, with all the rest of the army, advancing upon the hill, which was naturally difficult, by a different approach further off, was thrown into utter disorder, and the whole Athenian army narrowly escaped being defeated. For that day, as the Mendines and their allies showed no signs of yielding, the Athenians retreated and encamped, and the Mendines at nightfall returned into the town. The next day the Athenians sailed round to the Sin side, and took the suburb, and all day plundered the country, without any one coming out against them, partly because of intestine disturbances in the town, and the following night the three hundred Sains returned home. On the morrow Nishas advanced with half the army to the frontier of Sin and laid waste the country, while Nicostratus with the remainder sat down before the town near the upper gate on the road to Potidaea. The arms of the Mendines and of their Peloponnesian auxiliaries within the wall happened to be piled in that quarter, where Polydemidas accordingly began to draw them up for battle, encouraging the Mendines to make a sortie. At this moment one of the popular party answered him factiously that they would not go out and did not want a war and thus answering was dragged by the arm and knocked about by Polydermidas. Hereupon the infuriated commons at once seized their arms and rushed at the Peloponnesians and at their allies of the opposite faction. The troops thus assaulted were at once routed, partly from the suddenness of the conflict and partly through fear of the gates being opened to the Athenians, with whom they imagined that the attack had been concerted. As many as were not killed on the spot took refuge in the citadel, which they had held from the first, and the whole, Athenian army, Nishas having by this time returned and being close to the city, now burst into Mand, which has opened its gates without any convention, and sacked it just as if they had taken it by storm, the generals even finding some difficulty in restraining them from also massacring the inhabitants. After this the Athenians told the Mendines that they might retain their civil rights, and themselves judged the supposed authors of the revolt, and cut off the party in the citadel by a wall built down to the sea on either side, appointing troops to maintain the blockade. Having thus secured Mand, they proceeded against them. The Sains and Peloponnesians marched out against them, occupying a strong hill in front of the town which had to be captured by the enemy before they could invest the place. The Athenians stormed the hill, defeated and dislodged its occupants, and, having encamped and set up a trophy, prepared for the work of circumvallation. Not long after they had begun their operations, 
The auxiliaries besieged in the citadel of Mand forced the guard by the seaside and arrived by night at Sun, into which most of them succeeded in entering, passing through the besieging Red Army. While the investment of Sin was in progress, Perdiccas sent a herald to the Athenian generals and made peace with the Athenians, through spite against Brasidas for the retreat from Lyncus, from which moment indeed he had begun to negotiate. The Lacedaemonian Nisagras was just then upon the point of starting with an army overland to join Brasidas, and Perdiccas, being now required by Nicias to give some proof of the sincerity of his reconciliation to the Athenians, and being himself no longer disposed to let the Peloponnesians enter his country, put in motion his friends in Thessaly, with whose chief men he always took care to have relations, and so effectually stopped the army and its preparation that they did not even try the Thessalians. Iskagras himself, however, with Aminias and Aristus, succeeded in reaching Brasidas. They had been commissioned by the Lacedaemonians to inspect the state of affairs and brought out from Sparta, in violation of all precedent, some of their young men to put in command of the towns, to guard against their being entrusted to the persons upon the spot. Brasidas accordingly placed Cleoridas, son of Cleonimus, in Amphitlis, and Pasitilidas, son of Higus and uh, in Tyrone. The same summer the Thebans dismantled the wall of the Thespians on the charge of Atticism having always wished to do so, and now finding it an easy matter, as the flower of the Thespian youth had perished in the battle with the Athenians. The same summer also the temple of Hera at Argos was burnt down, through Croesus, the priestess, placing a lighted torch near the garlands and then falling asleep, so that they all caught fire and were in a blaze before she observed it. Croesus that very night fled to Phleas for fear of the Argives, who, agreeably to the law in such a case, appointed another priestess named Phaenes. Croesus at the time of her flight had been priestess for eight years of the present war and half the ninth. At the close of the summer the investment of Sim was completed, and the Athenians, leaving a detachment to maintain the blockade, returned with the rest of their army. During the winter following, the Athenians and Lacedaemonians were kept quiet by the armistice, but the Mantineans and Tegans, and their respective allies, fought a battle at Laodicium, in the Orsted. The victory remained doubtful, as each side routed one of the wings opposed to them, and both set up trophies and sent spoils to Delphi. After heavy loss on both sides the battle was undecided and night interrupted the action, yet the Tegans passed the night on the field and set up a trophy at once, while the Mantineans withdrew to Bicolian and set up theirs afterwards. At the close of the same winter, in fact almost in spring, Brasidas made an attempt upon Potidia. He arrived by night, and succeeded in planting a ladder against the wall without being discovered the ladder being planted just in the interval between the passing round of the bell and the return of the man who brought it back. Upon the garrison, however, taking the alarm immediately afterwards, before his men came up, he quickly led off his troops, without waiting until it was day. So ended the winter and the ninth year of this war of which Thucydides is the historian. Book V. Chapter 15 Tenth year of the war, death of Cleon and Brasidas, peace of Nicias. The next summer the truce for a year ended, after lasting until the Pythian games. During the armistice the Athenians expelled the Delians from Delos, concluding that they must have been polluted by some old offence at the time of their consecration, and that this had been the omission in the previous purification of the island, which, as I have related, had been thought to have been duly accomplished by the removal of the graves of the dead. The Delians had a trimitium in Asia given them by Phanaces, and settled there as they removed from Delos. Meanwhile Cleon prevailed on the Athenians to let him set sail at the expiration of the armistice for the towns in the direction of Thrace with twelve hundred heavy infantry and three hundred horse from Athens, 
a large force of the Allies and thirty ships, first touching at the still besieged Sun and taking some heavy infantry from the army there. He next sailed into Kothos, a harbour in the territory of Drone, which is not far from the town. From thence, having learned from deserters that Brasidas was not in Drone, and that its garrison was not strong enough to give him battle, he advanced with his army against the town, sending ten ships to sail round into the harbour. He first came to the fortification lately thrown up in front of the town by Brasidas in order to take in the suburb, to do which he had pulled down part of the original wall and made it all one city. To this point Pasitilidas, the Lacedaemonian commander, with such garrison as there was in the place, hurried to repel the Athenian assault, but finding himself hard-pressed and seeing the ships that had been sent round sailing into the harbour, Pasitilidas began to be afraid that they might get up to the city before its defenders with their end, the fortification being also carried, he might be taken prisoner, and so abandoned the outwork and ran into the town. But the Athenians from the ships had already taken to Rome, and their land forces following at his heels burst in with him with a rush over the part of the old wall that had been pulled down, killing some of the Peloponnesians and Turonines in the melee, and making prisoners of the rest, and Pasitilidas their commander amongst them. Brasidas meanwhile had advanced to relieve Turon, and had only about four miles more to go when he heard of its fall on the road, and turned back again. Cleon and the Athenians set up two trophies, one by the harbour, the other by the fortification and, making slaves of the wives and children of the Tyrrhenians, sent the men with the Peloponnesians and any Chalcidians that were there, to the number of seven hundred, to Athens, whence, however, they all came home afterwards, the Peloponnesians on the conclusion of peace and the rest by being exchanged against other prisoners with the Olynthians. About the same time Panactum, a fortress on the Athenian border, was taken by treachery by the Boeotians. Meanwhile Cleon, after placing a garrison in throne, weighed anchor and sailed round Athos on his way to Amphitlis. About the same time Fax, son of Erasistratus, set sail with two colleagues as ambassador from Athens to Italy and Sicily. The Leontines, upon the departure of the Athenians from Sicily after the pacification, had placed a number of new citizens upon the roll, and the commons had a design for redividing the land, but the upper classes, aware of their intention, called in the Syracusans and expelled the commons. These last were scattered in various directions but the upper classes came to an agreement with the Syracusans, abandoned and laid waste their city, and went and lived at Syracuse, where they were made citizens. Afterwards some of them were dissatisfied, and leaving Syracuse occupied for Key E, a quarter of the town of Leontini, and Bryson E, a strong place in the Leontine country, and being the joined by most of the exiled commons carried on war from the fortifications. The Athenians hearing this, sent Fox to see if they could not by some means so convince their allies there and the rest of the Sicilians of the ambitious designs of Syracuse as to induce them to form a general coalition against her, and thus save the commons of Leontini. Arrived in Sicily, Fox succeeded at Camarina and Agrigentum, but meeting with a repulse at Jailer did not go on to the rest as he saw that he should not succeed with them, but returned through the country of the Sicils to Catana, and after visiting Bryson ears he passed, and encouraging its inhabitants, sailed back to Athens. During his voyage along the coast to and from Sicily, he treated with some cities in Italy on the subject of friendship with Athens, and also fell in with some Locrian settlers exiled from Messina who had been sent thither when the Locrians were called in by one of the factions that divided Messina after the pacification of Sicily, and Messina came for a time into the hands of the Locrians. These being met by Fax on their return home received no injury at his hands, as the Locrians had agreed with him for a treaty with Athens. 
they were the only people of the Allies who, when the reconciliation between the Sicilians took place, had not made peace with her, nor indeed would they have done so now, if they had not been pressed by a war with the Hipponians and Medmeans who lived on their border, and were colonists of theirs. Fax meanwhile proceeded on his voyage, and at length arrived at Athens. Cleon, whom he left on his voyage from Tyrone to Amphitlis, made I in his base, and after an unsuccessful assault upon the Andrian colony of Stagyrus, took Galepsis, a colony of Thassos, by storm. He now sent envoys to Pedicus to command his attendance with an army, as provided by the alliance, and others to Thrace, to Poles, king of the Oda mansions, who was to bring as many Thracian mercenaries as possible, and himself remained inactive in Ion awaiting their arrival. Informed of this, Brasidas on his part took up a position of observation upon Serdilium, a place situated in the Argilian country on high ground across the river, not far from Amphitlis, and commanding a view on all sides, and thus made it impossible for Cleon's army to move without his seeing it, for he fully expected that Cleon, despising the scanty numbers of his opponent, would march against Amphitlis with the force that he had got with him. At the same time Brasidas made his preparations, calling to his standard 1500 Thracian mercenaries and all the Edonians, horse and targeteers, he also had a thousand Mycenaean and Chalciduan targeteers, besides those in Amphitlis, and a force of heavy infantry numbering altogether about 2,300 Hellenic horse. Fifteen hundred of these he had with him upon Sir Dilium, the rest were stationed with clear readers in Amphitlis. After remaining quiet for some time, Cleon was at length obliged to do as Brasidas expected. His soldiers, tired of their inactivity, began also seriously to reflect on the weakness and incompetence of their commander, and the skill and valour that would be opposed to him, and on their own original unwillingness to accompany him. These murmurs coming to the ears of Cleon, he resolved not to disgust the army by keeping it in the same place, and broke up his camp and advanced. The temper of the general was what it had been at Bylos, his success on that occasion having given him confidence in his capacity. He never dreamed of any one coming out to fight him, but said that he was rather going up to view the place, and if he waited for his reinforcements, it was not in order to make victory secure in case he should be compelled to engage, but to be enabled to surround and storm the city. He accordingly came and posted his army upon a strong hill in front of Amphitlis, and proceeded to examine the lake formed by the streamen, and how the town lay on the side of Thrace. He thought to retire at pleasure without fighting, as there was no one to be seen upon the wall or coming out of the gate all of which were shut. Indeed, it seemed a mistake not to have brought down engines with him, he could then have taken the town, there being no one to defend it. As soon as Brasidas saw the Athenians in motion he descended himself from Serdilium and entered Amphitlis. He did not venture to go out in regular order against the Athenians, he mistrusted his strength, and thought it inadequate to the attempt, not in numbers, these were not so unequal, but in quality, the flower of the Athenian army being in the field, with the best of the Lemnians and Imbrians. He therefore prepared to assail them by stratagem. By showing the enemy the number of his troops, and the shifts which he had been put to to arm them, he thought that he should have less chance of beating him than by not letting him have a sight of them, and thus learn how good a right he had to despise them. He accordingly picked out a hundred and fifty heavy infantry and, putting the rest under clear readers, determined to attack suddenly before the Athenians retired, thinking that he should not have again such a chance of catching them alone, if their reinforcements were once allowed to come up, and so calling all his soldiers together in order to encourage them and explain his intention, spoke as follows. Elopomnesians the character of the country from which we have come, one which has always owed its freedom to valour, 
and the fact that you are Dorians and the enemy you are about to fight Ionians, whom you are accustomed to beat, are things that do not need further comment. But the plan of attack that I propose to pursue, this it is as well to explain in order that the fact of our adventuring with a part instead of with the whole of our forces may not damp your courage by the apparent disadvantage at which it places you. I imagine it is the poor opinion that he has of us, and the fact that he has no idea of anyone coming out to engage him, that has made the enemy march up to the place and carelessly look about him as he is doing, without noticing us. But the most successful soldier will always be the man who most happily detects a blunder like this, and who carefully consulting his own means makes his attack not so much by open and regular approaches, as by seizing the opportunity of the moment, and these stratagems, which do the greatest service to our friends by most completely deceiving our enemies, have the most brilliant name in war. Therefore, while their careless confidence continues, and they are still thinking, as in my judgment they are now doing, more of retreat than of maintaining their position, while their spirit is slack and not high strung with expectation, I with the men under my command will, if possible, take them by surprise and fall with a run upon their centre, and do you, clear readers, afterwards, when you see me already upon them, and, as is likely, dealing terror among them, Take with you the Amphipolitans, and the rest of the allies, and suddenly open the gates and dash at them, and hasten to engage as quickly as you can. That is our best chance of establishing a panic among them, as a fresh assailant has always more terrors for an enemy than the one he is immediately engaged with. Show yourself a brave man, as a Spartan should, and do you, allies, follow him like men and remember that zeal, honour, and obedience mark the good soldier, and that this day will make you either free men and allies of Lacedaemon, or slaves of Athens, even if you escape without personal loss of liberty or life, your bondage will be on harsher terms than before, and you will also hinder the liberation of the rest of the Hellens. No cowardice then on your part, seeing the greatness of the issues at stake and I will show that what I preach to others I can practice myself. After this brief speech Brasidas himself prepared for the sally, and placed the rest with clear readers at the Thracian gates to support him as had been agreed. Meanwhile he had been seen coming down from Sodilium and then in the city, which is overlooked from the outside, sacrificing near the temple of Athe. In short, all his movements had been observed, and word was brought to Cleon, who had at the moment gone on to look about him, that the whole of the enemy's force could be seen in the town, and that the feet of horses and men in great numbers were visible under the gates, as if a sally were intended. Upon hearing this he went up to look, and having done so, being unwilling to venture upon the decisive step of the battle before his reinforcements came up and fancying that he would have time to retire, bid the retreat be sounded and sent orders to the men to effect it by moving on the left wing in the direction of Iron, which was indeed the only way practicable. This however not being quick enough for him, he joined the retreat in person and made the right wing wheel round, thus turning its unarmed side to the enemy. It was then that Brasidas, seeing the Athenian force in motion and his opportunity come, said to the men with him and the rest, those fellows will never stand before us, one can see that by the way their spears and heads are going. Troops which do as they do seldom stand a charge. Quick, someone, and open the gates I spoke of, and let us be out and at them with no fears for the result. Accordingly issuing out by the palisade gate and by the first in the long wall then existing, he ran at the top of his speed along the straight road, where the trophy now stands as you go by the steepest part of the hill, and fell upon and rooted the centre of the Athenians, panic-stricken by their own disorder and astounded at his audacity. At the same moment clear readers in execution of his orders issued out from the Thracian gates to support him, and also attacked the enemy. The result was that the Athenians, 
suddenly and unexpectedly attacked on both sides, fell into confusion, and their left towards Iron, which had already got on some distance, at once broke and fled. Just as it was in full retreat and Brasidas was passing on to attack the right, he received a wound, but his fall was not perceived by the Athenians, as he was taken up by those near him and carried off the field. The Athenian right made a better stand, and though Cleon, who from the first had no thought of fighting, at once fled and was overtaken and slain by a Messenian targeteer, his infantry forming in close order upon the hill twice or thrice repulsed the attacks of Cleorides, and did not finally give way until they were surrounded and rooted by the missiles of the Messenian and Chalcidian horse and the targeteers. Thus the Athenian army was all now in flight, and such as escaped being killed in the battle, or by the Chalcidian horse and the targeteers, dispersed among the hills, and with difficulty made their way to iron. The men who had taken up and rescued Brasidas, brought him into the town with the breath still in him, he lived to hear of the victory of his troops, and not long after expired. The rest of the army returning with clear readers from the pursuit stripped the dead and sat up a trophy. After this all the allies attended in arms and buried Brasidas at the public expense in the city, in front of what is now the marketplace and the Amphipolitans, having enclosed his tomb, ever afterwards sacrifice to him as a hero and have given to him the honour of games and annual offerings. They constituted him the founder of their colony, and pulled down the hagnonic erections, and obliterated everything that could be interpreted as a memorial of his having founded the place, for they considered that Brasidas had been their preserver and courting as they did the alliance of Lacedaemon for fear of Athens, in their present hostile relations with the latter they could no longer with the same advantage or satisfaction pay Hagnon his honours. They also gave the Athenians back their dead. About six hundred of the latter had fallen and only seven of the enemy, owing to there having been no regular engagement, but the affair of accident and panic that I have described. After taking up their dead the Athenians sailed off home, while Cleorides and his troops remained to arrange matters at Hamphilus. About the same time three Lacedaemonians, Ramphias, Autocarides, and Epicidides, led a reinforcement of nine hundred heavy infantry to the towns in the direction of Thrace, and arriving at Heracle in Trachus reformed matters there as seemed good to them. While they delayed there, this battle took place and so the summer ended. With the beginning of the winter following, Ramphias and his companions penetrated as far as Perium in Thessaly, but as the Thessalians opposed their further advance, and Brasidas whom they came to reinforce was dead, they turned back home, thinking that the moment had gone by, the Athenians being defeated and gone and themselves not equal to the execution of Brasidas's designs. The main cause however of their return was because they knew that when they set out Lacedaemonian opinion was really in favour of peace. Indeed it so happened that directly after the battle of Amphilus and the retreat of Ramphias from Thessaly, both sides ceased to prosecute the war and turned their attention to peace. Athens had suffered severely at Delium and again shortly afterwards at Amphilus, and had no longer that confidence in her strength which had made her before refuse to treat, in the belief of ultimate victory which her success at the moment had inspired, besides, and she was afraid of her allies being tempted by her reverses to rebel more generally, and repented having let go the splendid opportunity for peace which the affair of Pylos had offered. Lacedaemon, on the other hand, found the event of the war to falsify her notion that a few years would suffice for the overthrow of the power of the Athenians by the devastation of their land. She had suffered on the islander disaster hitherto unknown at Sparta, she saw her country plundered from Pylos and Scythera, the Helots were deserting, and she was in constant apprehension that those who remained in Peloponnes would rely upon those outside and take advantage of the situation to renew their old attempts at revolution. 
Besides this, as chance would have it, her thirty years' truce with the Argives was upon the point of expiring, and they refused to renew it unless Senuria were restored to them, so that it seemed impossible to fight Argos and Athens at once. She also suspected some of the cities in Peloponnese of intending to go over to the enemy and that was indeed the case. These considerations made both sides disposed for an accommodation, the Lacedaemonians being probably the most eager, as they ardently desired to recover the men taken upon the island, the Spartans among whom belonged to the first families and were accordingly related to the governing body in Lacedaemon. Negotiations had been begun directly after their capture, but the Athenians in their hour of triumph would not consent to any reasonable terms, though after their defeat at Delium, Lacedaemon, knowing that they would be now more inclined to listen, at once concluded the armistice for a year, during which they were to confer together and see if a longer period could not be agreed upon. Now, however, after the Athenian defeat at Amphipolis, and the death of Cleon and Procedus, who had been the two principal opponents of peace on either side, the latter from the success and honour which war gave him, the former because he thought that, if tranquillity were restored, his crimes would be more open to detection and his slanders less credited, the foremost candidates for power in either city, Pisto Anax, son of Pausanias, King of Lacedaemon, and Nicias, son of Niceratus, the most fortunate general of his time, each desired peace more ardently than ever. Nicias, while still happy and honoured, wished to secure his good fortune, to obtain a present release from trouble for himself and his countrymen, and hand down to posterity a name as an ever successful statesman and thought the way to do this was to keep out of danger and commit himself as little as possible to fortune, and that peace alone made this keeping out of danger possible. Pisto Anax, again, was assailed by his enemies for his restoration, and regularly held up by them to the prejudice of his countrymen, upon every reverse that befell them, as though his unjust restoration were the cause the accusation being that he and his brother Aristocles had bribed the prophetess of Delphi to tell the Lacedaemonian deputations which successively arrived at the temple to bring home the seed of the demigod son of Zeus from abroad, else they would have to plough with a silver share. In this way, it was insisted, in time he had induced the Lacedaemonians in the nineteenth year of his exile to Lycaeum whither he had gone when banished on suspicion of having been bribed to retreat from Attica, and had built half his house within the consecrated precinct of Zeus for fear of the Lacedaemonians, to restore him with the same dances and sacrifices with which they had instituted their kings upon the first settlement of Lacedaemon. The smart of this accusation, and the reflection that in peace no disaster could occur, and that when Lacedaemon had recovered her men there would be nothing for his enemies to take hold of, whereas, while war lasted, the highest station must always bear the scandal of everything that went wrong, made him ardently desire a settlement. Accordingly this winter was employed in conferences, and as spring rapidly approached, the Lacedaemonians sent round orders to the cities to prepare for a fortified occupation of Attica and held this as a sword over the heads of the Athenians to induce them to listen to their overtures, and at last, after many claims had been urged on either side at the conferences a peace was agreed on upon the following basis. Each party was to restore its conquests, but Athens was to keep Nicaea, her demand for Plataea being met by the Thebans asserting that they had acquired the place not by force or treachery but by the voluntary adhesion upon agreement of its citizens, and the same, according to the Athenian account, being the history of her acquisition of Nicaea. This arranged, the Lacedaemonians summoned their allies, and all voting for peace except the Boeotians, Corinthians, Hellenes, and Megarians, who did not approve of these proceedings, they concluded the treaty and made peace each of the contracting parties swearing to the following articles. 
the Athenians and Lacedaemonians and their allies made a treaty and swore to it, city by city, as follows. 1. Touching the national temples, there shall be a free passage by land and by sea to all who wish it, to sacrifice, travel, consult, and attend the oracle or games, according to the customs of their countries. 2. The temple and shrine of Apollo at Delphi and the Delphians shall be governed by their own laws, taxed by their own state, and judged by their own judges, the land and the people, according to the custom of their country. 3. The treaty shall be binding for fifty years upon the Athenians and the allies of the Athenians, and upon the Lacedaemonians and the allies of the Lacedaemonians, without fraud or hurt by land or by sea. 4. It shall not be lawful to take up arms, with intent to do hurt, either for the Lacedaemonians and their allies against the Athenians and their allies, or for the Athenians and their allies against the Lacedaemonians and their allies, in any way or means whatsoever. But should any difference arise between them they are to have recourse to law and oaths, according as may be agreed between the parties. 5. The Lacedaemonians and their allies shall give back Amphipolis to the Athenians. Nevertheless, in the case of cities given up by the Lacedaemonians to the Athenians, the inhabitants shall be allowed to go where they please and to take their property with them, and the cities shall be independent, paying only the tribute of Aristides. And it shall not be lawful for the Athenians or their allies to carry on war against them after the treaty has been concluded so long as the tribute is paid. The cities referred to are Argilus, Stegyrus, Acanthus, Scales, Olynthus, and Spatulus. These cities shall be neutral, allies neither of the Lacedaemonians nor of the Athenians, but if the cities consent, it shall be lawful for the Athenians to make them their allies, provided always that the cities wish it. The Messi Benins, Sanaeans, and Singines shall inhabit their own cities, as also the Olynthians and Acanthians, but the Lacedaemonians and their allies shall give back Panactum to the Athenians. 6. The Athenians shall give back Corephasium, Cythera, Methana, Lacedaemonians that are in the prison at Athens or elsewhere in the Athenian dominions, and shall let go the Peloponnesians besieged in Sin and all others in some that are allies of the Lacedaemonians, and all whom receders sent in there, and any others of the allies of the Lacedaemonians that may be in the prison at Athens or elsewhere in the Athenian dominions. 7. The Lacedaemonians and their allies shall in like manner give back any of the Athenians or their allies that they may have in their hands. 8. In the case of S. Tyrone and Sir Milium, and any other cities that the Athenians may have, the Athenians may adopt such measures as they please. 9. The Athenians shall take an oath to the Lacedaemonians and their allies, city by city. Every man shall swear by the most binding oath of his country, seventeen from each city. The oath shall be as follows, I will abide by this agreement and treaty honestly and without deceit. In the same way an oath shall be taken by the Lacedaemonians and their allies to the Athenians, and the oath shall be renewed annually by both parties. Pillars shall be erected at Olympia, Pythia, the Isthmus, at Athens in the Acropolis, and at Lacedaemon in the temple at Amitli. 10. If anything be forgotten, whatever it be, and on whatever point, it shall be consistent with the oath for both parties the Athenians and Lacedaemonians, to all it, according to their discretion. The treaty begins from the Ephoralty of Pistolas in Lacedaemon, on the twenty-seventh day of the month of Artemisium, and from the Archonship of Altus at Athens, on the twenty-fifth day of the month of Elathbolion. Those who took the oath and poured the libations from the Lacedaemonians were Pistoanax, Agas, Pistolas, Damagitas, Cnees, Metagens, Acanthus, Dthus, Iscagras, Philocoridas, Zeuxidas, Antipas, Telus, Alcinadas, Empedias, Menas, and Lephilus, for the Athenians, Lampon, Ismonicus, Nishas, 
Lacus, Euthydemus, Procles, Pythodorus, Hagnon, Mytilus, Thrasycles, Thetians, Aristocrats, Iosius, Timocrates, Leon, Lamachus, and Demosthenes. This treaty was made in the spring, just at the end of winter, directly after the city festival of Dionysus, just ten years, with a difference of a few days, from the first invasion of Attica and the commencement of this war. This must be calculated by the seasons rather than by trusting to the enumeration of the names of the several magistrates or offices of honour that are used to mark past events. Accuracy is impossible where an event may have occurred in the beginning, or middle, or at any period in their tenure of office. But by computing by summers and winters, the method adopted in this history, it will be found that, each of these amounting to half a year, there were ten summers and as many winters contained in this first war. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians, to whose lot it fell to begin the work of restitution, immediately set free all the prisoners of war in their possession, and sent to Skagras, Manas, and Philocharides as envoys to the towns in the direction of Thrace, to order clear readers to hand over Amphipolis to the Athenians and the rest of their allies each to accept the treaty as it affected them. They, however, did not like its terms, and refused to accept it. Clear readers also, willing to oblige the Chalcidians, would not hand over the town, averring his inability to do so against their will. Meanwhile he hastened in person to Lacedaemon with envoys from the place to defend his disobedience against the possible accusations of Iscagoras and his companions, and also to see whether it was too late for the agreement to be altered, and on finding the Lacedaemonians were bound, quickly set out back again with instructions from them to hand over the place, if possible, or at all events to bring out the Peloponnesians that were in it. The allies happened to be present in person at Lacedaemon and those who had not accepted the treaty were now asked by the Lacedaemonians to adopt it. This, however, they refused to do, for the same reasons as before, unless a fairer one than the present were agreed upon, and remaining firm in their determination were dismissed by the Lacedaemonians, who now decided on forming an alliance with the Athenians, thinking that Argos, who had refused the application of Amplitas and Liches for a renewal of the treaty, would without Athens be no longer formidable, and that the rest of the Peloponnes would be most likely to keep quiet, if the coveted alliance of Athens were shut against them. Accordingly, after conference with the Athenian ambassadors, an alliance was agreed upon and oaths were exchanged, upon the terms following. 1. The Lacedaemonians shall be allies of the Athenians for fifty years. 2. Should any enemy invade the territory of Lacedaemon and injure the Lacedaemonians, the Athenians shall help in such way as they most effectively can, according to their power. But if the invader be gone after plundering the country, that city shall be the enemy of Lacedaemon and Athens, and shall be chastised by both and one shall not make peace without the other. This to be honestly, loyally, and without fraud. 3. Should any enemy invade the territory of Athens and injure the Athenians, the Lacedaemonians shall help them in such way as they most effectively can, according to their power. But if the invader be gone after plundering the country, that city shall be the enemy of Lacedaemon and Athens, and shall be chastised by both and one shall not make peace without the other. This to be honestly, loyally, and without fraud. 4. Should the slave population arise, the Athenians shall help the Lacedaemonians with all their might, according to their power. 5. This treaty shall be sworn to by the same persons on either side that swore to the other. It shall be renewed annually by the Lacedaemonians going to Athens for the Dionysia, and the Athenians to Lacedaemon for the higher Cynthia, and a pillar shall be set up by either party, at Lacedaemon near the statue of Apollo at Amitli, and at Athens on the Acropolis near the statue of Athene.
should the Lacedaemonians and Athenians see to add to or take away from the alliance in any particular, it shall be consistent with their oaths for both parties to do so, according to their discretion. Those who took the oath from the Lacedaemonians were Pistoanax, Agas, Pistolas, Damictus, Cnees, Metagens, Acanthus, Dthus, Iscagras, Philocaridas, Zeuxidas, Antipas, Alcinadas, Telus, Empedias, Menas, and Lephilus, for the Athenians, Lampon, Ismionicus, Lacas, Nishas, Euthydemus, Procles, Pythodorus, Hagnon, Mytilus, Thrasycles, Thetians, Aristocrats, Iolcius, Timocrats, Leon, Lamachus, and Demosthenes. This alliance was made not long after the treaty, and the Athenians gave back the men from the island to the Lacedaemonians, and the summer of the eleventh year began. This completes the history of the First War, which occupied the whole of the ten years previously. Chapter 16 Feeling against Sparta in Peloponnese, League of the Mantineans, Hellenes, Argives, and Athenians, Battle of Mantinea and Breaking Up of the League. After the treaty and the alliance between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians, concluded after the Ten Years' War, in the effort of Pistolas at Lacedaemon, and the archonship of Altus at Athens, the states which had accepted them were at peace, with the Corinthians and some of the cities in Peloponnese trying to disturb the settlement. A fresh agitation was instantly commenced by the allies against Lacedaemon. Further, the Lacedaemonians, as time went on, became suspected by the Athenians through their not performing some of the provisions in the treaty, and though for six years and ten months they abstained from invasion of each other's territory, yet abroad an unstable armistice did not prevent either party doing the other the most effectual injury, until they were finally obliged to break the treaty made after the Ten Years' War and to have recourse to open hostilities. The history of this period has been also written by the same Thucydides, an Athenian, in the chronological order of events by summers and winters, to the time when the Lacedaemonians and their allies put an end to the Athenian Empire, and took the Long Walls and Piraeus. The war had then lasted for twenty-seven years in all. Only a mistaken judgment can object to including the interval of treaty in the war. Looked at by the light of facts, it cannot, it will be found, be rationally considered a state of peace, when neither party either gave or got back all that they had agreed, apart from the violations of it which occurred on both sides in the Mantinean and Epidarian wars and other instances, and the fact that the allies in the direction of Thrace were in as open hostility as ever, while the Boeotians had only a truce renewed every ten days so that the first ten years' war, the treacherous armistice that followed it, and the subsequent war will, calculating by the seasons, be found to make up the number of years which I have mentioned, with a difference of a few days, and to afford an instance of faith in oracles being for once justified by the event. I certainly all along remember from the beginning to the end of the war its being commonly declared that it would last thrice nine years. I lived through the whole of it, being of an age to comprehend events, and giving my attention to them in order to know the exact truth about them. It was also my fate to be an exile from my country for twenty years after my command at Amphitlis, and being present with both parties, and more especially with the Peloponnesians by reason of my exile, I had leisure to observe affairs somewhat particularly. I will accordingly now relate the differences that arose after the Ten Years' War, the breach of the treaty, and the hostilities that followed. After the conclusion of the Fifty Years' Truce and of the subsequent alliance, the embassies from Peloponnese which had been summoned for this business returned from Lacedaemon. The rest went straight home, but the Corinthians first turned aside to Argos and opened negotiations with some of the men in office there pointing out that Lacedaemon could have no good end in view, but only the subjugation of Peloponnese, or she would never have entered into treaty and alliance with the once detested Athenians, 
and that the duty of consulting for the safety of Peloponnes had now fallen upon Argos, who should immediately pass a decree inviting any Hellenic state that chose, such state being independent and accustomed to meet fellow powers upon the fair and equal ground of law and justice, to make a defensive alliance with the Argives, appointing a few individuals with plenipotentiary powers, instead of making the people the medium of negotiation in order that, in the case of an applicant being rejected, the fact of his overtures might not be made public. They said that many would come over from hatred of the Lacedaemonians. After this explanation of their views, the Corinthians returned home. The persons with whom they had communicated reported the proposal to their government and people, and the Argives passed the decree and chose twelve men to negotiate an alliance for any Hellenic state that wished it, except Athens and Lacedaemon, neither of which should be able to join without reference to the Argive people. Argos came into the plan the more readily because she saw that war with Lacedaemon was inevitable, the truce being on the point of expiring, and also because she hoped to gain the supremacy of Peloponnes for at this time Lacedaemon had sunk very low in public estimation because of her disasters, while the Argives were in a most flourishing condition, having taken no part in the Attic War, but having on the contrary profited largely by the neutrality. The Argives accordingly prepared to receive into alliance any of the Helms that desired it. The Mantineans and their allies were the first to come over through fear of the Lacedaemonians. Having taken advantage of the war against Athens to reduce a large part of Arcadia into subjection, they thought that Lacedaemon would not leave them undisturbed in their conquests, now that she had leisure to interfere, and consequently gladly turned to a powerful city like Argos, the historical enemy of the Lacedaemonians, and assisted democracy. Upon the defection of Mantinea, the rest of Peloponnes at once began to agitate the propriety of following her example, conceiving that the Mantineans not have changed sides without good reason, besides which they were angry with Lacedaemon among other reasons for having inserted in the treaty with Athens that it should be consistent with their oaths for both parties, Lacedaemonians and Athenians, to add to or take away from it according to their discretion. It was this clause that was the real origin of the panic in Peloponnes, by exciting suspicions of a Lacedaemonian and Athenian combination against their liberties, any alteration should properly have been made conditional upon the consent of the whole body of the Allies. With these apprehensions there was a very general desire in each state to place itself in alliance with Argos. In the meantime the Lacedaemonians perceiving the agitation going on in Peloponnes, and that Corinth was the author of it and was herself about to enter into alliance with the Argives, sent ambassadors thither in the hope of preventing what was in contemplation. They accused her of having brought it all about, and told her that she could not desert Lacedaemon and become the ally of Argos without adding violation of her oaths to the crime which she had already committed in not accepting the treaty with Athens, when it had been expressly agreed that the decision of the majority of the Allies should be binding, unless the gods or heroes stood in the way. Corinth in her answer, delivered before those of her Allies who had like her refused to accept the treaty, and whom she had previously invited to attend refrained from openly stating the injuries she complained of, such as the non-recovery of Solium or Anactorium from the Athenians, or any other point in which she thought she had been prejudiced, but took shelter under the pretext that she could not give up her Thracian allies, to whom her separate individual security had been given, when they first rebelled with Potidaea, as well as upon subsequent occasions. She denied, therefore, that she committed any violation of her oaths to the Allies in not entering into the treaty with Athens, having sworn upon the faith of the gods to her Thracian friends, she could not honestly give them up. Besides, the expression was, unless the gods or heroes stand in the way. Now here, as it appeared to her, the gods stood in the way. 
This was what she said on the subject of her former oaths. As to the Argive alliance, she would confer with her friends and do whatever was right. The Lacedaemonian envoys returning home, some Argive ambassadors who happened to be in Corinth pressed her to conclude the alliance without further delay, but were told to attend at the next congress to be held at Corinth. Immediately afterwards an Elene embassy arrived, and first making an alliance with Corinth went on from thence to Argos, according to their instructions, and became allies of the Argives their country being just then at enmity with Lacedaemon and Larum. Some time back there had been a war between the Lepruns and some of the Arcadians, and the Aleans being called in by the former with the offer of half their lands, had put an end to the war, and leaving the land in the hands of its Leprian occupiers had imposed upon them the tribute of a talent to the Olympians. Use. Till the Attic War this tribute was paid by the Leprians who then took the war as an excuse for no longer doing so, and upon the Aleans using force appealed to Lacedaemon. The case was thus submitted to her arbitrament, but the Aleans, suspecting the fairness of the tribunal, renounced the reference and laid waste the Leprian territory. The Lacedaemonians nevertheless decided that the Leprians were independent and the Aleans aggressors, and as the latter did not abide by the arbitration, sent a garrison of heavy infantry into Lerum. Upon this the Aleans, holding that Lacedaemon had received one of their rebel subjects, put forward the convention providing that each confederate should come out of the Attic War in possession of what he had when he went into it, and considering that justice had not been done them went over to the Argives, and now made the alliance through their ambassadors, who had been instructed for that purpose. Immediately after them the Corinthians and the Thracian Chalcidians became allies of Argos. Meanwhile the Boeotians and Megarians, who acted together, remained quiet, being left to do as they pleased by Lacedaemon, and thinking that the Argive democracy would not suit so well with their aristocratic government as the Lacedaemonian constitution. About the same time in this summer Athens succeeded in reducing some put the adult males to death, and, making slaves of the women and children, gave the land for the Platines to live in. She also brought back the Delians to Delos, moved by her misfortunes in the field and by the commands of the god at Delphi. Meanwhile the Phocians and Locrians commenced hostilities. The Corinthians and Argives, being now in alliance, went to Tegea to bring about its defection from Elastomon seeing that, if so considerable a state could be persuaded to join, all Peloponnes would be with them. But when the Tegans said that they would do nothing against Lacedaemon, the hitherto zealous Corinthians relaxed their activity, and began to fear that none of the rest would now come over. Still they went to the Bowie Oceans and tried to persuade them to alliance and a common action generally with Argos and themselves and also begged them to go with them to Athens and obtain for them a ten days truce similar to that made between the Athenians and Bowie Oceans not long after the Fifty Years Treaty, and, in the event of the Athenians refusing to throw up the armistice and not make any truce in future without Corinth. These were the requests of the Corinthians. The Bowie Oceans stopped them on the subject of the Argive alliance, but went with them to Athens where however they failed to obtain the ten days truce, the Athenian answer being that the Corinthians has truce already, as being allies of Lacedaemon. Nevertheless the Boeotians did not throw up their ten days truce, in spite of the prayers and reproaches of the Corinthians for their breach of faith, and these last had to content themselves with a de facto armistice with Athens. The same summer the Lacedaemonians marched into Arcadia with their whole levy under Pisto Anax, son of Pausanias, king of Lacedaemon, against the Parasians, who were subjects of Mantinea, and a faction of whom had invited their aid. They also meant to demolish, if possible, the fort of Sipsla which the Mantinians had built and garrisoned in the Parasian territory to annoy the district of Cyritus in Lycania. 
the Lacedaemonians accordingly laid waste the power Asian country, and the Mantineans, placing their town in the hands of an Argive garrison, addressed themselves to the defense of their confederacy, but being unable to save Sipsla or the power Asian towns went back to Mantinea. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians made the power Asians independent, raised the fortress, and returned home. The same summer the soldiers from Thrace who had gone out with Brasidas came back, having been brought from thence after the treaty by Clearidas, and the Lacedaemonians decreed that the Helots who had fought with Brasidas should be free and allowed to live where they liked, and not long afterwards settled them with the Neodemods at Lerum, which is situated on the Lycanian and Aline border, Lacedaemon being at this time at enmity with the Elis. Those however of the Spartans who had been taken prisoners on the island and had surrendered their arms might, it was feared, suppose that they were to be subjected to some degradation in consequence of their misfortune, and so make some attempt at revolution, if left in possession of their franchise. These were therefore at once disfranchised, although some of them were in office at the time, and thus placed under a disability to take office or buy and sell anything. After some time, however, the franchise was restored to them. The same summer the Dians took Thessus, a town on act by Athos in alliance with Athens. During the whole of this summer intercourse between the Athenians and Peloponnesians continued, although each party began to suspect the other directly after the treaty, because of the places specified in it not being restored. Lacedaemon to whose lot it had fallen to begin by restoring Amphipolis and the other towns, had not done so. She had equally failed to get the treaty accepted by her Thracian allies, or by the Boeotians or the Corinthians, although she was continually promising to unite with Athens in compelling their compliance, if it were longer refused. She also kept fixing a time at which those who still refused to come in were to be declared enemies to both parties, but took care not to bind herself by any written agreement. Meanwhile the Athenians, seeing none of these professions performed in fact, began to suspect the honesty of her intentions, and consequently not only refused to comply with her demands for bylaws but also repented having given up the prisoners from the island, and kept tight hold of the other places, until Lacedaemon's part of the treaty should be fulfilled. Lacedaemon, on the other hand, said she had done what she could, having given up the Athenian prisoners of war in her possession, evacuated the race, and performed everything else in her power. Amphilus it was out of her ability to restore but she would endeavour to bring the Boeotians and Corinthians into the treaty, to recover Panactum, and send home all the Athenian prisoners of war in Boeotia. Meanwhile she required that Pylos should be restored, or at all events that the Messenians and Helots should be withdrawn, as her troops had been from Thrace, and the place garrisoned, if necessary, by the Athenians themselves. After a number of different conferences held during the summer, she succeeded in persuading Athens to withdraw from Pylos the Messenians and the rest of the Helots and deserters from Lycania, who were accordingly settled by her at Crania and Cephalonia. Thus, during this summer there was peace and intercourse between the two peoples. Next winter, however, the ephors under whom the treaty had been made were no longer in office, and some of their successors were directly opposed to it. Embassies now arrived from the Lacedaemonian Confederacy, and the Athenians, Boeotians, and Corinthians also presented themselves at Lacedaemon, and after much discussion and no agreement between them, separated for their several homes, when Cleobulus and Xenas, the two ephors who were the most anxious to break off the treaty, took advantage of this opportunity to communicate privately with the Boeotians and Corinthians, and, advising them to act as much as possible together, instructed the former first to enter into alliance with Argos, and then try and bring themselves and the Argives into alliance with Lacedaemon. The Boeotians would so be least likely to be compelled to come into the Attic Treaty, 
and the Lacedaemonians would prefer gaining the friendship and alliance of Argos even at the price of the hostility of Athens and the rupture of the treaty. The Boeotians knew that an honorable friendship with Argos had been long the desire of Lacedaemon, for the Lacedaemonians believed that this would considerably facilitate the conduct of the war outside Ploponnes. Meanwhile they begged the Boeotians to place Panactum in her hands in order that she might, if possible, obtain Pylos in exchange for it, and so be more in a position to resume hostilities with Athens. After receiving these instructions for their governments from Xenas and Cleobulus and their friends at Lacedaemon, the Boeotians and Corinthians departed. On their way home they were joined by two persons high in office at Argos, who had waited for them on the road, and who now sounded them upon the possibility of the Boeotians joining the Corinthians, Hellenes, and Mantinians in becoming the allies of Argos, in the idea that if this could be effected they would be able, thus united, to make peace or war as they pleased either against Lacedaemon nor any other power. The Boeotian envoys were, were pleased at thus hearing themselves accidentally asked to do what their friends at Lacedaemon had told them, and the two Argives perceiving that their proposal was agreeable, departed with a promise to send ambassadors to the Boeotians. On their arrival the Boeotians reported to the Boeotics what had been said to them at Lacedaemon and also by the Argives who had met them, and the Boeotics, pleased with the idea embraced it with a more eagerness from the lucky coincidence of Argos soliciting the very thing wanted by their friends at Lacedaemon. Shortly afterwards ambassadors appeared from Argos with the proposals indicated, and the Boeotics approved of the terms and dismissed the ambassadors with a promise to send envoys to Argos to negotiate the alliance. In the meantime it was decided by the Boeotics, the Corinthians, the Megarians, and the envoys from Thrace first to interchange oaths together to give help to each other whenever it was required and not to make war or peace except in common, after which the Boeotians and Megarians, who acted together, should make the alliance with Argos. But before the oaths were taken the Boeotics communicated these proposals to the four councils of the Boeotians, in whom the supreme power resides and advised them to interchange oaths with all such cities as should be willing to enter into a defensive league with the Boeotians. But the members of the Boeotian councils refused their assent to the proposal, being afraid of offending Lacedaemon by entering into a league with the deserter Corinth, the Boeotics not having acquainted them with what had passed at Lacedaemon and with the advice given by Cleobulus and Xenas and the Boeotian partisans there namely, that they should become allies of Corinth and Argos as a preliminary to a junction with Lacedaemon, fancying that, even if they should say nothing about this, the councils would not vote against what had been decided and advised by the Boeotics. This difficulty arising, the Corinthians and the envoys from Thrace departed without anything having been concluded, and the Boeotics who had previously intended after carrying this to try and effect the alliance with Argos, now omitted to bring the Argive question before the councils, or to send to Argos the envoys whom they had promised, and a general coldness and delay ensued in the matter. In this same winter Messibana was assaulted and taken by the Olynthians, having an Athenian garrison inside it. All this while negotiations had been going on between the Athenians and Lacedaemonians about the conquests still retained by each, and Lacedaemon, hoping that if Athens were to get back Panactum from the Boeotians she might herself recover Pylos, now sent an embassy to the Boeotians, and begged them to place Panactum and their Athenian prisoners in her hands, in order that she might exchange them for Pylos. This the Boeotians refused to do, unless Lacedaemon made a separate alliance with them as she had done with Athens. Lacedaemon knew that this would be a breach of faith to Athens, as it had been agreed that neither of them should make peace or war without the other, yet wishing to obtain Panactum which she hoped to exchange for Pylos, and the party who pressed for the dissolution of the treaty strongly affecting the Boeotian connection, 
she at length concluded the alliance just as winter gave way to spring, and Panactum was instantly raised. And so the eleventh year of the war ended. In the first days of the summer following, the Argives, seeing that the promised ambassadors from Boeotia did not arrive, and that Panactum was being demolished, and that a separate alliance had been concluded between the Boeotians and Lacedaemonians, began to be afraid that Argos might be left alone, and all the confederacy go over to Lacedaemon. They fancied that the Boeotians had been persuaded by the Lacedaemonians to raise Panactum and to enter into the treaty with the Athenians, and that Athens was privy to this arrangement, and even her alliance, therefore, no longer open to them, a resource which they had always counted upon, by reason of the dissensions existing, in the event of the non-continuance of their treaty with Lacedaemon. In this strait the Argives, afraid that, as the result of refusing to renew the treaty with Lacedaemon and of aspiring to the supremacy in Peloponnes, they would have the Lacedaemonians, Tegans, Boeotians, and Athenians on their hands all at once, now hastily sent off Festrophus and Azen, who seemed the persons most likely to be acceptable, as envoys to Lacedaemon, with the view of making as good a treaty as they could with the Lacedaemonians upon such terms and could be got, and being left in peace. Having reached Lacedaemon, their ambassadors proceeded to negotiate the terms of the proposed treaty. What the Argives first demanded was that they might be allowed to refer to the arbitration of some state or private person the question of the Sinurian land, a piece of frontier territory about which they have always been disputing and which contains the towns of Thyre and Anthene, and is occupied by the Lacedaemonians. The Lacedaemonians at first said that they could not allow this point to be discussed, but were ready to conclude upon the old terms. Eventually, however, the Argive ambassadors succeeded in obtaining from them this concession, for the present there was to be a truce for fifty years, but it should be competent for either party there being neither plague nor war in Lacedaemon or Argos, to give formal challenge and decide the question of this territory by battle, as on a former occasion, when both sides claimed the victory, pursuit not being allowed beyond the frontier of Argos or Lacedaemon. The Lacedaemonians at first thought this mere folly, but at last, anxious at any cost to have the friendship of Argos they agreed to the terms demanded and reduced them to writing. However, before any of this should become binding, the ambassadors were to return to Argos and communicate with their people and, in the event of their approval, to come at the feast of the higher Cynthia and take the oaths. The envoys returned accordingly. In the meantime, while the Argives were engaged in these negotiations, the Lacedaemonian ambassadors, Andromedes, Phadimus, and Antimonides, who were to receive the prisoners from the Boeotians and restore them and Panactum to the Athenians, found that the Boeotians had themselves raised Panactum, upon the plea that oaths had been anciently exchanged between their people and the Athenians, after a dispute on the subject to the effect that neither should inhabit the place, but that they should graze it in common. As for the Athenian prisoners of war in the hands of the Boeotians, these were delivered over to Andromedes and his colleagues, and by them conveyed to Athens and given back. The envoys at the same time announced the raising of Panactum, which to them seemed as good as its restitution, as it would no longer lodge an enemy of Athens. This announcement was received with great indignation by the Athenians, who thought that the Lacedaemonians had played them false, both in the matter of the demolition of Panactum which ought to have been restored to them standing, and in having, as they now heard, made a separate alliance with the Boeotians, in spite of their previous promise to join Athens in compelling the adhesion of those who refused to accede to the treaty. The Athenians also considered the other points in which Lacedaemon had failed in her compact, and thinking that they had been overreached, gave an angry answer to the ambassadors and sent them away. The breach between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians having gone thus far, 
the party at Athens, also who wished to cancel the treaty, immediately put themselves in motion. Foremost amongst these was Alcibiades, son of Clinias, a man yet young in years for any other Hellenic city, but distinguished by the splendor of his ancestry. Alcibiades thought the Argive alliance really preferable, not that personal pique had not also a great deal to do with his opposition, he being offended with the Lacedaemonians for having negotiated the treaty through niches and lacquers, and having overlooked him on account of his youth, and also for not having shown him the respect due to the ancient connection of his family with them as their proxeni, which, renounced by his grandfather, he had lately himself thought to renew by his attentions to their prisoners taken in the island. Being thus, as he thought, slighted on all hands, he had in the first instance spoken against the treaty, saying that the Lacedaemonians were not to be trusted, but that they only treated, in order to be enabled by this means to crush Argos, and afterwards to attack Athens alone, and now, immediately upon the ever occurring he sent privately to the Argives, telling them to come as quickly as possible to Athens, accompanied by the Mantinians and Hellenes, with proposals of alliance, as the moment was propitious and he himself would do all he could to help them. Upon receiving this message and discovering that the Athenians, far from being privy to the Boeotian alliance, were involved in a serious quarrel with the Lacedaemonians, the Argives paid no further attention to the embassy which they had just sent to Lacedaemon on the subject of the treaty, and began to incline rather towards the Athenians, reflecting that, in the event of war, they would thus have on their side a city that was not only an ancient ally of Argos, but a sister democracy and very powerful at sea. They accordingly at once sent ambassadors to Athens to treat for an alliance accompanied by others from Elis and Mantinia. At the same time arrived in haste from Elastomen an embassy consisting of persons reputed well disposed towards the Athenians, Philocoridas, Leon, and Dendius, for fear that the Athenians in their irritation might conclude alliance with the Argives, and also to ask back Pylos in exchange for Panactum and in defense of the alliance with the Boeotians to plead that it had not been made to hurt the Athenians. Upon the envoys speaking in the Senate upon these points, and stating that they had come with full powers to settle all others at issue between them, Alcibiades became afraid that, if they were to repeat these statements to the popular assembly, they might gain the multitude, and the Argive alliance might be rejected and accordingly had recourse to the following stratagem. He persuaded the Lacedaemonians by a solemn assurance that if they would say nothing of their full powers in the assembly, he would give back Pylos to them, himself, the present opponent of its restitution, engaging to obtain this from the Athenians, and would settle the other points at issue. His plan was to detach them from niches and to disgrace them before the people as being without sincerity in their intentions, or even common consistency in their language, and so to get the Argives, Hellenes, and Mantinians taken into alliance. This plan proved successful. When the envoys appeared before the people, and upon the question being put to them, did not say as they had said in the Senate, that they had come with full powers, the Athenians lost all patience and carried away by Alcibiades, who thundered more loudly than ever against the Lacedaemonians, were ready instantly to introduce the Argives and their companions and to take them into alliance. An earthquake, however, occurring, before anything definite had been done, this assembly was adjourned. In the assembly held the next day, Nishas, in spite of the Lacedaemonians having been deceived themselves, and having allowed him to be deceived also in not admitting that they had come with full powers, still maintained that it was best to be friends with the Lacedaemonians, and, letting the Argive proposals stand over, to send once more to Lacedaemon and learn her intentions. The adjournment of the war could only increase their own prestige and injure that of their rivals.
the excellent state of their affairs making it their interest to preserve this prosperity as long as possible, while those of Leisterman were so desperate that the sooner she could try her fortune again the better. He succeeded accordingly in persuading them to send ambassadors, himself being among the number, to invite the Leistermonians, if they were really sincere, to restore Panactum intact with Amphitlis, and to abandon their reliance with the Bowie Oceans, unless they consented to accede to the treaty, agreeably to the stipulation which forbade either to treat without the other. The ambassadors were also directed to say that the Athenians, had they wished to play false, might already have made alliance with the Argives, who were indeed come to Athens for that very purpose, and went off furnished with instructions as to any other complaints that the Athenians had to make. Having reached Lacedaemon, they communicated their instructions, and concluded by telling the Lacedaemonians that unless they gave up their alliance with the Bowie Oceans, in the event of their not acceding to the treaty, the Athenians for their part would ally themselves with the Argives and their friends. The Lacedaemonians, however, refused to give up the Bowie Ocean alliance, the party of Xenas the Ephor, and such as shared their view, carrying the day upon this point, but renewed the oaths at the request of Nishas, who feared to return without having accomplished anything and to be disgraced, as was indeed his fate he being held the author of the treaty with Leistermann. When he returned, and the Athenians heard that nothing had been done at Leistermann, they flew into a passion, and deciding that faith had not been kept with them, shook advantage of the presence of the Argives and their allies, who had been introduced by Alcibiades, and made a treaty and alliance with them upon the terms following. The Athenians, Argives, Mantinians, and Alenes, acting for themselves and the allies in their respective empires, made a treaty for a hundred years, to be without fraud or hurt by land and by sea. 1. It shall not be lawful to carry on war, either for the Argives, Alenes, Mantinians, and their allies, against the Athenians, or the allies in the Athenian Empire, or for the Athenians and their allies against the Argives, Alenes. Mantinians, or their allies, in any way or means whatsoever. The Athenians, Argives, Alenes, and Mantinians shall be allies for a hundred years upon the terms following. 2. If an enemy invade the country of the Athenians, the Argives, Alenes, and Mantinians shall go to the relief of Athens, according as the Athenians may require by message in such way as they most effectually can, to the best of their power. But if the invader be gone after plundering the territory, the offending state shall be the enemy of the Argives, Mantinians, Alenes, and Athenians, and war shall be made against it by all these cities, and no one of the cities shall be able to make peace with that state, except all the above cities agreed to do so. 3. Likewise the Athenians shall go to the relief of Argos, Mantinia, and Elis, if an enemy invade the country of Elis, Mantinia, or Argos, according as the above cities may require by message, in such way as they most effectually can, to the best of their power. But if the invader be gone after plundering the territory, the state offending shall be the enemy of the Athenians, Argives, Mantinians, and Elenes and war shall be made against it by all these cities, and peace may not be made with that state except all the above cities agreed to it. 4. No armed force shall be allowed to pass for hostile purposes through the country of the powers contracting, or of the allies in their respective empires, or to go by sea, except all the cities, that is to say, Athens, Argos, Mantinia, and Elis vote for such passage. 5. The relieving troops shall be maintained by the city sending them for thirty days from their arrival in the city that has required them, and upon their return in the same way, if their services be desired for a longer period, the city that sent for them shall maintain them, at the rate of three edge net and obolus per day for a heavy armed soldier, archer, or light soldier 
and an edgy net and drachma for a trooper. 6. The city sounding for the troops shall have the command when the war is in its own country, but in case of the cities resolving upon a joint expedition the command shall be equally divided among all the cities. 7. The treaty shall be sworn to by the Athenians for themselves and their allies, by the Argives, Mantinians, Hellenes, and their allies, by each state individually. Each shall swear the oath most binding in his country over full-grown victims, the oath being as follows. I stand by the Alliance and ITS articles, justly, innocently, and sincerely, and I will not transgress the same in any way or means whatsoever. The oath shall be taken at Athens by the Senate and the Magistrates, the Prytanes administering it, at Argos by the Senate, the Eighty, and the Artini, the Eighty administering it, at Mantinia by the Demiurgi, the Senate, and the other Magistrates, the Theory and Plumarchs administering it, at Elis by the Demiurgi, the Magistrates, and the Six Hundred, the Demiurgi and the Thesmophilses administering it. The oaths shall be renewed by the Athenians going to Elis, Mantinia, and Argos thirty days before the Olympic Games, by the Argives, Mantinians, and Hellenes going to Athens ten days before the great feast of the Panathen year. The articles of the treaty, the oaths, and the alliance shall be inscribed on a stone pillar by the Athenians in the citadel by the Argives in the marketplace, in the temple of Apollo, by the Mantinians in the temple of Zeus, in the marketplace, and a brazen pillar shall be erected jointly by them at the Olympic Games now at hand. Should the above cities see good to make any addition in these articles, whatever all the above cities shall agree upon, after consulting together, shall be binding. Although the treaty and alliances were thus concluded, Still the treaty between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians was not renounced by either party. Meanwhile Corinth, although the ally of the Argives, did not accede to the new treaty, any more than she had done to the alliance, defensive and offensive, formed before this between the Hellenes, Argives, and Mantinians, when she declared herself content with the first alliance, which was defensive only and which bound them to help each other, but not to join in attacking any. The Corinthians thus stood aloof from their allies, and again turned their thoughts towards Lacedaemon. At the Olympic Games which were held this summer, and in which the Arcadian Androthens was victor the first time in the wrestling and boxing, the Lacedaemonians were excluded from the temple by the Hellenes, and thus prevented from sacrificing or contending for having refused to pay the fine specified in the Olympic law imposed upon them by the Hellenes, who alleged that they had attacked Fort Ficus, and sent heavy infantry of theirs into Lerum during the Olympic truce. The amount of the fine was two thousand mini, two for each heavy armed soldier, as the law prescribes. The Lacedaemonians sent envoys, and pleaded that the imposition was unjust saying that the truce had not yet been proclaimed at Lacedaemon when the heavy infantry were sent off. But the Hellenes affirmed that the armistice with them had already begun, they proclaim it first among themselves, and that the aggression of the Lacedaemonians had taken them by surprise while they were living quietly as in time of peace, and not expecting anything. Upon this the Lacedaemonians submitted that if the Hellenes really believed that they had committed an aggression, it was useless after that to proclaim the true sat Lacedaemon, but they had proclaimed it notwithstanding, as believing nothing of the kind, and from that moment the Lacedaemonians had made no attack upon their country. Nevertheless the Hellenes adhered to what they had said, that nothing would persuade them that an aggression had not been committed, if, however, the Lacedaemonians would restore Lerum they would give up their own share of the money and pay that of the god for them. As this proposal was not accepted, the Hellenes tried a second. Instead of restoring Lerum, if this was objected to, the Lacedaemonians should ascend the altar of the Olympian Zeus, as they were so anxious to have access to the temple, and swear before the Hellenes that they would surely pay the fine at a later day. 
This being also refused, the Lacedaemonians were excluded from the temple, the sacrifice, and the games, and sacrificed at home, the Laprians being the only other hands who did not attend. Still, the Hellenes were afraid of the Lacedaemonians sacrificing by force, and kept guard with a heavy armed company of their young men, being also joined by a thousand Argives, the same number of Mantineans, and by some Athenian cavalry who stayed at Harpina during the feast. Great fears were felt in the assembly of the Lacedaemonians coming in arms, especially after Lichas, son of Arcelaus, a Lacedaemonian had been scourged on the course by the empires, because, upon his horses being the winners, and the Boeosian people being proclaimed the victor on account of his having no right to enter, he came forward on the course and crowned the charioteer, in order to show that the chariot was his. After this incident all were more afraid than ever, and firmly looked for a disturbance, the Lacedaemonians, however, kept quiet, and let the feast pass by as we have seen. After the Olympic Games, the Argives and the Allies repaired to Corinth to invite her to come over to them. There they found some Lacedaemonian envoys, and a long discussion ensued, which after all ended in nothing, as an earthquake occurred, and they dispersed to their different homes. Summer was now over. The winter following a battle took place between the Heracliots in Trachinia and the Aenians, Dolopians, Melines, and certain of the Thessalians, all tribes bordering on and hostile to the town, which directly menaced their country. Accordingly, after having opposed and harassed it from its very foundation by every means in their power, they now in this battle defeated the Heracliots, Xenas, son of Cnidus, their Lacedaemonian commander, being among the slain. Thus the winter ended and the twelfth year of this war ended also. After the battle, Heracles was so terribly reduced that in the first days of the summer following the Bowie Oceans occupied the place and sent away the Lacedaemonian Aegisipides for misgovernment, fearing that the town might be taken by the Athenians while the Lacedaemonians were distracted with the affairs of Peloponnes. The Lacedaemonians, nevertheless, were offended with them for what they had done. The same summer Alcibiades, son of Clinias, now one of the generals at Athens, in concert with the Argives and the Allies, went into Peloponnes with a few Athenian heavy infantry and archers and some of the Allies in those parts whom he took up as he passed, and with this army marched here and there through Peloponnes, and settled various matters connected with the alliance and among other things induced the Patrians to carry their walls down to the sea, intending himself also to build a fort near the Achaean Riam. However, the Corinthians and Sicyonians, and all others who would have suffered by its being built, came up and hindered him. The same summer war broke out between the Epidarians and Argives. The pretext was that the Epidarians did not send an offering for their pasture land to Apollo Pythras, as they were bound to do, the Argives having the chief management of the temple, but, apart from this pretext, Alcibiades and the Argives were determined, if possible, to gain possession of Epidaurus, and thus to ensure the neutrality of Corinth and give the Athenians a shorter passage for their reinforcements from Aegina than if they had to sail round Cilium. The Argives accordingly prepared to invade Epidaurus by themselves to exact the offering. About the same time the Lacedaemonians marched out with all their people to Leuctra upon their frontier, opposite to Mount Lycium, under the command of Agas, son of Archidamus, without any one knowing their destination, not even the cities that sent the contingents. The sacrifices, however, for crossing the frontier not proving propitious, the Lacedaemonians returned home themselves and sent word to the Allies to be ready to march after the month ensuing, which happened to be the month of Carnus, a holy time for the Dorians. Upon the retreat of the Lacedaemonians the Argives marched out on the last day but three of the month before Carnus, and keeping this as the day during the whole time that they were out, invaded and plundered Epidaurus. 
the Abidarians summoned their allies to their aid, some of whom pleaded the month as an excuse, others came as far as the frontier of Epidaurus and there remained inactive. While the Argives were in Epidaurus embassies from the cities assembled at Mountania, upon the invitation of the Athenians, the conference having begun, the Corinthian Euphemides said that their actions did not agree with their words, while they were sitting deliberating about peace. The Epidaurians and their allies and the Argives were arrayed against each other in arms, deputies from each party should first go and separate the armies, and then the talk about peace might be resumed. In compliance with this suggestion, they went and brought back the Argives from Epidaurus and afterwards reassembled, but without succeeding any better in coming to a conclusion, and the Argives a second time invaded Epidaurus and plundered the country. The Lacedaemonians also marched out to Carai, but the frontier sacrifices again proving unfavorable, they went back again, and the Argives, after ravaging about a third of the Epidaurian territory, returned home. Meanwhile a thousand Athenian heavy infantry had come to their aid under the command of Alcibiades, but finding that the Lacedaemonian expedition was at an end, and that they were no longer wanted, went back again. So passed the summer. The next winter the Lacedaemonians managed to elude the vigilance of the Athenians, and sent in a garrison of three hundred men to Epidaurus, under the command of Aegesipides. Upon this the Argives went to the Athenians and complained of their having allowed an enemy to pass by sea, in spite of the clause in the treaty by which the allies were not to allow an enemy to pass through their country. Unless, therefore, they now put the Messenians and Helots in Pylos to annoy the Lacedaemonians, they, the Argives, should consider that faith had not been kept with them. The Athenians were persuaded by Alcibiades to inscribe at the bottom of the Lycanian pillar that the Lacedaemonians had not kept their oaths, and to convey the Helots at Cranii to Pylos to plunder the country, but for the rest they remained quiet as before. During this winter hostilities went on between the Argives and Epidaurians, without any pitched battle taking place, but only forays and ambuscades in which the losses were small and fell now on one side and now on the other. At the close of the winter, towards the beginning of spring, the Argives went with scaling ladders to Epidaurus, expecting to find it left unguarded on account of the war and to be able to take it by assault, but returned unsuccessful. And the winter ended, and with it the thirteenth year of the war ended also. In the middle of the next summer the Lacedaemonians, seeing the Epidaurians, their allies, in distress, and the rest of Peloponnes either in revolt or disaffected, concluded that it was high time for them to interfere if they wished to stop the progress of the evil, and accordingly with their full force, the Helots included, took the field against Argos, under the command of Agas, son of Archidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians. The Tegans and the other Arcadian allies of Lacedaemon joined in the expedition. The allies from the rest of Peloponnese and from outside mustered at Fluus, the Bowie Oceans with 5,000 heavy infantry and as many light troops, and 500 horse and the same number of dismounted troopers, the Corinthians with 2,000 heavy infantry, the rest more or less as might happen, and the Fly Asians with all their forces the army being in their country. The preparations of the Lacedaemonians from the first had been known to the Argives, who did not, however, take the field until the enemy was on his road to join the rest at Phleas. Reinforced by the Mantinians with their allies, and by three thousand Delian heavy infantry, they advanced and fell in with the Lacedaemonians at Methydrium in Arcadia. Each party took up its position upon the hill and the Argives prepared to engage the Lacedaemonians while they were alone, but Agas eluded them by breaking up his camp in the night, and proceeded to join the rest of the allies at Phleas. The Argives discovering this at daybreak, marched first to Argos and then to the Nemean road, by which they expected the Lacedaemonians and their allies would come down. However, 
Agas, instead of taking this road as they expected, gave the Lacedaemonians, Arcadians, and Epidarians their orders, and went along another difficult road, and descended into the plain of Argos. The Corinthians, Pelnians, and Flyasians marched by another steep road, while the Boeotians, Megarians, and Sicyonians had instructions to come down by the Nemean road where the Argives were posted, in order that, if the enemy advanced into the plain against the troops of Agas, they might fall upon his rear with their cavalry. These dispositions concluded, Agas invaded the plain and began to ravage Samenthus and other places. Discovering this, the Argives came up from Nemea, day having now dawned. On their way they fell in with the troops of the Flyasians and Corinthians, and killed a few of the Flyasians and had perhaps a few more of their own men killed by the Corinthians. Meanwhile the Boeotians, Megarians, and Sicyonians, advancing upon Nemi according to their instructions, found the Argives no longer there, as they had gone down on seeing their property ravaged, and were now forming for battle the Lacedaemonians imitating their example. The Argives were now completely surrounded, from the plain the Lacedaemonians and their allies shut them off from their city, above them were the Corinthians, Flyasians, and Pelnians, and on the side of Nemea the Boeotians, Sicyonians, and Megarians. Meanwhile their army was without cavalry, the Athenians alone among the allies not having yet arrived. Now the bulk of the Argives and their allies did not see the danger of their position, but thought that they could not have a fairer field, having intercepted the Lacedaemonians in their own country and close to the city. Two men, however, in the Argive army, Thrasilus, one of the five generals, and Alciphron, the Lacedaemonian proxenus, just as the armies were upon the point of engaging, went and held a parley with Agas and urged him not to bring on a battle, as the Argives were ready to refer to fair and equal arbitration whatever complaints the Lacedaemonians might have against them, and to make a treaty and live in peace in future. The Argives who made these statements did so upon their own authority, not by order of the people, and Agas on his accepted their proposals, and without himself either consulting the majority simply communicated the matter to a single individual, one of the high officers accompanying the expedition, and granted the Argives a truce for four months, in which to fulfill their promises, after which he immediately led off the army without giving any explanation to any of the other allies. The Lacedaemonians and allies followed their general out of respect for the law but amongst themselves loudly blamed Agas for going away from so fair a field, the enemy being hemmed in on every side by infantry and cavalry, without having done anything worthy of their strength. Indeed this was by far the finest Hellenic army ever yet brought together, and it should have been seen while it was still united at Nemea, with the Lacedaemonians in full force, the Archagians, Boeotians, Corinthians, Sicyonians, Pelnians, Flyasians and Megarians, and all these the flower of their respective populations, thinking themselves a match not merely for the Argive confederacy, but for another such added to it. The army thus retired blaming Agas, and returned every man to his home. The Argives however blamed still more loudly the persons who had concluded the truce without consulting the people themselves thinking that they had let escape with the Lacedaemonians an opportunity such as they should never see again, as the struggle would have been under the walls of their city, and by the side of many and brave allies. On their return accordingly they began to stone Thrasilus in the bed of the Charadrus, where they try all military causes before entering the city. Thrasilus fled to the altar, and so saved his life. His property, however, they confiscated. After this arrived a thousand Athenian heavy infantry and three hundred horse, under the command of Lachis and Nicostratus, whom the Argives, being nevertheless sloth to break the truce with the Lacedaemonians, begged to depart, and refused to bring before the people, to whom they had a communication to make, 
until compelled to do so by the entreaties of the Mantinians and Hellenes, who were still at Argos. The Athenians, by the mouth of Alcibiades their ambassador the present, told the Argives and the allies that they had no right to make a truce at all without the consent of their fellow confederates, and now that the Athenians had arrived so opportunely the war ought to be resumed. These arguments proving successful with the allies, they immediately marched upon Norchomenos, all except the Argives, who, although they had consented like the rest, stayed behind at first, but eventually joined the others. They now all sat down and besieged Dorchomenos, and made assaults upon it, one of their reasons for desiring to gain this place being that hostages from Arcadia had been lodged there by the Lacedaemonians. The Orchomenians, alarmed at the weakness of their wall and the numbers of the enemy, and at the risk they ran of perishing before relief arrived, capitulated upon condition of joining the League, of giving hostages of their own to the Mantinians and giving up those lodged with them by the Lacedaemonians. Orchomenos thus secured, the allies now consulted as to which of the remaining places they should attack next. The Aleans were urgent for Lerum, the Mantinians for Tegea, and the Argives and Athenians giving their support to the Mantinians, the Aleans went home in a rage at their not having voted for Lerum while the rest of the allies made ready at Mantinia for going against Tegea, which a party inside had arranged to put into their hands. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians, upon their return from Argos after concluding the four months' truce, vehemently blamed Agas for not having subdued Argos, after an opportunity such as they thought they had never had before, for it was no easy matter to bring so many and so good allies together. But when the news arrived of the capture of Orchomenos, they became more angry than ever, and, departing from all precedent, in the heat of the moment had almost decided to raise his house, and to fine him ten thousand drummy. Agas, however, entreated them to do none of these things, promising to atone for his fault by good service in the field, failing which they might then do to him whatever they pleased and they accordingly abstained from raising his house or fining him as they had threatened to do, and now made a law, hitherto unknown at Lacedaemon, attaching to him ten Spartans and counsellors, without whose consent he should have no power to lead an army out of the city. At this juncture arrived word from their friends in Tegea that, unless they speedily appeared, Tegea would go over from them to the Argives and their allies if it had not gone over already. Upon this news a force marched out from Lacedaemon, of the Spartans and Helots and all their people, and that instantly and upon the scale never before witnessed. Advancing to Orsthian in Manalia, they directed the Arcadians in their league to follow close after them to Tegea, and, going on themselves as far as Orsthian, from thence sent back the sixth part of the Spartans consisting of the oldest and youngest men, to guard their homes, and with the rest of their army arrived at Tegea, where their Arcadian allies soon after joined them. Meanwhile they sent to Corinth, to the Boeotians, the Phocians, and Locrians, with orders to come up as quickly as possible to Mantinia. These had but short notice, and it was not easy except all together, and after waiting for each other, to pass through the enemy's country, which lay right across and blocked up the line of communication. Nevertheless they made what haste they could. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians with the Arcadian allies that had joined them, entered the territory of Mantinia, and encamping near the temple of Heracles began to plunder the country. Here they were seen by the Argives and their allies, who immediately took up a strong and difficult position and formed in order of battle. The Lacedaemonians at once advanced against them, and came on within a stone's throw or javelin's cast, when one of the older men, seeing the enemy's position to be a strong one, hallowed to Agas that he was minded to cure one evil with another, meaning that he wished to make amends for his retreat, which had been so much blamed, from Argos, by his present untimely precipitation. 
Meanwhile, Agas, whether in consequence of this halu or of some sudden new idea of his own, quickly led back his army without engaging, and entering the Tegan territory, began to turn off into that of Mantinia the water about which the Mantinians and Tegans are always fighting, on account of the extensive damage it does to whichever of the two countries it falls into. His object in this was to make the Argives and their allies come down from the hill, to resist the diversion of the water, as they would be sure to do when they knew of it, and thus to fight the battle in the plain. He accordingly stayed that day where he was, engaged in turning off the water. The Argives and their allies were at first amazed at the sudden retreat of the enemy after advancing so near, and did not know what to make of it. But when he had gone away and disappeared, without their having stood to pursue him, they began anew to find fault with their generals, who had not only let the Lacedaemonians get off before, when they were so happily intercepted before Argos, but who now again allowed them to run away, without any one pursuing them, and to escape at their leisure while the Argive army was leisurely betrayed. The generals, half stunned for the moment, afterwards led them down from the hill, and went forward and encamped in the plain, with the intention of attacking the enemy. The next day the Argives and their allies formed in the order in which they meant to fight, if they chanced to encounter the enemy, and the Lacedaemonians returning from the water to their old encampment by the temple of Heracles, suddenly saw their adversaries close in front of them, all in complete order, and advanced from the hill. A shock like that of the present moment the Lacedaemonians do not ever remember to have experienced. There was scant time for preparation, as they instantly and hastily fell into the ranks, Agas, their king, directing everything, agreeably to the law. For when a king is in the field all commands proceed from him, he gives the word to the Plumarchs, they to the Lock Ages, these to the Pentecostais, these again to the Enomotics and these last to the enormities. In short all orders required pass in the same way and quickly reach the troops, as almost the whole Lacedaemonian army, save for a small part, consists of officers and their officers, and the care of what is to be done falls upon many. In this battle the left wing was composed of the Cyrity, who in the Lacedaemonian army have always that post to themselves alone. Next to these were the soldiers of Brasidas from Thrace, and the Neodemods with them, then came the Lacedaemonians themselves, company after company, with the Achaeans of Heraia at their side, after these were the Manalians, and on the right wing the Tegans with a few of the Lacedaemonians at the extremity, their cavalry being posted upon the two wings. Such was the Lacedaemonian formation. That of their opponents was as follows. On the right were the Mantinians, the action taking place in their country, next to them the allies from Arcadia, after whom came the thousand picked men of the Argives, to whom the state had given a long course of military training at the public expense, next to them the rest of the Argives, and after them their allies, the Cleonians and Ornians, and lastly the Athenians on the extreme left, and lastly the Athenians on the extreme left and their own cavalry with them. Such were the order and the forces of the two combatants. The Lacedaemonian army looked the largest, though as to putting down the numbers of either host, or of the contingents composing it, I could not do so with any accuracy. Owing to the secrecy of their government the number of the Lacedaemonians was not known and men are so apt to brag about the forces of their country that the estimate of their opponents was not trusted. The following calculation, however, makes it possible to estimate the numbers of the Lacedaemonians present upon this occasion. There were seven companies in the field without counting the Cyrity, who numbered six hundred men, in each company there were four Pentecostis, and in the Pentecosti four Enomities. The first rank of the enormity was composed of four soldiers, as to the depth, although they had not been all drawn up alike, but as each captain chose, they were generally ranged eight deep. The first rank along the whole line, exclusive of the Cyrati, 
consisted of 448 men. The armies being now on the eve of engaging, each contingent received some words of encouragement from its own commander. The Mantineans were reminded that they were going to fight for their country and to avoid returning to the experience of servitude after having tasted that of empire, the Argives, that they would contend for their ancient supremacy, to regain their one sequel share of Peloponnese of which they had been so long deprived, and to punish an enemy and a neighbour for a thousand wrongs, the Athenians, of the glory of gaining the honours of the day with so many and brave allies in arms and that a victory over the Lacedaemonians in Peloponnese would cement and extend their empire, and would besides preserve Attica from all invasions in future. These were the incitements addressed to the Argives and their allies. The Lacedaemonians meanwhile, man to man, and with their war songs in the ranks, exhorted each brave comrade to remember what he had learnt before well aware that the long draining of action was of more saving virtue than any brief verbal exhortation, though never so well delivered. After this they joined battle, the Argives and their allies advancing with haste and fury, the Lacedaemonians slowly and to the music of many flute players, a standing institution in their army, that has nothing to do with religion, but is meant to make them advance evenly, stepping in time without break their order, as large armies are apt to do in the moment of engaging. Just before the battle joined, King Agis resolved upon the following manoeuvre. All armies are alike in this, on going into action they get forced out rather on the right wing, and one and the other overlap with his adversary's left, because fear makes each man do his best to shelter his unarmed side with the shield of the man next him on the right thinking that the claws of the shields are locked together the better will he be protected. The man primarily responsible for this is the first upon the right wing, who is always striving to withdraw from the enemy his unarmed side, and the same apprehension makes the rest follow him. On the present occasion the Mantineans reached with their wing far beyond the Cyrity, and the Lacedaemonians and Hegans still farther beyond the Athenians, as their army was the largest. Agas, afraid of his left being surrounded, and thinking that the Mantineans outflanked it too far, ordered the Cyrity and Brasidians to move out from their place in the ranks and make the line even with the Mantineans, and told the Pilmax Hipponoides and Aristocles to fill up the gap thus formed, by throwing themselves into it with two companies taken from the right wing, thinking that his right would still be strong enough and to spare and that the line fronting the Mantineans would gain in solidity. However, as he gave these orders in the moment of the onset, and at short notice, it so happened that Aristocles and Hipponoides would not move over, for which offence they were afterwards banished from Sparta, as having been guilty of cowardice, and the enemy meanwhile closed before the Cyrity who Magas on seeing that the two companies did not move over ordered to return to their place, had time to fill up the breach in question. Now it was, however, that the Lacedaemonians, utterly worsted in respect of skill, showed themselves as superior in point of courage. As soon as they came to close quarters with the enemy, the Mantinian right broke their Cyrity and Brasidians, and, bursting in with their allies and the thousand Pictagives into the enclosed breach in their line, cut up and surrounded the Lacedaemonians, and drove them in full rout to the wagons, slaying some of the older men on guard there. But the Lacedaemonians, worsted in this part of the field, with the rest of their army, and especially the centre, where the three hundred knights, as they are called, fought round King Agas fell on the older men of the Argives and the five companies so named, and on the Cleonines, the Onians, and the Athenians next them, and instantly routed them, the greater number not even waiting to strike a blow, but giving way the moment that they came on, some even being trodden underfoot, in their fear of being overtaken by their assailants. The army of the Argives and their allies, having given way in this quarter, was now completely cut in two, 
and the Lacedaemonian and Tegan right simultaneously closing round the Athenians with the troops that outflanked them. These last found themselves placed between two fires, being surrounded on one side and already defeated on the other. Indeed, they would have suffered more severely than any other part of the army, but for the services of the cavalry which they had with them. Agis also on perceiving the distress of his left opposed to the Mantinians and the thousand Argives, ordered all the army to advance to the support of the defeated wing, and while this took place, as the enemy moved past and slanted away from them, the Athenians escaped at their leisure, and with them the beaten Argive division. Meanwhile the Mantinians and their allies and the picked body of the Argives ceased to press the enemy and seeing their friends defeated and the Lacedaemonians in full advance upon them, took to flight. Many of the Mantinians perished, but the bulk of the picked body of the Argives made good their escape. The flight and retreat, however, were neither hurried nor long, the Lacedaemonians fighting long and stubbornly until the rout of their enemy, but that once effected, pursuing for a short time and not far. Such was the battle as nearly as possible as I have described it, the greatest that had occurred for a very long while among the Helms, and joined by the most considerable states. The Lacedaemonians took up a position in front of the enemy's dead, and immediately set up a trophy and stripped the slain. They took up their own dead and carried them back to Tegea, where they buried them, and restored those of the enemy under truce. The Argives, Onians, and Cleonines had seven hundred killed, the Mantinians two hundred, and the Athenians and Aeginetans also two hundred, with both their generals. On the side of the Lacedaemonians, the allies did not suffer any loss worth speaking of, as to the Lacedaemonians themselves it was difficult to learn the truth, it is said, however, that there were slain about three hundred of them. While the battle was impending, Pistoanax, the other king, set out with a reinforcement composed of the oldest and youngest men, and got as far as Tegea, where he heard of the victory and went back again. The Lacedaemonians also sent and turned back the allies from Corinth and from beyond the Isthmus, and returning themselves dismissed their allies, and kept the Carnean holidays, which happened to be at that time. The imputations cast upon them by the Helens at the time whether of cowardice on account of the disaster in the island, or of mismanagement and slowness generally, were all wiped out by this single action, fortune, it was thought, might have humbled them, but the men themselves were the same as ever. The day before this battle, the Epidarians with all their forces invaded the deserted Argive territory, and cut off many of the guards left there in the absence of the Argive army. After the battle 3,000 Delene heavy infantry arriving to aid the Mantinians, and a reinforcement of 1,000 Athenians, all these allies marched at once against Epidarus, while the Lacedaemonians were keeping the Carnia, and dividing the work among them began to build a wall round the city. The rest left off, but the Athenians finished at once the part assigned to them round Cape Heruium and having all joined in leaving the garrison in the fortification in question, they returned to their respective cities. Summer now came to an end. In the first days of the next winter, when the Carnian holidays were over, the Lacedaemonians took the field, and arriving at Tegea sent on to Argos proposals of accommodation. They had before had a party in the town desirous of overthrowing the democracy and after the battle that had been fought, these were now far more in a position to persuade the people to listen to terms. Their plan was first to make a treaty with the Lacedaemonians, to be followed by an alliance, and after this to fall upon the commons. Liches, son of Asselaus, the Argive Proxenus, accordingly arrived at Argos with two proposals from Lacedaemon, to regulate the conditions of war or peace according as they preferred the one or the other. After much discussion, Alcibiades happening to be in the town, the Lacedaemonian party, who now ventured to act openly, 
persuaded the Argives to accept the proposal for accommodation, which ran as follows. The assembly of the Lacedaemonians agrees to treat with the Argives upon the terms following. 1. The Argives shall restore to the Orchomenians their children, and to the Menalians their men, and shall restore the men they have in Mantinea to the Lacedaemonians. 2. They shall evacuate Pinarus, and raise the fortification there. If the Athenians refuse to withdraw from Epinarus, they shall be declared enemies of the Argives and of the Lacedaemonians, and of the allies of the Lacedaemonians and the allies of the Argives. 3. If the Lacedaemonians have any children in their custody, they shall restore them every one to his city. 4. As to the offering to the god, the Argives, if they wish, shall impose an oath upon the Epidarians, but, if not, they shall swear it themselves. 5. All the cities in Peloponnese, both small and great, shall be independent according to the customs of their country. 6. If any of the powers outside Peloponnese invade Peloponnesian territory, the parties contracting shall unite to repel them, on such terms as they may agree upon, as being most fair for the Peloponnesians. 7. All allies of the Lacedaemonians outside Peloponnese shall be on the same footing as the Lacedaemonians, and the allies of the Argives shall be on the same footing as the Argives, being left in enjoyment of their own possessions. 8. This treaty shall be shown to the allies, and shall be concluded, if they approve, if the allies think fit, they may send the treaty to be considered at home. The Argives began by accepting this proposal, and the Lacedaemonian army returned home from Tegea. After this intercourse was renewed between them, and not long afterwards the same party contrived that the Argives should give up the league with the Mantinians, Hellenes, and Athenians, and should make a treaty and alliance with the Lacedaemonians, which was consequently done upon the terms following. The Lacedaemonians and Argives agree to a treaty and alliance for fifty years upon the terms following. 1. All disputes shall be decided by fair and impartial arbitration, agreeably to the customs of the two countries. 2. The rest of the cities in Peloponnese may be included in this treaty and alliance, as independent and sovereign, in full enjoyment of what they possess all disputes being decided by fair and impartial arbitration, agreeably to the customs of the said cities. 3. All allies of the Lacedaemonians outside Peloponnese shall be upon the same footing as the Lacedaemonians themselves, and the allies of the Argives shall be upon the same footing as the Argives themselves, continuing to enjoy what they possess. 4. If it shall be anywhere necessary to make an expedition in common, the Lacedaemonians and Argives shall consult upon it and decide, as may be most fair for the Allies. 5. If any of the cities, whether inside or outside Peloponnese, have a question whether of frontiers or otherwise, it must be settled, but if one allied city should have a quarrel with another allied city. It must be referred to some third city thought impartial by both parties. Private citizens shall have their disputes decided according to the laws of their several countries. The treaty and above alliance concluded, each party at once released everything whether required by war or otherwise, and thenceforth acting in common voted to receive neither herald nor embassy from the Athenians unless they evacuated their forts and withdrew from Peloponnese, and also to make neither peace nor war with any, except jointly. Zeal was not wanting. Both parties sent envoys to the Thracian places and to Pidicus, and persuaded the latter to join their league. Still he did not at once break off from Athens although minded to do so upon seeing the way shown him by Argos, the original home of his family. They also renewed their old oaths with the Chalcidians and took new ones, the Argives, besides, sent ambassadors to the Athenians, bidding them evacuate the fort at Apidarus. The Athenians, seeing their own men outnumbered by the rest of the garrison, 
and Demosthenes to bring them out. This general, under color of a gymnastic contest which he arranged on his arrival, got the rest of the garrison out of the place and shut the gates behind them. Afterwards the Athenians renewed their treaty with the Epidaurians, and by themselves gave up the fortress. After the defection of Argos from the League, the Mantineans, though they held out at first, in the end finding themselves powerless without the Argives, themselves too came to terms with Lacedaemon, and gave up their sovereignty over the towns. The Lacedaemonians and Argives, each a thousand strong, now took the field together and the former first went by themselves to Sicyon and made the government the more oligarchical than before, and then both, uniting, put down the democracy at Argos and set up an oligarchy favorable to Lacedaemon. These events occurred at the close of the winter, just before spring, and the fourteenth year of the war ended. The next summer the people of Dum, in Athos, revolted from the Athenians to the Chalcidians, and the Lacedaemonians settled affairs in a cheer in a way more agreeable to the interests of their country. Meanwhile the popular party at Argos little by little gathered new consistency and courage, and waited for the moment of the gymnopedic festival at Lacedaemon, and then fell upon the oligarchs. After a fight in the city, victory declared from the commons, who slew some of their opponents and banished others. The Lacedaemonians for a long while let the messages of their friends at Argos remain without effect. At last they put off the Gymnopedia and marched to the succor, but learning at Tegia the defeat of the oligarchs, refused to go any further in spite of the entreaties of those who had escaped, and returned home and kept the festival. Later on, envoys arrived with messages from the Argives in the town and from the exiles when the allies were also at Sparta, and after much had been said on both sides, the Lacedaemonians decided that the party in the town had done wrong, and resolved to march against Argos, but kept delaying and putting off the matter. Meanwhile the commons at Argos, in fear of the Lacedaemonians, began again to court the Athenian alliance, which they were convinced would be of the greatest service to them and accordingly proceeded to build long walls to the sea, in order that in case of a blockade by land, with the help of the Athenians they might have the advantage of importing what they wanted by sea. Some of the cities in Peloponnes were also privy to the building of these wills, and the Argives with all their people, women and slaves not excepted, addressed themselves to the work, while carpenters and masons came to them from Athens. Summer was now over. The winter following the Lacedaemonians, hearing of the walls that were building, marched against Argos with their allies, the Corinthians excepted, being also not without intelligence in the city itself. Agas, son of Archidamus, their king, was in command. The intelligence which they counted upon within the town came to nothing, they however took and raised the walls which were being built and after capturing the Argive town Hesea and killing all the freemen that fell into their hands, went back and dispersed every man to his city. After this the Argives marched into Phleas and plundered it for harboring the exiles, most of whom had settled there, and so returned home. The same winter the Athenians blockaded Macedonia, on the score of the league entered into by Pedicus with the Argives and Lacedaemonians and also of his breach of his engagements on the occasion of the expedition prepared by Athens against the Chalcidians in the direction of Thrace and against Amphitlis, under the command of Nicias, son of Niceratus, which had to be broken up mainly because of his desertion. He was therefore proclaimed an enemy. And thus the winter ended, and the fifteenth year of the war ended with it. Chapter 17 Sixteenth year of the war, the Milian Conference, fate of Melos. The next summer Alcibiades sailed with twenty ships to Argos and seized the suspected persons still left of the Lacedaemonian faction to the number of three hundred, whom the Athenians forthwith lodged in the neighboring islands of their empire. The Athenians also made an expedition against the Isle of Melos with thirty ships of their own, six Kian, 
and two lesbian vessels, 1600 heavy infantry, 300 archers, and 20 mounted archers from Athens, and about 1500 heavy infantry from the Allies and the Islanders. The millions are a colony of Leicestermen that would not submit to the Athenians like the other islanders, and at first remained neutral and took no part in the struggle, but afterwards upon the Athenians using violence and plundering their territory, assumed an attitude of open hostility. Cleomedes, son of Lycomedes, and Tissias, son of Tissimachus, the generals, encamping in their territory with the above armament, before doing any harm to their land, sent envoys to negotiate. These the millions did not bring before the people, but bade them state the object of their mission to the magistrates and the few, upon which the Athenian envoys spoke as follows. Athenians. Since the negotiations are not to go on before the people, in order that we may not be able to speak straight on without interruption and deceive the ears of the multitude by seductive arguments which would pass without refutation, for we know that this is the meaning of our being brought before the few, what if you who sit there were to pursue a method more cautious still, make no sad speech yourselves, but take us up at whatever you do not like, and settle that before going any farther. And first tell us if this proposition of ours suits you. The million commissioners answered. Millions. To the fairness of quietly instructing each other as you propose there is nothing to object, but your military preparations are too far advanced to agree with what you say, as we see you are come to be judges in your own cause, and that all we can reasonably expect from this negotiation is war, if we prove to have right on our side and refuse to submit, and in the contrary case, slavery. Athenians. If you have met to reason about presentiments of the future, or for anything else than to consult for the safety of your state upon the facts that you see before you, we will give over, otherwise we will go on. Millions. It is natural and excusable for men in our position to turn more ways than one both in thought and utterance. However, the question in this conference is, as you say, the safety of our country and the discussion, if you please, can proceed in the way which you propose. Athenians. For ourselves, we shall not trouble you with specious pretenses, either of how we have a right to our empire because we overthrew the Mede, or are now attacking you because of wrong that you have done us, and make a long speech which would not be believed, and in return we hope that you, instead of thinking to influence us by saying that you did not join the Lacedaemonians, although the colonists, or that you have done us no wrong, will aim at what is feasible, holding in view the real sentiments of us both, since you know as well as we do that right, as the world goes, is only in question between equals in power, while the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Millions. As we think, at any rate, it is expedient, we speak as we are obliged, since you enjoin us to let right alone and talk only of interest, that you should not destroy what is our common protection, the privilege of being allowed in danger to invoke what is fair and right, and even to profit by arguments not strictly valid if they can be got to pass current. And you are as much interested in this as any as your fall would be a signal for the heaviest vengeance and an example for the world to meditate upon. Athenians. The end of our empire, if end it should, does not frighten us, a rival empire like Lacedaemon, even if Lacedaemon was our real antagonist, is not so terrible to the vanquished as subjects who by themselves attack and overpower their rulers. This, however, is a risk that we are content to take. We will now proceed to show you that we are come here in the interest of our empire, and that we shall say what we are now going to say, for the preservation of your country, as we would fain exercise that empire over you without trouble, and see you preserved for the good of us both. Millions. And how, pray, could it turn out as good for us to serve as for you to rule? Athenians. 
because you would have the advantage of submitting before suffering the worst, and we should gain by not destroying you, millions, so that you would not consent to our being neutral, friends instead of enemies, but allies of neither side. Athenians. No, for your hostility cannot so much hurt us as your friendship will be an argument to our subjects of our weakness, and your enmity of our power. Millions. Is that your subjects' idea of equity, to put those who have nothing to do with you in the same category with peoples that are most of them your own colonists, and some conquered rebels? Athenians. As far as right goes they think one has as much of it as the other, and that if any maintain their independence it is because they are strongest, and that if we do not molest them it is because we are afraid so that besides extending our empire we should gain in security by your subjection, the fact that you are islanders and weaker than others rendering it all the more important that you should not succeed in baffling the masters of the sea. Millions. But you consider that there is no security in the policy which we indicate? For here again if you debar us from talking about justice and invite us to obey your interest, we also must explain ours, and try to persuade you, if the two happen to coincide. How can you avoid making enemies of all existing neutrals who shall look at case from it that one day or another you will attack them? And what is this but to make greater the enemies that you have already, and to force others to become so who would otherwise have never thought of it? Athenians. Why? The fact is that continentals generally give us but little alarm, the liberty which they enjoy will long prevent their taking precautions against us, it is rather islanders like yourselves, outside our empire, and subjects smarting under the yoke, who would be the most likely to take a rash step and lead themselves and us into obvious danger. Millions. Well then, if you risk so much to retain your empire and your subjects to get rid of it, it were surely great baseness and cowardice in us who are still free not to try everything that can be tried, before submitting to your yoke. Athenians. Not if you are well advised, the contest not being an equal one, with honour as the prize and shame as the penalty, but a question of self-preservation and of not resisting those who are far stronger than you are. Millions. But we know that the fortune of war is sometimes more impartial than the disproportion of numbers might lead one to suppose, to submit is to give ourselves over to despair, while action still preserves for us a hope that we may stand erect. Athenians. Hope, danger's comforter, may be indulged in by those who have abundant resources, if not without loss at all events without ruin, but its nature is to be extravagant and those who go so far as to put their all upon the venture see it in its true colours only when they are ruined, but so long as the discovery would enable them to guard against it, it is never found wanting. Let not this be the case with you, who are weak and hang on a single turn of the scale, nor be like the vulgar, who, abandoning such security as human means may still afford, when visible hopes fail them in extremity turn to invisible, to prophecies and oracles, and other such inventions that delude men with hopes to their destruction. Millions. You may be sure that we are as well aware as you of the difficulty of contending against your power and fortune, unless the terms be equal. But we trust that the gods may grant us fortune as good as yours, since we are just men fighting against unjust and that what we want in power will be made up by the alliance of the Lacedaemonians, who are bound, if only for very shame, to come to the aid of their kindred. Our confidence, therefore, after all is not so utterly irrational. Athenians. When you speak of the favour of the gods, we may as fairly hope for that as yourselves, neither our pretensions nor our conduct being in any way contrary to what men believe of the gods or practice among themselves. Of the gods we believe, and of men we know, that by a necessary law of their nature they rule wherever they can. And it is not as if we were the first to make this law, 
or to act upon it when made, we find it existing before us, and shall leave it to exist forever after us, all we do is to make use of it, knowing that you and everybody else, having the same power as we have, would do the same as we do. Thus, as far as the gods are concerned, I have no fear and no reason to fear that we shall be at a disadvantage. But when we come to your notion about the Lacedaemonians, which leads you to believe that shame will make them help you, here we bless your simplicity but do not envy your folly. The Lacedaemonians, when their own interests or their country's laws are in question, are the worthiest men alive, of their conduct towards others much might be said but no clearer idea of it could be given them by shortly saying that of all the men we know they are most conspicuous in considering what is agreeable honorable, and what is expedient just. Such a way of thinking does not promise much for the safety which you now unreasonably count upon. Millions. But it is for this very reason that we now trust to their respect for expediency to prevent them from betraying the millions, their colonists and thereby losing the confidence of their friends in Hellas and helping their enemies. Athenians. Then you do not adopt the view that expediency goes with security, while justice and honor cannot be followed without danger, and danger the Lacedaemonians generally court as little as possible. Millions. But we believe that they would be more likely to face even danger for our sake, and with more confidence than for others, as our nearness to Peloponnes makes it easier for them to act, and our common blood ensures our fidelity. Athenians. Yes, but what an intending ally trusts to is not the goodwill of those who ask his aid, but the decided superiority of power for action, and the Lacedaemonians look to this even more than others. At least, such as their distrust of their home resources that it is only with numerous allies that they attack a neighbor, now is it likely that while we are masters of the sea they will cross over to an island? Millions. But they would have others to send. The Cretan Sea is a wide one, and it is more difficult for those who command it to intercept others, than for those who wish to elude them to do so safely. And should the Lacedaemonians miscarry in this, they would fall upon your land, and upon those left of your allies whom Brasidas did not reach, and instead of places which are not yours, you will have to fight for your own country and your own confederacy. Athenians. Some diversion of the kind you speak of you may one day experience, only to learn, as others have done, that the Athenians never once yet withdrew from a siege for fear of any that we are struck by the fact that, after saying you would consult for the safety of your country, in all this discussion you have mentioned nothing which men might trust in and think to be saved by. Your strongest arguments depend upon hope and the future, and your actual resources are too scanty, as compared with those arrayed against you, for you to come out victorious. You will therefore show great blindness of judgment, unless after allowing us to retire, you can find some counsel more prudent than this. You will surely not be caught by that idea of a disgrace, which in dangers that are disgraceful, and at the same time too plain to be mistaken, proves so fatal to mankind, since in too many cases the very men that have their eyes perfectly open to what they are rushing into, let the thing called disgrace, by the mere influence of a seductive name lead them on to a point at which they become so enslaved by the phrase as in fact to fall willfully into hopeless disaster, and incur disgrace more disgraceful as the companion of error, than when it comes as the result of misfortune. This, if you are well advised, you will guard against, and you will not think it dishonorable to submit to the greatest city in Hellas when it makes you the moderate offer of becoming its tributary ally, without ceasing to enjoy the country that belongs to you, nor when you have the choice given you between war and security, will you be so blinded as to choose the worst. And it is certain that those who do not yield to their equals, who keep terms with their superiors, and are moderate towards their inferiors, on the whole succeed best. Think over the matter, therefore 
after a withdrawal and reflect once and again that it is for your country that you are consulting, that you have not more than one, and that upon this one deliberation depends its prosperity or ruin. The Athenians now withdrew from the conference, and the millions, left to themselves, came to a decision corresponding with what they had maintained in the discussion, and answered, Our resolution, Athenians, is the same as it was at first. We will not in a moment deprive the freedom a city that had been inhabited these seven hundred years, that we put our trust in the fortune by which the gods have preserved it until now, and in the help of men, that is, of the Lacedaemonians, and so we will try and save ourselves. Meanwhile we invite you to allow us to be friends to you and foes to neither party, and to retire from our country after making such a treaty as shall seem fit to us both. Such was the answer of the millions. The Athenians now departing from the conference said, Well, you alone, as it seems to us, judging from these resolutions, regard what is future as more certain than what is before your eyes, and what is out of sight, in your eagerness, as already coming to pass, and as you have staked most on, and trusted most in, the Lacedaemonians, your fortune, and your hopes so will you be most completely deceived. The Athenian envoys now returned to the army, and the millions showing no signs of yielding, the generals at once betook themselves to hostilities, and drew a line of circumvallation round the millions, dividing the work among the different states. Subsequently the Athenians returned with most of their army, leaving behind them a certain number of their own citizens and of the allies to keep guard by land and sea. The force thus left Staden and besieged the place. About the same time the Argives invaded the territory of Phleas and lost eighty men cut off in an ambush by the Flyasians and Argive exiles. Meanwhile the Athenians at Pylos took so much plunder from the Lacedaemonians that the latter, Although they still refrained from breaking off the treaty and going to war with Athens, yet proclaimed that any of their people that chose might plunder the Athenians. The Corinthians also commenced hostilities with the Athenians for private quarrels of their own, but the rest of the Peloponnesians stayed quiet. Meanwhile the Mullians attacked by night and took the part of the Athenian lines over against the market, and killed some of the men and brought in corn and all else that they could find useful to them, and so returned and kept quiet, while the Athenians took measures to keep better guard in future. Summer was now over. The next winter the Lacedaemonians intended to invade the Argive territory, but arriving at the frontier found the sacrifices for crossing unfavorable, and went back again. This intention of theirs gave the Argives suspicions of certain of their fellow citizens, some of whom they arrested, others, however, escaped them. About the same time the millions again took another part of the Athenian lines which were but feebly garrisoned. Reinforcements afterwards arriving from Athens in consequence, under the command of Philocrates, son of Demias, the siege was now pressed vigorously and some treachery taking place inside, the millions surrendered at discretion to the Athenians, who put to death all the grown men whom they took, and sold the women and children for slaves, and subsequently sent out five hundred colonists and inhabited the place themselves. Book V. Chapter 18. Seventeenth Year of the War, the Sicilian Campaign, Affair of the Hemi, Departure of the Expedition. The same winter the Athenians resolved to sail again to Sicily, with a greater armament than that under Lachis and Eurymedon, and, if possible, to conquer the island, most of them being ignorant of its size and of the number of its inhabitants, Hellenic and Barbarian, and of the fact that they were undertaking a war not much inferior to that against the Peloponnesians. For the voyage round Sicily in a merchantman is not far short of eight days. And yet, large as the island is, there are only two miles of sea to prevent its being mainland. It was settled originally as follows, and the peoples that occupied it are these. 
the earliest inhabitants spoken of in any part of the country are the Cyclopes and Lestrigones, but I cannot tell of what race they were, or whence they came or whither they went, and must leave my readers to what the poets have said of them and to what may be generally known concerning them.